Mohamed Light walking away with 30k recently, already looking at a good prize yeah. pool today, depending on where he finishes, already having that golden ticket. He's playing the Dream Crusher, which is a really interesting position to be in as the best in the world who's already qualified for World Finals, because usually that's what you do at the end of a season when you know you're not going to make it through the playoffs, but that's literally what he's doing here today. And for someone like Morton, it's such a mountain to climb when you're like, man, I got to face the best guy in the world in the first round of 16, single elimination, and he's already got a golden ticket. I'm scared of what Mo is going to do today. There are 14 guys he could have faced in the first round that weren't Mohamed Light, but he gets Mo. But that's going to be later. That's our fourth match of the day. Starting off yep. right now, we're going to Inaraj versus a guy who knows Morton very well in OP Sam, Morton's former 2v2 partner and still teammate over at SK Game. Yeah, exciting to see Sam back in the conversation, right? He's a guy that kind of disappeared for a couple of years there, but still he's been playing a lot. He's still working with SK. Like you said, he's always hanging out with Morton. You look there, 61 and 18s. He qualified early on. He killed it uh, here in our qualifiers at the Snapdragon Pro Series. He's got great ladder finish. I mean, he's 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 Chop Cham. He's OP Sam. He's the guy we've been watching <laughs> forever, the mad scientist. Uh, it's hard not to root for these guys. You know, you and I, we always try to not play favorites at the desk. You know, Josh and I did it last week as well. When we saw Diego B come into the conversation, it was like, I mean, how do you not root for these OGs? I feel very similarly about Sam. Interaj, though, has a bit of a mountain to climb here. Pretty great numbers, though, on his side of it. Yeah, he's certainly a talented player, and there's a good, there's a good maybe underrated scene in France. You know, we've we've have the the former top Frenchman in Donkey Kong, Lupanji, Azili's, all oh, these wow, names yeah. that were big in France, and they've all moved on. Now Viper's the top dog, but you have Hugo in here, you have Inaraj, you have a pretty solid French contingent. Um, they are certainly got some skill, but if I'm making my pick today, I, I, I got that it's you're not going to see me publicly unless he's against someone else that I like that much. You're not going to see me publicly pick against Sam, so I'm going with OP Sam here in game number one. Yeah, Sam, our 11th seed coming into the tournament, he was a person that qualified based off of points. I absolutely am picking Sam for this first matchup of the day. You guys let us know on Twitch, let us know on YouTube who you think is going to win this matchup. We will have a prediction later on when we get to that Morton Mo matchup. But for right now, it's Inaraj and Sam, the old, the new, who's going to come out on top. I'm excited to see this in this best of three. And just a reminder, once again, we're going to see four of the eight matches here in round number one. And then we'll be catching every single match for the rest of the day, all the way through our finals. Single a limb. So here we go, man. Game one, match one, set one. Sam at the top of your screen. Interaj at the bottom. This is an interesting matchup for these two players because on one side you have Sam who has been so close so many times in so many different ways. And he's been uh, a, a really top player at moments. He had that, that that moment, I believe it was in 2019, where I think he ended up one or two on ladder. I think it was one with his best finish. And he was yeah. just, he, he was, yeah, back in April of 2020, but excuse me. And he was oh. just, oh wow. Oh, what but a, a nice pickup there. there. Beautiful zap and Wow, holds off, but now behind by about four elixir is OP Sam. So great play here by the Frenchman. Going with the not much seen mini P.E.K.K.A. in this setup. Yeah, really a fascinating deck here. You know, we're going mini P.E.K.K.A. minions with rage. Probably oh going to have a Sparky Lord. in there somewhere. This Hunter up high gets eaten alive. Not what you want to see. Going for the King Tower activation. It's going to be too oh. late. Look at that zap again, man. Two beautiful zaps here from Inaraj. You guys can pull both of those zaps if you want. We can talk My about Lord. them after this game. Beautiful stuff here early on. You know, it, if you see Goblin Giant and you see Rage, you assume Sparky's in there. And the first response that anybody has, anybody who plays Clash Royale except for Goblin Giant Sparky Rage players, is what is this no-skill trash that I'm seeing right now? <laughs> well, we just saw a no-skill deck played with extreme skill into very, very high-pressure moments. But let's see if Sam can himself back in this one. Nice connection with the Loon. Bats getting in, and just like that, we have a fight on our hands, folks. Yeah, great min-maxing there by OP Sam. He doesn't really have to worry about the King Tower going down. He'll probably spend just a little bit of Elixir. There we go. Fisherman opposite lane. A two-tower game here. Sam behind by just a bit. It's all about him being able to get back on tower, though. 671 HP is a good amount, Rich, considering that Sam has no big spell. Yeah, this is curious to see. I don't know how he gets the loon here with, I mean, this snowball's not going to be enough. He can just best hope for death damage. That's going to be too far away. This is probably going to be pretty easy going defense for Inaraj through the remaining 40 seconds of this match. 
yeah, I mean, the change in the balloon makes it a little bit more difficult to swap lanes late game and get as much damage as you like. Interage, like you said, just going to sit back and play defense, maybe some high minions here. Ooh. Or does he sack the tower? Looks like he's going to sack the tower. I don't know if I agree with that, but obviously he's there for a reason. I'm here for a reason. And we see him set up his very first Sparky. Yeah, I think he gets... You know, this is kind of a heavy deck, right? The, the cheapest cards here are the two Elixir for the Zap and the and the Rage. I think he just probably couldn't get back around in time to to mount the appropriate defense there. So he, he was find himself in a situation where, honestly, in a lot of ways, I favor Sam now that we're in a crosswise game. Yeah, yeah, and I think that call that you make is 100% correct. You know, not being able to keep up with the cycle, a very, very fast cycle at the top of your screen. You can see you oh, get boy. all the way back around in just seven, eight Elixir. And now we see a big push coming in on this King Tower. That giant skeleton bomb is not going to do what Sam wants in terms of that Sparky. And maybe color me wrong here. The Sparky oh. does connect. And yeah, wow. that was just... I think you had it right the first time, which was Sack Tower and set up heavy in the opposite lane. Uh, I think he probably could have played the defense and he made the calculation that the defense probably w w had a good chance of not holding. And uh, yeah, here we go. This looks like it's going to be a three crown. Yeah, three crown to start the day here. Interage taking out Sam. 43 HP remains. Just needs to get that zap down. Instead drops a Golden Knight. Doesn't dash on to King Tower. Doesn't really matter here. Interage going to pick up game number one as we see Sam go in for a desperation play on that King Tower. Surprised that the zap hasn't come down. There we go. And GG, well played. Interage, you know, I was talking about beforehand, uh, a deck that everyone, pretty much everyone calls a no-skill deck. And the most annoying part it. about playing against a deck like that is when you see someone play a, a, a no-skill deck with skill. And those zaps early on, those were just those were just brilliant. And at that point, it put Sam in such a hole. And you had, like I said, you had the right call there. He chose to sack and go ahead and stack up opposite lane. And there was just nothing that Sam could do to hold off against that. Yeah, you know, it, it's so... Interesting that you point that out about like playing these quote unquote no skill decks with such a high skill cap level because when you make those really aggressive moves early on, getting those two zaps in, your opponent hasn't really figured you out yet. They haven't figured out that you're going to be going for stuff like that. But if it happens twice early and you pretty much take a tower, you don't really need to do it again. Then you can play safe for the rest of the game there. So you see six zaps coming down for Interage. It was really about those first couple that really hamstrung Sam, made him have to overspend. Like you called out, he was already down four Elixir early on because of that Golden Knight being on the field. Didn't even have to play Sparky till we got to that two tower game. And really this was navigated just brilliantly by Interage against our old pro. Yeah, I mean, it, it really, really was. And he got super aggressive early on. And this is one of those decks where, you know, you, you kind of, it's a, you, someone gets aggressive early on, gets a lead, you get really annoyed, right? The the mini pecky, you saw how much Sam had to spend on defense. Yeah. And he fell, fell behind by four. You fall behind by four against this deck that you can just stack and create a massive downhill push. The avalanche comes through. And then, of course, on top of that, two elixir just powers everything up with the rage it's uh that all we've all found ourselves caught flat-footed by it before and sam now has to regroup and come back into game number two with something the big question now is does interage again go for a matchup based deck like that goblin giant sparky rage deck or does he switch it up to something that uh that maybe is a little bit more cycle based yeah, not 100% sure, just because we don't... I, I personally don't know what Interage's playstyle is like, and coming out with Goblin Giant Sparky, I think is a really brilliant move in game number one, right? Your opponent doesn't want to show too much either. They usually don't want to use their best champion, their best spells, which is kind of what we probably saw out of Sam here. And then Inter Interage on the other side of it doing the exact same thing, but with very, very little overlap. Goblin Giant, Zap not used a ton, Rage not used a ton, Sparky obviously not going to be a lot of places, as you called out at the top of that game. Mini P.E.K.K.A. not super popular, right now but showing his head or her head here and there so i really like what interage did in terms of setting himself up for success as this set moves forward i think sam did the same thing however he drops game number one so a little different when we go into game number two yeah you know you talk about how you plan out for the remaining two games here interage as you mentioned a lot of those cards don't really factor in anywhere else even the spells right zap right. and rage there's nothing in the meta that uses zap and rage except for what we just saw right now um, but for Sam, the interesting thing you mentioned not playing hero and uh, not playing champions, but he did play minor, which does right. create a, a, does kind of narrow down his deck pool significantly. And here we see the Magic Archer coming out high aggressive early. Uh, that's a really aggressive way to play a Magic Archer against a uh, Tombstone early on in a game like this. Yeah, you know you're going for the negative one trade there. You're probably hoping that you bait out some more elixir from your opponent, which I guess Sam technically did. But now your opponent doesn't have to worry about that magic archer piercing, so they can kind of play their defense however they would like. 
Looks like Drill versus Graveyard, most likely. And there you go, early GY out for Inaraj. And yeah, this is probably the, the Goblin Drill deck, almost assuredly at this point, with five cards in, out of OP Sam. Yeah, really popular deck in the meta, and also just like such a strong deck. Cannon card is so great right now, so you see both of these guys using it on both sides of the board. Sam, in one of his earlier uh, rounds of competition, ran into Krasilkov in, in his matchup number one. He 2 won him, and then he ran into Morton in the semifinals, 2 owed him, but then was 2 owed by Mohamed Light, so Mo just doing what Mo does, but Sam getting in some good reps against his best friend and countryman and clanmate over on talking about Morton. So here we go. Minute 30 into regulation. Pretty even here. Yeah, this is this is a weird matchup for Sam here because, you know, you, th you think, oh, look at all the little splashy things I can touch with the Tombstone and the Skeleton King and the Graveyard. But the reality is that all of those end up actually kind of negating the, 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 the power of the dash of that Golden Knight. So this is going to be interesting to see the, the breakthrough potential. On the, on the other side of that, too, that Skeleton King, when saved for the, for the drill, is a pretty nasty counter there. But at the moment, it's OP Sam getting great geometry there, or at least very simple geometry, eighth grade level, <laughs> making that connection there on the left-hand side. Yeah, nice damage coming in, 2382 to 2971. There's the drill, as you call it, coming out for the very first time. And now both these guys, with what they have in their decks, what they know they're facing, you know, Sam does have a lot of great responses to that graveyard. You can always play his cannon cart up high or golden knight to set the line that you have. The magic archer you can play behind King Tower. And of course, as a desperation move, you can drop that e -whiz right on the skellies, or of course, that bar barrel comes in. So it's going to be really more about what Interage is doing right now, which is trying to overwhelm up at the bridge to make Sam overspend there. Well, the thing, too, is this is almost like a bait concept for Graveyard, right? That's why the Skeleton King and the Graveyard have been so popular together, is you force out as many counters to the Graveyard as possible, and then you pop the mobile Graveyard on the Skeleton King side. It doesn't work out for him in this case, as you see Inaraj uh, having out to defend against OP Sam's counter push in the right-hand lane. But as we go into sudden death overtime, you kind of see the concept they're both going to be going for. The big question is, does OP Sam at some point take advantage of what I assume is the NATO there at the end to get a big chunk of damage? And you look at Sam's deck, it's really beefy, right? There's so many cards there that have a lot of HP. And then you look at Interage and you're like, well, does he have enough single target DPS? But between the Mega Minion, the Cannon Cart, and those Skeletons popping, he actually can put up a great amount of DPS and win those bridge battles. So you see right now that Mega Minion is going to be a bit of a nuisance for Sam to deal with in terms of taking it out when it's getting that DPS in. But still, good push coming in here on the right. Big time push coming in here on the right. That Ewiz is not going to be enough. Got to get a dash with that Golden Knight, and does Sam have it? He does. Gets on tower, cannon cart behind the Golden Knight. Skeleton King on his way down. Now Drill going to go to the front oh, here, and man. this is just Overwhelm City. So first game, it was OP Sam trying to get out of the way of the Avalanche. This time, he does the Avalanche control and flips it on his head. We're all tied up, and one of these players is going home after our next game. I love seeing these types of decks out of OP Sam. I love watching him play these overwhelmed styles. He's so good at understanding the macro of the game. Obviously, he has great micro skills, uh, but we have a really, really great understanding of the macro. That's how Sam has always been. He never even used his NATO one time. He just overwhelmed, right? And he's very, very good at doing that. And like you called out early on with the deck here, this Goblin Drill deck has been, I mean, Goblin Drill in general, we've heard many pros talk about it, the best win condition in the game other than a champion, right? That ability to not only create pressure on the backside, but overwhelm at the bridge, I, I really did feel like this was Sam's game to lose because I know how good he is with this style of deck. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, obviously, graveyard metas have shifted where people are more aggressive with graveyard now than they used to be. But it is curious. It is at least a little bit curious how aggressive Inaraj got early with those graveyards. We saw him really low on Elixir, scrambling for a solution and gives up geometry, gives up uh, a, ske a free Skeleton King to a cannon cart and to the Golden Knight. And at that point, you're, you're not going to have much for your tower there on defense. So Sam able to go ahead and capitalize on that moment. And uh, interesting note here that both these guys very low on spell expenditure so far. Fireball still <clears throat> on the board both sides. Um, I believe Poison still on the side of Sam alongside everything else. Uh, this has been kind of a, a very cards close to the chest matchup here through two.
Yeah, I think that's a really, really good way to put it. We did see Inaraj come out with the Skeleton King, you know, in game number two, but he was running a very different version of what's popular in the Splash Yard or considered the Splash Yard meta, right? He has no Baby Dragon. He has no Ice Wizard, Ice Wizard not using NATO. Instead, he brings in Mega Minion, Cannon Cart, and Electro Wizard, which again, you're doing a great job there in terms of having strong DPS, but the synergy isn't quite there the way that you want. You know, one of the biggest things about those decks is the ability to play defense forever and then get those late graveyards in in single or excuse me in double and triple elixir um obviously once again i, I, I and i'll say this probably numerous times there there he's there for a reason i'm yeah. here for a reason <laughs> but i do believe that that deck is the most popular one the one that i was just talking about with baby dragon nato ice was poison and skeleton king for a reason yeah i mean they're they, they both have kind of different styles right obviously the graveyard cannon cart similar to Graveyard Musk, where you have the idea of the cannon cart can tank for the graveyard or the graveyard can tank for the cannon cart either direction. We saw sort of both attempted by Inaraj a couple different times there. It seemed that he kind of got he kind of got uh, uh, stretched thin and didn't know what decision he wanted to make, right? He had the poisons trying to continuously take off the Magic Archer at the same time as he was putting a lot of pressure in the opposite lane. I believe that was the big turning yeah. point. Uh, but, you know, getting close about three quarters of the way to, through the game, he was putting a big push on the left-hand side that was pretty easily dealt with, while at the same time spending four for four on that Magic Archer. But he was already down, and at some point you have to make a choice of where am I going to sacrifice some Elixir to make sure my tower doesn't fall? And I think that that was the moment there where the choice was not the best one and ended up with him losing game number two. Yeah, it just felt like a little over aggressive with that graveyard that came down. You know, using that Skeleton King ability every single time that it was available is yeah. usually a pretty good move. But then when you add in the graveyard on top of that, so you have the Skeleton King one lane, the graveyard the other, plus the tank there. It's just a lot to spend. And then, of course, that ability in the right hand lane is always going to bait out a little bit of defensive elixir. And again, Sam was able to figure that out as the game went on. And then we see two cannon carts coming down with a Golden Knight, with a Goblin Drill. That's a really, really expensive overwhelm that came from Sam. But that was at the ready, or that was given to him, I should say, uh, by Inaraj overspending. Here we go, game number three. As the mortar comes out high, a royal giant right into it. And with the Skeleton King plus the Skarmy, and that's going to be a charged up Skelly King. You do see the fish boy trying to pull away, but Skeleton's distracting. And now ability down early here for OP Sam. Andrew, you talked about that ability, and it's interesting. One of the, the hardest things to figure out, because that champion ability is two elixir rather than one, which is unique for the Skeleton King, that's one of the ones that, while it can be, it might be the most devastating when used at the right time, it's also a pretty significant spend when you turn that four elixir troop and four elixir spend into six at the wrong time. Yeah, 100%. And I think the biggest thing about that is always recognizing what you're playing against and making sure that they don't have those easy responses in hand. And of course, never using it when you can't get anything out of it. I know that sounds like very elementary, but you see sometimes people pulling the trigger on that ability because we know how powerful it is. But even if there's one unit on the board, plus that princess tower and that ability is used higher towards the river, that's one of the biggest places where you can get kind of caught looking and overspending. So Sam rocking this deck really, really popular popular right now you know can be fireball can be poison is that big spell um and the combination the synergy between the skeleton king and all these baity cards it becomes really difficult to know for Inaraj specifically in this matchup when to use that log but luckily for him he does have the electro spirit which is going to be really nice yeah he'll probably use that no he'll use the log on the left on the right hand side it's interesting because the mortar does a great job against royal giant right it really does yeah. uh hold it well and then the, the big question, especially as we get deeper into double now and then eventually triple elixir, is the ability for him to defend Royal Giants with it from the DPS side, as we just saw with that Skarmy, and then still have that Skeleton King. So you go ahead, sure, I wipe the Skarmy off, but then I charge up Skeleton King, who will either continue that defense or pressure the opposite lane. So you talk about that synergy, and you, you look at that, and you look at the way it matches up against Royal Giant. This feels like a pretty good situation for OP Sam. Yeah, definitely, and we're just waiting for that lightning to come down, figuring that is the last spell, last car that Inaraj has. Lightning comes in on top of that mortar. Um, and, and yeah, when, again, talking about synergy, there's just so many different ways you can defend with this deck too, and then turn that defense into a really, really strong counter push because you see here, he goes with an aggressive mortar, knowing that he does have enough DPS on that left-hand side to deal with the Royal Giant, and then Royal Giant being played naked at the bridge is probably not Inaraj's best response to that high mortar. So, you know, I love to see a bit of variability here coming out from the German. Well, the interesting thing here, and uh, we'll see what it, how it go, how it plays over time, 
And you're going to see Interrush continue to play Fisherman in the middle as opposed to ever cycle behind King Tower. It's not totally dissimilar, not the same level of uh, oh no, but not dissimilar yeah. to what happens when you play a Fisherman behind King Tower against a, against a giant skeleton, right? If you accidentally play that, cycle it, and then pull a Skeleton King in deep, that can be a devastating blow very, very quickly. But right now, it is Interrage in the lead. 11.21 on that left-hand side as we go into our final 90 seconds as Sam is trying to find a way to put on some real damage, real pressure with the Mortar connection and the right-hand lead. Yeah, I mean, the fact that that Mortar is on tower is huge for Sam right now because Interrage had a great Lightning taking the Mortar up high. Sam played that Mortar up high and to the right, hoping that the Lightning wouldn't get on tower. Well, it didn't get on tower, but it got on top of the Skeleton King as well. So right now, Sam in a lot of trouble. 420 HP remains, which is literally just a couple logs and a Lightning away. We'll see how Interrage wants to do it, but he is in a very, very opportune spot. 820 to 420, but Interrage feeling like he's maybe just in a bit of a better spot than Sam. We'll see. Yeah, I mean that's that should be sufficient. Lightning gets oh. in 16 HP. It's this is the this is it right here. Either this push on the right hand side does enough damage for Sam to win, or nope, GG. Well played, Iteraj, the Lightning, plus the Royal Giant taking care of business, getting game number three, and moving along to our quarterfinals at the ESL Snapdragon Pro Series. Yeah, you know, uh, it's always tough to see one of your favorites go down early, but you can't discredit Interaj or Sam. It was a great set back and forth, but Interaj just had his number. You know, played really, really great in game number one. Sam did what he did, or does did what he does in game number two. And then with game number three, you know, it could have really gone either way. That lightning definitely th made things a lot more difficult for Sam because we were talking about, or I should say, you were talking about early in that game, how strong that mortar is to defend against that royal giant. If it's a poison, if it's a fireball, yep. it's still will get good value but that lightning you know sam knew that lightning was going to come in which is why i really love the lightning from interaj right because what's the best play sam can make well the best play he can make is a mortar up high and offset to the opposite lane so he can't interaj cannot get that lightning on king tower problem with that or princess tower excuse me problem with that is that there's already an ensuing fish boy coming down the lane that's going to get on top of that mortar the lightning was able to connect to the mortar and the skeleton and the skeleton king and that really felt like the turning of the tide yeah, it was it was pretty big, and it also it kind of hamstrung Sam from a defensive standpoint, right? You want to get some good DPS on there, but every time you hang the musky out on that side, lightning certainly an issue. And what Interrush did a really good job of here was making sure that the log was always there for the skeleton army, and really it, and, and making it so that from a cycle standpoint, Sam was never really able to capitalize on skeleton army powers up skeleton king. We didn't yeah. see much of that. And it just felt like Sam was in a rough cycle spot, and that was the pressure Interage was putting on. And a great deck there by Interage when you talk about the matchup. You have great single target DPS with that Hunter, and of course with that AQ, but then the ability of the Electro Spirit to take so much Elixir off the board to always get those positive Elixir trades, whether it is with that Skeleton King ability or with that uh, barrel coming in, it or on the Skarmy. It just made it really difficult for Sam to figure out where his baity troops, his swarm units could really be effective. And you can see, you know, here in our replay, it was pretty much the same story throughout for most of it until these Royal Giants started coming in and coming down the lane. Obviously here in single elixir, easy to deal with because lightning doesn't come in. As soon as we did get to those lightnings, that double, that triple, all that, Sam was in a lot of trouble. And you look at that, the, the Skeleton King a half step late, not able to get the advantage of the, uh, of the Skarmy, and that was a lot of it. That whole synergy, the Skarmy plus Skeleton King Scar uh, synergy never really came to fruition for Sam, and you kind of saw it uh, in spades right there. So uh, a tough outing for OP Sam. He'll have to go and set up again and maybe try to qualify for the second split of our Europe and Middle East North Africa Snapdragon Pro Series Open. But for now, it's Interaj moving on to our quarterfinals, and that's a, a pretty big step forward for the young man out of France, and we'll see who he has in his next round in a little bit. All right, so we're going to be moving on to Mario versus Jonah. But, Rich, you cracked the code. Who yeah. is Mario? Well, he's Michifu, one of the best players in the game, a former number one ladder finisher, a former pro, all those things. And that's why you see there with Mario, you're like, well, who is this guy? Well, it's Michifu. He's he's incredible, which is why when you look at the numbers there, 8 and 0, you're like, all right, this is definitely someone to watch. Well, yeah, once again, it is Michifu. And then Jonah on the other side of it played a lot more. He qualified a lot later, but still, he's here. He was our 16th seed going up against our second seed in Michi. These guys are actually back-to-back -back number one ladder finishers with uh, Michifu wow. getting the 
July 2020, number one finish. And then right behind him in August, Jonah quite famously getting that number one finish. I believe the only number one finish with, uh, with E-Golem Battle Healer, with the Elixir Golem. Uh, with the Stinky Cheese deck, if you will. I could be wrong, but I believe that is the only top one finish with that deck in the game's history. Uh, but yeah, back-to-back -back number one finishes here, and a tale of two very different uh, very different style of players, right? Michifu was at one time um, a top-tier pro, a much sought-after free agent in some cases, came on to cream and looked like he was going to be a game-changer there, um, has had his ups and downs, whereas Jonah um, has pretty much been known as the Elixir Golem battle healer player inside of Clash Royale. And so it's gonna be a big question, like what kind of what kind of shape is Michi Fu in? On right. most days, if you're asking me to bet, I'm gonna take Michi nine out of ten times in a matchup against what the best Elixir battle Elixir Golem player of all time, but that's a very narrow field to be playing in competitive. Yeah, and you talk about competitive plays and competitive decks and dual mode. You know, is that the deck you want to play against guys at this level, right? They're never going to overcommit early on. And then using that Elixir Golem is always going to give them that additional Elixir, which is something you got to be really, really wary of, really cognizant of. But if he's the best in the world at it, he's the guy to bring it out in competitive. So we'll see if Jonah does that. And then looking at what Mario did in his qualifiers, he 2 0'd Janosic, who's a, a player from Germany, then went through Morton 2 0 went through Ascended 2-0, and went through Capgun 2-0. So you talk about how he qualified. You saw his games there, 8 known games, 4-0 in sets. This could be the Michi that we were all kind of promised when he first came onto the pro scene. This could be the guy, you know, taking time off, moving from teams to individual. You know, that time off and, and the different change in format could really do a lot for the mentality of a player like Michi, who does have what it takes to get there. You know, maybe now it's the time for him to do it here in 2022. When you look at these numbers, really impressive stuff. Yeah, certainly impressive stuff. Of course, Michifu, uh, we'll see if he can put it together. And you talk about that run he went through. Went through two of our finalists here in Morton right. and Capgun. So certainly some skill. Let's take a look, though, very quickly at a, a word here from Jonah. Uh, <laughs> not a lot of words here. Um, four total. So a word wasn't actually that far <laughs> off from the from the collection. Good luck to all the uh, the wishes here from Jonah. Maybe we put the put the font make the font bigger next time so we can fill up the whole fill up the whole <laughs> quote space uh, with uh, a man of few words and a man of few decks. Elixir Golem Battle Healer probably we'll see. I mean that's the big question, right? Do we see him? It's a it's a deck that doesn't share many cards with other decks. So the chances of seeing that here, Andrew, what do you give it? 60-40 in favor, 70-30 in favor. We see him play it at least once in at least these two games. I would love to see it. I honestly would. I would love to see it probably in game number two if his backup is against the wall. You know, then the opponent, that mind game starts with your opponent. Well, is he really going to play his comfort deck in this moment, in this high pressure situation, in competitive scene? But then for Jonah on the other side of it, very little to lose, right? Our 16th seed coming in. If you're struggling in game number one with playing a deck that is hopefully strong in the meta, then why not come out in game number two with your comfort deck? It can pay off. So here we go. Mitchie, bottom of your screen. Jonah at the top. Giant Skeleton out early on and giant skeleton is everywhere right now my friend yeah giant skeleton is despite not really having been rebuffed after kind of falling behind in the meta giant skeleton is becoming popular and we're seeing a whole lot of that here today so musky at the top with guards i still think guards are incredibly strong and broken that giant skeleton really close to tower rich and it does connect that's so brutal to get a giant skeleton connection early on in the game uh, from Jonah's side, from Michi's side, he's like, oh, cool, he just made my life a whole lot easier. So that's about a 1,000 plus on the right-hand side with nary a minute played here in the opening game as Jonah's have to find some way to battle back and uh, battle back at a deck that doesn't get, deliver huge blows. This is certainly a chip deck out wow. of Jonah, and uh, we'll see what, he can what way he can find to make up the distance here as we get past the first minute 15. Yeah, that's a really, really tough start there. And you see Jonah kind of trying to stop the bleeding with that log coming in really late on top of the Archer Queen. You know, was still down in Elixir and really, really down in HP. I mean, Michifu is uh, definitely a guy that hasn't been the best in the world, but he was number six in the world last season, right? You talk about him in World Finals getting that sixth place finish. Uh, he's a very, very good player. Um, and this Royal Giant on tower. And right now it just feels like a bit of a bloodbath for poor Jonah. Yeah, at this moment, it's Jonah. Go ahead, reset, get yourself ready for game number two because playing Mortar Miner, and he's waving the white flag. All right, he says, good game. Yeah. He knows. It's just go ahead, reset, and hope you can do better next time. 
Yeah, I mean, and then the biggest bummer here for Jonah is you look at the cards that are being used. There's the Musketeer, the Guards, the Log, the Miner, the Mortar, the Bats, all of them so, so strong in the meta, can be used in a lot of different decks, and even the Poison, man. So, so Jonah in a troubling spot here. I like that he came out with this deck because it is so dominant. I just wish maybe he would have been a little more patient earlier on in this set and maybe a little bit more aggressive with his defense in regards to that first giant skeleton coming down. Yeah, I mean, a GS uh, hit that early is rough, but also you're playing Mortar against Royal Giant. Nice, as we already talked about it. But there are two things that can make that Mortar a little bit less challenge, a little bit less uh, useful. Lightning, as we saw, and of course the Earthquake. So yeah. it seems like this would have been a, a difficult outing for Jonah no matter what. And uh, we're going to get a nice, clean, easy three-minute game here as Michifu takes game number one without too much difficulty. Yeah, Michifu looking really, really strong. One of the best players in the game, one of the best ladder players ever. You know, that top one finish, a couple top twos in there, a handful of top tens. Again, being sixth place in the world last year at our World Finals in 2021. Um, he is a very, very high caliber player. And it's so fascinating when we talk about how quickly people fall in and out of that limelight here in the Clash Royale competitive scene. Well, that's one of the things that makes a player like Morton specifically, we're talking, we'll see a lot later, um, so compelling is that he has been front and center of competitive Clash Royale now since 2018. I mean, 2018, yeah. 19, 20, 21, 20, we're five years of being a guy who, as a, a, a person you have to watch whenever he plays. That's rarefied air. Even Mohammed Light, he didn't really come onto the scene as a, as a true pro. I guess he was young enough, right, 16, um, right. until partway through the, I think, I can't remember if it was the end of 2019 or 2020, um, when he joined over in CRL Asia. So um, it's hard to maintain that level for a long time. Michifu, though, um, certainly looking like he's trying to recapture that at the moment. Yeah, you know, and it, and it really is fascinating. I was, when I said that he was number six in the world last year, I was almost ready for you to correct me and be like, are you sure about that? Or like, give me the right number because I forgot, right? I, and that's, I feel like what a lot of people have done with Michi over the last two years, the last two seasons, is kind of forgotten how great he really is. Because unless you're winning those monthly finals, unless you're getting those golden tickets early on, or you're in the top maybe three at world finals, that changing of the guard happens so quickly, so rapidly, but Michifu doesn't appear like he's really gone anywhere when you watch the gameplay we just saw. Yeah, no, not at all. Uh, you know, with, with Michi, it's one of those things where um, a couple of missteps have de derailed his career probably uh, when he was at his peak skill-wise. Um, mm -hmm. But the, I think the skill was always there. Uh, you know, it's just the, the, were the opportunities there for him in those given moments. So. We'll see. I mean, Michi's still a talented player. This also, this game, this match isn't over. Jonah could make right. a pretty big turnaround, but I think that we just saw sort of the difference between someone who's really, uh, I, the, the, one, the word, one, the, it's not meant to be derisive, the term one trick, but someone who's known for doing one single thing and doing it 10,000 times, and someone who's who's put the focus in being, uh, being more diverse for competitive play. We're sort of just seeing that difference here. Yeah, and you know, that's exactly a testament to their numbers, their, their top ladder finishes, right? Being a one trick and finishing number one on ladder is kind of the go-to thing to do, or you play the strongest thing in the meta and you master it. And then with Michi, you look at the longer, you know, the more tenured professional career, you're forced to become more diverse in your play yeah. style. You know, that first season of CRL, we saw a lot of one tricks getting pretty far, whether it was golem players or whether it was graveyard players, what, what have you. But once you introduce that dual mode, it really changes things up. So, you know, you posed the question early on, do do we see the stinky cheese deck here you know we didn't see any cards that are in it played in game number one at least i don't think we did i try to forget everything about that deck um but i believe all the cards are still available i, I for some reason i still don't think he goes to it i i you know i said that i'd like to see it in game number two but i think with the way that game number one went it was so dominant um i think michifu could play something like splash yard here in game number two and literally just chill out play defense and then overwhelm and double and triple when you know and this is something i've heard ac and eric say when you know you're better than them you can either beat them down rapidly which maybe we're going to see michifu do here with a really strong goblin drill deck or you can play something like gy and just completely control the matchup so it is going to be drill michifu is going for that kill yeah and it, you know it's one of those things where do you play something with the anticipation where you go hey game number two i know jonah's backs to his wall do I play something that counters Elixir Golem, but then also gives me more opportunity, more options? And it, it might seem small here, 
But uh, Skeleton's obviously on the front end, but that Bomber played deep can certainly be helpful on the back end. So uh, not to mention the Drill being both a being a mobile building for some control. This seems like he might have made that kind of call. So Jonah looking like he's going to be going to Royal Giant here in game number two. Mitchie playing that Drill and playing it pretty well so far. Untouched on his side of the screen with just a lick of damage in Jonah's favor. A little tap there on the right-hand side as Michifu does connect there with the log 28-20, the mark in the right-hand lane as Jonah tries to continue to put some pressure on that right-hand side. Very quick cycle here from Mario, from Michifu. Uh, already you can see fastest cycle getting around the horn. Six elixir with the yep. skeletons, fire spirit, log, and bomber. So he can get those drills going real aggressive once we get into double and even worse in triple. Yeah, and you can see Jonah here leaking a good amount of elixir. 4.3 leaked, where on the other side of it's only 0.7. Um, and it, it's one of those situations where because his deck is so much heavier, like you said, Michi's is so much faster. He doesn't ever want to overcommit here in single, but also doesn't want to be caught looking in case there's a late lane change there. And that was a lot of elixir spent there by Michi, but still got to take care of that AQ. Jonah recognizes it, sets up the RG. Left-hand lane pressure now. Royal Ghost will prevent some of that damage, but you do see one getting through there, and that's Royal Ghost's uh, B-tier defensive card when you're up against that Goblin Drill and throwing in the Inferno Tower, but the Lightning yeah. for this Royal Giant deck. It's second time we're seeing RG Lightning. Is this combination making a comeback, Andrew? I mean, it's just so good when you talk about these buildings, right? I mean, Michi saw it coming from a mile away, which is why he sets it up really early on. He gets that cycle back around, which you talked about earlier. I mean, when you have that many cards, you have four <laughs> cards that are two elixir or less. It makes it so that those lightnings are just a little bit less impactful. But I think Jonah is doing the right thing here and keeping up that pressure so that Michi can't really double, triple down on that, those goblin drill pushes. But Jonah does need to figure out how to get a little bit more damage on that tower because those drills coming in, they're baiting out Elixir and they're getting just a little bit of damage in every single time along with that bandit connection. I heard you chuckle. You must have heard the noise that I made when I saw another Inferno Tower come down. That cycle <laughs> yeah. is just, that's just bananas that you can have, that there's a deck where you can get Inferno Towers down back to back like that. I see, think he'll lightning here. And now let's see, Skeletons in, Log was a little bit, didn't get the knockback that he wanted, and so Royal Giant yeah. will connect this time around. So this time, the cycle not quite there. 1497, left-hand lane. Jonah takes the lead, but a nice bandit connection. And just like that, lead goes back to Michifu, wow. who cycles the rocket already onto that Royal Giant. And this is going to be a very interesting end game with 80 seconds left. Yeah, this is fascinating because you can see Michi can cycle all the way back around. He gets this Inferno Tower down up high, won't really need to use another rocket, but he will be back to another rocket if he wants to use it on top of this AQ slash RG push. Doesn't have the Elixir right now, and it wouldn't be enough. Here's the rocket. We called it, right? And yeah, still, that Royal Giant will get a couple shots in. And the oh, and lightning, lightning there, that might make enough here. Bandit does get down 566. Jonah in a decent spot right now. He does have a slight elixir advantage, at least elixir even at the moment. Drill goes in, turns the Royal Giant around. Rocket does not wow. get the ghost though. I don't know if Michi can defend against this. Lightning should be in. Royal Giant, Fish Boy, Royal Ghost, everything. What can you <laughs> yeah. do? Absolutely nothing. Jonah takes game number two and sends us to a third and final. I just don't know if I like that first rocket out yep. of Michifu. Yep. I mean, he maybe, you know, again, maybe he recognizes the macro and he goes, there's no way I can continue to defend because the one time he did get that second Inferno down, I believe, was the time he also played the drill on defense, which gives you that little bit of buffer time to get that elixir back, get that cycle back around. But I do think that first rocket was just a little bit too much. It yeah. feels like you're probably on the same page. Yep, 100%. So the second I saw that, I was like, because, I, you know, I, it, you don't want to you kind of hedge your bet a little bit where you go, what is he doing? It's Michifu. Maybe he knows what he's doing here. But right. uh, a rocket on a Royal Giant to get it down to, down to half, half health and the tower that early in the game. You're not in triple yet. You're, you're the, the game is pretty much on a razor thin line. That to me felt like the point where there was that kind of felt like the point of no return for Michi. 
Yeah, I mean, just getting that rocket down, knowing that there's an Archer Queen that can be played, right? Knowing that AQ is in play, you usually want to save that rocket for that Archer Queen or late game damage when you're getting deep into double, early into triple, then you can start cycling those rockets, which honestly, I think that's probably what the better play would have been, right? We were looking at him kind of struggle, Michifu kind of struggle, Mario kind of struggle with getting that damage on tower. The bandit was connecting over and over, but Jonah was okay to take that damage in the left-hand lane because it just meant he could turn his pushes or his defenses, excuse me, into counter pushes. I would have loved to see Michi play those high infernos. Don't let that lightning get that value on top of the princess tower. Then the drill over defend over and over and over and then maybe late game rocket cycle because you see right there yeah. that rocket coming down. We called that it was going to come in on top of that RG and AQ, but we also knew if that happened, Michifu was probably going to lose the game. And then you see that desperation rocket. I mean, he only needs one more. He only needs one more rocket on that tower, right? Yeah, uh, this was just, yeah, the the log dies short a little bit there. Yeah, it's just you spend, you spend some of those rockets that we saw spent, and even the second rocket there, the one that came in with the goblin drill push, you almost wonder, hey, like, do you set up for one more defense? The problem that he was experiencing, though, was he has to get the Royal Giant off the off the board. He has to make sure the Inferno Tower is not distracted by playing high into something that picks up, like the Fisherman, um, high across the board there as well. And at the same time, contend with the fact that every single Inferno Tower is going to get lightning and give yeah. damage on Princess Tower as well. So felt like kind of a rock and a hard place there at that point. But again, it all, it all comes back to that question of, was that one rocket the right rocket to spend? And then you talk about that. That Inferno up high, you know where the lightning is going to come down. It's not going to come down on top of the Princess Tower, but it makes it so that all the other defensive units that Michi would drop are in danger or in firing range of that lightning as well. And so you saw Jonah late game getting those big pushes coming across the bridge, knowing that Rocket wasn't in cycle, knowing that that wasn't really an option. Just a great, really understanding of what was going to happen late game there. And I think Michi did see it. I think he was just like, man, I'm doing good here in single. I'm doing okay in double, but things are starting to get a little bit out of hand. And Jonah just took that and ran with it so a very very comfortable mario slash michifu after game number one jonah firing back in game number two and i think that a lot of those cards still are available for the stinky cheese this is the moment i think you can play it um i i, I don't know if i would encourage doing it but i do think it's enough of that mind game to where it'd be like man it's game three everything on the line does he actually go to his comfort deck that seems crazy um, but who knows here we go and that's a quick answer to my question yeah, I mean, you go Mortar High. This is opportunistic play out of Jonah to go the opposite direction. This might be that uh, Mortar Miner Giant Skeleton deck that you and I were talking about earlier. This thing is insanely, insanely powerful. Miner goes to the back, yep, so uh, expect Poison here out of Michifu. Musketeer, I believe, as well in this deck. So this will be interesting because this Royal Hogs matchup, no, oh, did he already play Musketeer and that's why Dark Goblin? is in here, or did he, is he just playing that for a faster cycle? This is going to be a really interesting matchup. The flying machine is the is the weird thing to try to handle here yep, um, yep. if because um, of that snowball. That's a really great call that you make, man. That flying machine is going to be tough because you already look at what spells Michi has, and he's using the arrows, right? So he probably doesn't have a great way to get on top of that flying machine. It's going to be all about placing those bats and getting some arrow damage in as well because uh, you want to make sure that Dark Goblin stays alive. That is your highest damage dealing unit here other than the Skarmy, but the Skarmy you got to worry about with that snowball. I do see some chatters on YouTube right now asking, how can I participate in this event? Well, you can't play today, but there are still a lot more qualifiers available in both the Europe, Middle East, North Africa region and the North America region for both the Golden Ticket event and the North American $20,000 event. Go to snapdragonproseries.com and you can find information for all of those qualifiers so you can get in the action here. That's right. It's the era of everyone here in 2022. Anyone can compete. And then Rich and I or AC and EB can be calling your matches here live on stream or live in studio, depending on which part of the world you live in. As Michi sets up a big time Skeleton King push left hand lane, has to use those arrows late. And then the Skelly King gets on top of the tower, 1796 and 1834 to two towers close to 2300. And this is so Michifu going with, oh, the wow, the that's fascinating to see. <laughs> the minion horde in this mix. Yeah. I was going to say this is very Michifu to go with the Dark Goblin, which is one less than the Musketeer, and the Arrows, which is one less than that Poison, to try to turn this into a slightly faster cycle deck than what it originally is built in the more common structure. 
But then you throw in the minion horde here, which is such a, a fascinating wrinkle, and it does slow things down. And of course, when you have a minion horde, you see your opponent has arrows. Uh, that's one of those ones where you go, ah, maybe the minion horde wasn't the best choice. Yeah, I mean, it's the, the, the name of the game for Michi is going to be all about how can I make those arrows come out on the bats or the Skarmy or the Dark Goblin so that Minion Horde can get a lot of value. But also, Michi can just kind of sit back and play defense. No big spell. Mortars on defense are really strong in double and triple elixir. He's only got 873 HP remaining, which you can do with minor damage pretty quickly over the course of these last two minutes. So we'll see how Jonah wants to respond Jonah needs to make something happen, whereas Michi can kind of let the game come to him. I like the patience we saw out of Michifu right there, not to pop that skeleton, not try to like make that skeleton king get his ability down, and that's what you need in this situation, not to try to spend that two elixir that really wasn't going to give him much. Here we go, final 90 seconds. Michifu sets up skeleton king and mortar. Needs yep. really two more great defenses. But this is the big question is what does he do about this flying machine? And it's the high minion horde, arrows clear them off. And now that flying machine is going to be an absolute menace, forces bats out as well. Snowball keeps wow. it alive. Now on the right hand side, Skarmy picks up the hogs. What a defense out of Michifu. And now it's his turn to put pressure in that left hand lane. Yeah, mine are gonna go to the back. Skeletons on the board. Golden Knight does not get on top of that Dark Goblin. 7057 remains the overspend with the high cage here. And Michifu follows that brilliant defense up with a really, really precise offense. Here we go. Triple Elixir. 50 seconds left. How much stack can Jonah create? Arrows to clear off shields on the left hand side. Get some tip damage as well. 646 the mark as we go to our final 40. And there you go, another Dark Goblin comes down, takes care of that flying machine right off the bat. We can go high here with the Skarmy. There's so many options for him to defend. There's the Skarmy coming down, no damage basically coming in on that tower. And this feels like GG, well played, and moving on to round number two for Michi. But game is not wow. over yet, 23 seconds remain. Wow, the, I mean, the, you, know, you talk about the fast cycle, the, those changing those two cards, he's used the minion horde when necessary for opportune moments, but not putting that in the mix, what it means is that this is such a, an even faster cycle version of an already crazy fast cycle deck. And Michifu, the defenses he's put up with this thing were absolutely <laughs> insane. G, G, well played. Viva España, Michifu moving on to the next next round. How many arrows can be coming down in the span of 20 seconds? How many Dark Goblins are gonna be on the board? A brilliant use of that cycle. You called it perfectly, my friend. That Minion Horde was a desperation card played that was really more about like, okay, how much damage can I get out within the first like second it's on the board? Cause you know the arrows are gonna come down. And then from that point on, it was easy for Michi, right? And he goes, okay, arrows are out of cycle. So he has to play the Snowball on top of either the Bats or the Skarmy and they're never gonna be close or on top of each other and then from that point on it was just cycle arrows cycle dark goblins i mean you look right there eight sets of arrows came out for mitchy three more than his opponents seven dark goblins played nine miners coming in which is classic mitchy as well and just a beautifully beautifully played game number three with everything on the line jonah didn't play that poorly it was just mitchy flu mitchy food played better and used his baity swarm cards to perfection Michi looked at this matchup, looked Jonah in the eye and told him, our arrows will blot out the sun and just <laughs> kept them flying the entire way. Man, I, you know, arrows are not super meta right now. We saw them on both sides here. Uh, and I was, I was a little bit concerned when I saw arrows as the, as the, the big spell here, primarily because of that flying machine. But he was able to, to just stack and stack and stack and getting the minion horde involved the way he did, not relying on it, not overplaying it. Um, there were a couple moments where he played it when the when, when the right spell wasn't in the right place or we got stacked to bait. That was just right. some great play out of the Spaniard. Yeah, and, and you know, you look at that snipe there from the Dark Goblin on top of that flying machine, and, the, and then the recognition from Michi early on going, it, it, just like what we called, right? That flying machine is going to be the biggest problem he has to deal with. But then yeah. getting those arrows down twice takes care of a flying machine. When you have this insane cycle, you get your Dark Goblin down, you get your Mortar down defensively, you get your Skeleton King to stack, you play any card you want, like the arrows, and then you're already back around to another Dark Goblin. You can just rinse and repeat over and over. And those arrows, I mean, so obviously crazy. a poison would have been a little bit better Better, but the arrows getting a ton of value on everything on the board not just the flying machine but you talk about those recruits and the zappies as well and even the royal hogs just really really great analysis there by Michi. 
I mean, again, like I, I can't say it enough. The the saving two elixir overall for the spend and for the cycle with three instead of four for the dark element instead of musketeer with three instead of four for the arrows instead of the poison. You just saw how fast he got around over and over again. Some of those defenses. Okay, you talk about like late game triple elixir. How someone might uh, you, you know you've seen. Oh, you have two earthquakes that are overlapping each other on the same tower. We saw that defensively from Michi, that one crazy defense right. where the fly machine seemed like it was going to get through, the pigs were on the tower, but he was able to just get down so much, so fast, over and over again, and what looked like it was going to be the turning point in favor of Jonah, Michi just absolutely clutched it up and held on to turn that into a very decisive victory. We are halfway through our round of 16. Remember, you're watching four of the eight matches being played for time reasons, but that means we're on to our third match, Viper and Schwatzen, two of yeah. the biggest names in the game, two of the arguable best players in their respective countries, and this is going to be a very, very exciting one. You look there, Schwatzen doing what he does, uh, 65 games played, or excuse me, 65 games won, 19 games lost, and then Viper on the other side of it qualifying a lot faster than his opponent here, and this should be a really, really exciting one. Viper is our three seed, Schwatzen is our 13 seed, but that doesn't really do justice to this matchup of Titans. It's this is really, I mean, Viper, without question, the the number one player in France, but certainly from last year, finished fourth in the regular season. As we said earlier, victimized by that day one single elimination for yeah. World Finals last year. Schwatz on the other side just barely missed out. Schwatzen's been another guy who um, made made his way up through the semi pro scene was great in the Clash Contender Series and CCS, uh, was great playing in semi-pro leagues before he got into CRL for 2020. And then his landing in CRL 2020 came onto a Misfits team that was just kind of a bunch of Misfits, right? The, yeah. the, the, the synergy on that squad didn't work. Schwarzen and Bob did not work out well as a 2v2 duo. Um, Air Surfer and Wings, they were all there. They couldn't find the way to make that team come together and really capitalize on the skill sets of, of all four of those guys at one time. And it kind of took the wind out of the sails of a guy who really looked like he was way on the upswing. Schwarzen's still very, very good. A name that we say pretty much every time at these tournaments because he's always in the mix. It's just a question of can he break past what might be that chip on his shoulder that's sticking around from that 2020 season. 1,075 grand challenges won by Schwatz. And let's look at a couple yeah. words from our two competitors here in Viper and Schwatz. Yeah, an insane number. I'm still looking for my first. He's looking for his 1100th. So here we go. Viper says he's pretty confident. I feel like I'm in good shape at the moment, but there are obviously better players. So it'll be fun to compete with them. There's always better players if Mohammed Light's still playing the game. And I don't have anything special to say, just that I'll do my best to win it all. You love the maturity there. You love the experience there out of Viper and also the record recognition of who he's going up against Schwatzen on the other side of it. I'm really happy to get a chance to compete for a golden ticket. Good luck and may the best win. So lots of words from the Frenchman, a few, uh, a, a somewhat fewer f from Schwatzen. And that's one thing about him is the attitude, despite the ups and downs for Schwatzen, the attitude has always been very positive and has maintained a good level overall. So um, we'll see menta mentally how he comes in, uh, mentality, how he's able to focus here. Uh, and then on the side with Viper, um, you know, Viper's one of the, again, another guy out of France, and France has always had players who are near the top, right? We mentioned yep. a number of those players earlier on today. Um, but also, maybe there's some of that Parisian attitude that creeps on in where, uh, you know, we've seen, we've seen so many players who get near the top and then just don't quite put it together. And I don't know, I've, you know, I haven't met with Viper personally. I do know a lot of the other top French players and there certainly is some of that, uh, that Parisian, well, we're, we're, we're French, so we are the best <laughs> already. Uh, and I, and you know, you gotta wonder how they kind of turn that into that competitive fire here. My favorite thing uh, that I would love to see from Viper would be taking aspects of that Hog XC NATO deck and breaking it up. I want to see him master Splash Yard. I want to see him master Hog EQ Cycle. I want to see him master a Rocket Cycle deck. Taking those things because when you watch him play, he's one of the best players in the world using those specific cards. Some of the NATOs that I've seen Viper pull off are absolutely astounding. His kiting with Hog Riders, his knowing when to play them in terms of counting Elixir and Elixir management. He's so good at it. If only he could maybe spread the wealth a little bit with those cards to other more meta decks. Well, and here we go from Schwarzen throwing a big pile of rocks on the board. Golem, yeah. which has we've been seeing a little bit more of as of late. And 
High Mortar here to the opposite lane with the skeleton, with the giant skeleton to play some cleanup as the pressure comes down on that left hand side. Yeah, really nice. Bat's gonna come in. A great fireball here out of Viper, and that should take the Electro Wizard off the board. No, the Mortar goes on top of the Gold Knight and stays there. And a reminder, I see some people asking here in chat. We are streaming on both YouTube and Twitch. I see a lot of you here on YouTube and a lot of the hardcores over on Twitch. So shout out to those of you on both sides who are enjoying yourselves. Yeah, and make sure you are at least over on Twitch before we get into our last matchup here of round number one, just because we will be having a Twitch predict coming your way and who you think is going to win between Morton and Mo. And I think I probably already know who's going to win that poll, but you never know, right? Anything can happen. You never know. Big Spin could raid the Twitch stream, and then next thing you know, <laughs> Morton is the guy who gets more votes. So here we go. Past the midway point of regulation time, and that's a, that's a predictable but still somewhat cheeky lightning there to clean off that Musketeer. Negative two trade, but he'll go ahead and take that damage get the Muskie off the board. Yeah, and there we go. A nice block here with that Giant Skeleton. Mortar will get on tower as that Ewas comes down late. Never mind. Resets on top of the Ewas. Nice play there but Viper doing a great job defending and turning this into a good offense. Those bats are getting tanked for, and the Miner's in there, so the Miner will tank for the bats as well. Ooh. This was a beautiful sequence from Viper. Viper can do that. He can put together big moments and just got that one done. Dark Prince will connect, though, as the guards come in a little bit low, and they do get the Baby Dragon in Princess Tower range, so solid defensive sequence here out of the Frenchman as well. Yeah, and Viper will be able to get back around to those guards. I'm actually okay that he used them early on. Those are going to be his best damage dealers on this big pile of rocks when... Uh, wow, wow! And it misses the pull. The, the high mortar misses the pull on the golem, and I think Viper will be all right, but that is definitely not what you want to see. And this allows Schwatzen to kind of reset and get another offense down on the board. Interesting miss there in interactions. Yeah, and that's, that's a pretty significant chunk here. Again, Schwatzen, as we get into double and in the triple, that's where he starts to get more and more power. So now you're seeing Viper yeah. pressuring the opposite lane just to try to make it so that Schwatzen cannot really like set up and go heavy on that right-hand side. But easy Golem kite. Now the e to the left-hand side. Baby Dragon to work on that mortar. This is going to be some significant pressure here for Viper to try to come contain as we get closer to the triple. Yeah, I think Viper's okay here, but he's still, I'm still really worried about this elixir difference on the board and the counter pushes coming in. I don't know if we see a high golem here. No, we do not. We see a setup in the back with the mega minion. We see elixir taken away, and we Ooh. do still see that high golem in front of the golden knight, but golden knight does get pushed around and in front of the golem with a nice log. And again, not getting picked up by the mortar as the wow. golem gets that big weight and just muscles the giant skeleton out of the way. And that Mortar going to go to the Ewiz, not to the tower. And just like that, suddenly things have shifted. That's 262. It. Lightning will do it. Schwanson just runs down a hill. You're trying to kick water uphill. Well, it, there's gravity, folks. GG, well played. Schwanson takes game number one. As a Mortar player, that just breaks my heart. The two missed pulls on the goal of Viper. Viper had no business losing that game, man. He was even able to defend with the two missed pulls for a moment. But doing that at this level, there's just no way. Schwatzen goes, you're gonna miss that golem again? Perfect, I can set up pressure in the center of the board, take care of that mortar that is down. I can start building a big push because you had to overspend on your defense, just recognizing where the game was kind of going because of the mortars yep. by Viper. And, and look, here's the other thing. I'm okay with playing that high mortar because you're trying to create pressure opposite lane. You're trying to create pressure on those princess towers, but if you miss it once, you think there's no way you're gonna miss it twice. And just a shocking display there by Viper, who I really felt like had that game kind of sewn up for a while. He was doing a great job changing lanes. He was doing a great job making Schwatzen spend down to zero so he couldn't support those golems until the double miss. Sometimes the safe play is the right play, right? Yes. And that's the big one. And you saw, you know, going for the high for the, for the high pull, going to get the tower damage the opposite direction. Sometimes, and I know also he was trying to avoid the lightning low. Yes, yes. So, you know, it's it's hard it's hard to make that call. Um, but 
yeah, sometimes you just gotta gotta make the the simplest, safest play uh, to 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 avoid that situation. That was just you know to seen it once. You're like, okay, I get it. But once that happens one time, you go, no, no, this is never happening again. And to have it happen a second time, that, you, that you're not going to recover. So at that point, um, you know, I, I, if, if you've ever watched me cast Clash Royale, and I know some of you have for many years, you know, I have no love for Golem. Um, but at, at that point, you know, to have at it, Schwatzen, well played. You went and took game number one. Yeah, really, really well played there. And you do understand, like you were talking about, missing that lightning with those mortars being up high. But sometimes that's just going to happen. You can still play that mortar up high and in the center and make it so that Princess Tower will not get hit. And then you can still protect your Musketeer by playing it down into the right, right? So you yeah. are going to get lightning, but what does that mean for your opponent? It's a negative two trade as long as you're protecting everything else. You got a good counter push coming in. That counter push is going to demand just a little bit of a response. And then you can turn up the heat opposite lane, right? Because what does he have? You could even go in with a minor guards push there, right? Because you know that they've got barb barrel, those guards should do a pretty decent job. Yeah. They're going to have to continue to overspend. So being able to create that opposite lane pressure was really the kind of key to victory for Viper for so long. You miss those mortars twice. That's kind of it. GG, well played, and we're moving on. Uh, a bit of a, a bummer for Viper in game number one, but like you said, I, I hate Golem players, but I respect what we just saw. Yeah, and look, you know, if you get the win with Golem in game number one, Think about how few, uh, how, I mean, how many other yeah. decks you leave open, right? Again, we we've talked about that. Deck picks in game number one inform the decisions in game two and game three. What do you have in there? You have Golem, you have Baby Dragon. Baby Dragon's not as ubiquitous in the meta as it used to be. Lightning, not so big in the meta as it used to be. Really, the only thing that, uh, that it concerns you out of those cards is probably the Golden Knight. Of course, yeah. you still have three other champions available. It does take a few options off the board when Golden Knight's no longer in, but the, the other big ones, your win condition, your big spell, some of your major support, it's going to be uh, very, very difficult for Viper to put Schwatzen on anything going forward. So it looks like we got a flash of our players really quick there. Hello, Viper. Hello, Schwatzen. And uh, here we go. Game number two coming your way. Viper down one in this best of three. Schwatzen playing the Mother Witch, who... Haven't seen yet today, and no matter what, because I always play Beatty Swarmy decks, I hate the Mother Witch. I think she is in a pretty good spot right now, and uh, it seems like Schwatzen feels the same way. Yeah, so looking like Royal Giant here out of the German as the Fish Boy gets bamboozled, but then the Queen goes visible too early. Fisherman comes back and pulls, and this is turning into a pretty big push for Schwatzen. Yeah, and you see there, there's the High Inferno coming down last second by Viper. That's going to do great work against this RG. You're going to see that they're actually pretty good in Elixir. You know, uh, Viper's got that pretty healthy Valk, but easily distractible with those Skellies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was going to say, he can control that really well for one that will give him the, I think it's a pretty even one Elixir. Yeah, right on, right, just about right on one Elixir advantage here for Schwatzen. So let's see if he sets up, and he does, no, just cycles the Electro Spirit and he's going to end up coming out on the bottom of this one as he now is behind on Elixir. Viper, though, not going to really capitalize on that advantage. And Fishboy gets set up to the left, or to the right, as Valk goes for Viper to the left. And this is the fascinating conversation of what you were just mentioning, Rich, is yes, the only spell that was out of play was Lightning, but for Schwatzen, that's the only spell that he really wishes I think he had right now, right? You talk about going into that Inferno Tower, playing against this Archer Queen, he would really love to have a Lightning, uh, but that is not at his disposal as it was played in game number one. So I'm very curious to see if we're going to maybe see an Earthquake as his big spell. Yeah, Earthquake or potentially Fireball, those are the two most likely options. Uh, we, you know, we haven't seen the EQ. It's still early. Of course, this deck with how fast it cycles, it does feel more earthquakey. And take a look at that. Hog gets in. No surprises here. And there you go. The earthquake out of Viper, and the fireball out of Schwatz. And you know, this is kind of what I was talking about at the top of this set. Was look, you know, look at this deck from Viper. It's not Hog Exynado. It's it's using the Archer Queen. It's using the Valk. It's using the Inferno and the delivery delivery incredibly strong right now. But then it's still using Hog, which he is, again, one of the best Hog users in the game. His understanding of the mechanics of that 4 Elixir win condition is almost unrivaled. So to see him changing up the deck but still using cards he loves, that's exactly what I want to see out of Viper. AQ getting good value on the right-hand side. Skeleton King gets in deep, cannot pop that ability due to that Valkyrie. And Valk gets pulled in and actually going to take that Mother Witch off very quickly. So things starting to go in Viper's favor. Does have the Valk on the board, even Elixir will get some damage, and with the RG around in the back, immediate 
push here from the Hog Rider. This should be enough for a King Tower activation, though, and that can change some of the math. The question now is, has Viper created enough of a gap here to be able to just EQ his way out and keep putting pressure down? And it feels that way with, this, with, uh, with no real true answer for that Inferno Tower. Yeah, that Inferno Tower is just a nuisance for Schwatzen. Still going to get a shot in, though, here. A little surprising as we see that Skeleton King come down opposite lane. High Fish Boy here. And this is also a situation where if Schwatzen wants, because the damage isn't that drastic or dramatic in that right-hand tower, I mean, it is about a 1,000, he can do this dual lane pressure dance, or he can change lanes last minute if he wants and start going into that Hog Rider push. So here we go. Fireball on top of that Inferno and no big damage in for either of these guys at the moment. AQ down, Skelly's behind, Hog Rider coming on in. Fishboy totally distracted here. Oh man. Hog Rider will get one, maybe two. Does get a second, 976 remaining, and that is a huge gap opened up as we go into the final minute. Viper doing exactly what you have to do when you're playing Hog Rider as your win condition. How is my opponent defending, and how can I make them think twice about how they're going to defend? Those skeletons are not getting the value they want. He's always having to use that log, and there you go. Viper doing what Viper does with that Hog Boy, and just overwhelming by a beautiful recognition of, okay, you like to play skellies and log? Great. I'm going to play a Fire Spirit behind my Hog Rider. Okay, you're going to start using Fish Boy? Perfect. I'm going to get my AQ to tank for my Hog Rider. Oh, wait, no, there's something in the opposite lane that's going to distract that fish boy. I'm going to punish you with Hog Rider. Oh, I don't have Fire Spirit and Cycle. I'm going to cycle my Earthquake to take care of those skeletons. Just really, really great changing up of that offense, which made Schwatzen really uncomfortably for his own offense. That was straight up Viper being Viper. It's exactly yes. what that was and did it did it beautifully. So uh, GG well played for Viper. And man, you know, it's one of those things where you saw the lightning out of, uh, out of play and it felt like and building the deck that uh, he chose here for Schwatzen, you understand why Fireball's in here. It's very, it's probably the more common with this construction of RG. With Royal Giant, typically the, the Earthquake variation is uh, a little heavier than this more cycle-based variation. But he, it's one of those mind games where he didn't really have a good answer for any building. And you have to imagine that with, elect, with, with Lightning Out, Viper was going to play a building of yes. some sort. And he played, ended up the, the one that was the most shut down one in this matchup. Yeah, I mean, that's that's literally hitting the analysis absolutely nail on the head there, recognizing what was out of play. And I also love the other cards that Viper used because of it, right? He's going, all right, cool, Lightning's out of play, definitely going to play the Inferno, and definitely going to play that AQ. She's going to get so much value. Instead of getting that even trade out, he's going to have to either overspend or he's going to have to overdefend, which also in turn becomes overspending. So really great stuff out of Viper and, you know, Having him play Hog Rider with a deck that is more firmly in the meta, really, really nice play there. I think I would have just liked to see Schwatzen play Earthquake. I, I really do. I think that seeing him play Earthquake, and obviously it's easy for me to say after that game two is over, but also it feels like your opponent's probably going to play a building. Royal Giant is everywhere right now. It's so strong. And just in case you run into an Inferno Tower, that EQ could do just a little bit more in terms of helping you with that cycle and helping you with that building taking off the board. Well, Inferno Tower, Tesla, Mortar, like there were just so many options there available for Viper to be using uh, uh, for that building. Cannon, which is still very popular right now. Yeah. Uh, there were so many so many options, just not having a building, not having a, a solution for a building, I think was a bit of an oversight on Schwatzen's part. And, you know, he got, he got the one with Golem game number one. He's been playing a lot of Golem lately, so no big surprises there. But it just seems from the analysis side, Viper was one step ahead here in game number two. And now we go into game number three, and it becomes a, a curious question on Schwatzen's side where, where he goes from here, right? Golem game number one, RG game number two, played a lot of cycle cards in that RG deck. So hamstrings, a lot of the more likely cycle decks, you know, it, it feels like the predictable move here is he goes piggies in game number three. If he goes that way, my suspicion is that Viper will be very ready for it. Yeah, I mean, I think Viper will be happy to rock. I mean, he doesn't have Fireball at his disposal, but there's still a lot of other cards he can use to take care of those piggies. I just don't think I want to see Schwatzen go Drill. And, and even though Drill might be the better decision and maybe he comes out with it and wins with it, it just feels like that's maybe more of the predictable way to go just because Drill feels like one of those win conditions you have to play in every set. I, I don't know why I feel that way. It just feels that way with what the meta is currently in. And I think that conversation also changes when we get to our next matchup between Morton and Moe. 
Like, I don't know if wall breakers and drill and those types of things are the correct thing to play because they're so well known for it. So Schwarz in here may be playing Graveyard, which I am I'm much more okay with than him playing Drill, but never mind. Be lava comes here. Out. Yeah, it's going to be Lava. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I like that. I actually really like the Lava play. Um, and I believe uh, he has... Oh, he doesn't have Giant Skeleton available. So yeah, definitely interesting. So Lava Clone, it looks like. This is fascinating here with the Night Witch in the mix as Viper sets up with the Cannon Cart plus Snowball. Snowball's on a cycle, though. And yeah, the, the cloniness begins to get higher, but Mother Witch for Viper. And oh boy, that could end up being a, a big problem for Schwarzen as we go forward. And then Viper doing a great job recognizing, okay, there's probably only one other ground unit that is available to be played. It ends up being the guard, so that's why you see Schwatzen having to wait until that Golden Knight dash comes in. A late Mega Minion gonna come in here on top of this push, and I think we're gonna be pretty even maybe coming out of this with Schwatzen slightly behind. Yeah, cage to pick up, it's a smart cage. Snowball now will be saved. Oh, Snowball and arrows, wow. Yeah, nice. And this is a, uh, a beautiful defensive situation for Viper. Assuming he is against Clone, which it certainly looks like, um, man, this is going to be a, a tough way to break through for Schwarzen. I know. I almost want to see a, 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 a Cannon Cart Golden Knight push here in the opposite lane from Viper because the only responses in the ground are going to be that Miner or that... Um, uh, Tombstone, which will both get eaten alive along with the guards because the Night Witch is out of play. Instead, he decides to go same lane with the Golden Knight. Well, this is this is actually a very, for, for being a lava deck, Tombstone, Night Witch, Miner, and guards, that's a lot of ground support for this being a lava deck. You don't usually run into that much. So I understand why he's playing here because he wants to distract the supporting troops and put as much damage on that Lava Hound in front and get it out of the way as he can. And there you go. You see the fruits of that labor. Yeah. Really, really shut that one down oh. nicely and played same lane. And this is the hardest question you have when playing against Lava is do you go same or opposite? And we're seeing the answer from Viper right here. It's just this friggin' Mother Witch, man. Just go into town wreaking havoc, and now Viper pours it on. He goes Mega Minion Graveyard opposite lane. It's gonna be a two tower situation, yep. and I think this is all said and done and sewn up here in our third set of the day. A beautiful, beautiful game number three here by Viper, knowing this deck inside and out isn't Lava Clone, it's just Lava Miner. I don't know how I feel about this deck choice out of Schwatzen. I don't think it has the strongest synergy in the current meta. I think that maybe you drop one of those ground units out and throw in that clone, but I don't think it really would have mattered. Snowball, Arrows, and Mother Witch in play here. That is a tough matchup for the German, who has just been eliminated with a $500 check. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a brutal one there for Schwarzen, and Viper and his team got a really great read there, right? Uh, they, I mean, beautiful matchup there against Lava, and the macro of it was played perfectly. Yep. Knew when to go opposite lane, knew when to go same lane. Um, so, I mean, that part of it, couldn't you could not have seen a better set of decision-making out of Viper there. And it's one of the things about Schwarzen is, you know, there was a, but the Barb Hut meta was the best meta Schwarzen ever played in. When the right. Barb Hut was the, was the most powerful, most annoying card in the deck, that's a big reason why he got picked up for Misfits in 2020, and that was pre-Barb Hut nerf, because he was so good in the Barb Hut meta. Schwarzen is really good with decks with a four-plus average elixir. Right, he's not a cycle player, and Viper just read him like a book here in games two and three. Yeah, and you look there, two Lava Hounds came down. That second one was pretty ill-advised, but didn't really have anything to, else to do. He was trying to just make anything happen. Those Mother Witches, though, four of them came out, and I believe it was two of them just absolutely wreaking havoc all over Schwarz and just not having any responses. Then the Pups, then the Skellies, then the Skelly Dragons, all just feeding into that Mother Witch. On top of that, the Night Witch plus the Bats, just brutal stuff here. What a great pull on that four Elixir Legendary that can really change the game on a dime. Yeah, I mean, this was this was a, a dominant performance by Viper. You know, and, and you talk about the question of, of versatility. I think that's answered. Look, I mean, if you go through Viper's history as a pro, he, he didn't make top four in the, uh, in the previous year for CRL just off of ladder play. He made it pretty deep in those qualifiers as well, right? He, went, he, he earned a lot of points that way. 
he certainly did a lot of that overall in his uh, in his ladder play. But he's not somebody who's who's just a ladder guy and incapable of playing competitive. And we saw that versatility here. But more importantly, we saw the analysis and preparation here in that match against Watson. And as we've seen, you can be good at this game, but that greatness, that next level, the becoming the Pharaoh of Clash Royale, for example, right. that requires the preparation of the team to get you across that finish line. And just perfect interactions, perfect understanding of the matchup. I loved this graveyard when it came in because he knew Vi get enough out of it. So just really, really great stuff there by Viper. I loved what we saw in that third game. I loved his deck choices. I thought they were unique. I thought they played to his strengths. I thought they were really hard to predict, and that's going to make this next round, which we're about to get to, a lot more difficult for whoever his opponent will be. And that means we're at our final matchup Ooh. here of our first round. And Rich, my good lord, is this a... This could be our grand finals, and we'd be very happy. This is a match that I could watch a hundred times. I, I And yep. I feel like I have not... I don't think I've seen this as often as I have seen Mohammed Light versus uh, Lucas X Gamer. I think we've seen Lucas and Mo go head to head more. But you're talking about a guy who, for about a two year run between 2019 and 2020, was the consensus best player in the game in Morton. And the guy who just felt like an uncrowned king for a long time. And then came somebody who changed the game entirely. Dual mode was introduced. Mohammed Light figured it out in a way that nobody else has, put together the micro macro put together the preparation and no one has won the way he has for the last two years yeah i mean you look at the work that julesy and jebas have done with mohammed light and that's all well and good they work with other players also out in the world right they're not just they're not bought on contract to just be with mohammed light but only Mo can take that analysis and run with it because he has the best micro I have ever seen in this game. Now, when we talk about micro and macro, Morton not far behind Mohammed Light, but Mo just has that Jordan factor. He has that it factor. He has that something special. I was watching a Juicy J stream the other day, and a big shout out to Juicy. Really happy to see him kind of coming back in the competitive scene, at least on ladder, at least in ter um, global tournaments. He is arguably one of the top five splash yard players in the game right now. He was playing against Muhammad Light. Muhammad Light was playing a 2.8 Elixir Cycle um, bait deck. It had like Fire Spirit, Skellies, Mighty Miner, Princess, Barrel, and Cannon. And that was basically it. And he still beat Juicy. And Juicy was going, how is he doing this? I have a matchup. I have Poison. I have NATO. I, 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 like, there's no way I should lose this game. And he was just like, he's so good. He's so good. So that's the guy that we're seeing here. But you fast forward to a couple of years ago, that's what we were saying about Morton. So this is what it's going to be. Morton and Mo. one of them has to go at the end of this. And just a quick catch up, since we have a little bit of time with our bracket, Mario or Michifu and Inaraj. That's going to be one of our matchups in round two. Faust and Viper going to be a great matchup in round number two. Rosin Novel, I believe I'm saying that correct. And Hugo CRV2 out of France, a great player there, a great control player. And then Catgun is sitting and waiting in the wings wondering, is it Morton or am I probably going to go home in the quarterfinals? Is it Morton or is it Mo? He's going to have to wait and see at the end of this great best of three. Well, before we get to those, let's take a look at a quick word from Mohamed Light and from Morton. Take a look at what our players have to say going into this matchup in today's competition. And Mohamed Light wearing the patented gold sweater. I'm feeling good. Hoping to bring this W home. Good luck to everyone. I mean, yes, good luck and may the best win. Yes. And may I win. <laughs> yeah. Good luck to everyone because you need it and may the best win because I want more money. So there goes Mohamed Light, uh, who is the, is the presumptive favorite. But of course, on their side of it, you have Morton. I'm just going to yep. try to play as good as I can. Good luck and have fun, everyone. And that's Morton. You know, you talk about attitude here. Um, Morton has never been a player who's shown any sort of um, any sort of hubris. He's always been one of the yeah. most down-to-earth, humble, and hardworking players in the game. And you know, you talk about goats overall, right? And Surgical Goblin, of course, uh, is like the OG goat of Clash Royale. Muhammad Light is, without question, the best player who's ever touched the game, or at least the stars have aligned to give him the best run we've ever seen in the game. But the consistency of Morton. 2018 to now and he's still he's been in the championship conversation for five years nobody else is do, has done or is doing that there isn't a you can't find another person other than El, than Elsiop who was someone who was in that conversation that long 
yeah, you know, Morton is one of those guys that it feels like if, if it's all said and done and Morton retires from Clash Royale in 2050 because it feels like he could just play forever, uh, he'll be a person that if he never won a world championship, he'll win an honorary world championship, like how they do the honorary Oscars, that type yeah. of thing. What he's done for this game, uh, it's streaming potential, you know, the viewership, American, German, uh, all languages. I, I feel like Morton's so good. You don't even need to speak whatever language he's speaking at the time, whether it's English or German. You just want to watch him play because the gameplay speaks for itself. And I agree, man. Consistently brilliant for so long. But if you're consistently brilliant at 98% and you're playing against someone who's at 99 and 100%, it's still a really tough spot to be in when you talk about that top tier, that S plus player. So honestly, it would be incredible to see Morton walk out of this set. And maybe just because Mo feels that he doesn't have to win today, this is a moment where Morton could take the edge. I mean, here's the big X factor though, right? Is besides you talk about all the different skill set type stuff, it's the it's that where Mo is better than anybody else in the world without question is the same place where Morton has had the most trouble in his career. And that's deck yes. selection, right? If there's one that's kept Morton hamstrung, it's the, the wrong deck at the wrong time. You know, you go back to the one HP game between uh, Morton and Surgical Goblin at 2019 World Finals. That was, that game was crazy because Surge went in with like a 65, 70% advantage in the matchup between those two decks. And Morton still made it into a one HP game. That's part of why yeah. that game was so legendary. But that's the continuous problem, in my opinion, during this solos format. If there was one thing we talked about over and over in 2021, it was almost ad nauseum. We were like, Morton's deck choice is becoming too predictable. He, he, right. People are reading him really, really hard. If, if he can overcome that, that's one of those big things that I think changes what Morton's 2022 looks like from a competitive standpoint. So there's all the history of the two, two of the greatest players to ever touch Clash Royale. So who do you have? Twitch predict coming up on your screen here in just a moment. Do you have Morton? Do you have Mo? Go over to Twitch and vote right now. Who's it gonna be here in our Snapdragon Pro Series? E-U-M-E-N-A. Remember, where winning matters, think Snapdragon. And right now, in a best of three, single elimination with 25K on the line, winning definitely matters. So get those votes in and we'll see who's gonna come out on top. Is it the German? Is it the Egyptian? Is it the old goat? Is it the current goat? We'll find out in this great best of three coming your way in just a moment. It sounds like they're having a little bit of issues with some of the player cams or who knows, maybe they're picking their decks. Either way, we're gonna get into the action very, very quickly. And this is it. This is the last matchup of our round of 16. Half of our players already eliminated. Boom, let's go. Morton top of your screen, Mohammed Light at the bottom. And people forget this, Mohamed Light, much like a lot of the, the young players who broke into the scene between, let's call it 2019 and 2021, started off as a mortar player. Mo was a phenomenal mortar player as a new player, and um, he's, of course, expanded that beyond. But now looks like he's... So this might be the version of that Mortar Miner Skeleton King deck that I was talking about earlier. We saw Michifu play a variation on it, but Mo now playing what looks like the more popular version We'll see if I'm calling this one right here in the end. As Morton bringing out our first view of the Mighty Miner today. We'll see if Mo gets caught flat-footed and that Mighty Miner puts on some serious damage. The ability to outplay with Mighty Miner is one of my favorite things in the game. It's so beefy that you can get that three elixir or that three card cycle around. It's also so brilliant in terms of being able to swap lanes and baiting out more elixir than your opponent would like, or them having to play units up high and in the center so that it's doing double lane duty. So mortars out on both sides and I've seen this deck from Morton before. It's definitely not quite as popular as the one that we're probably seeing here out of Mo. Um, but both of them have their strengths. And, you know, again, talking about that three-card cycle with that Mighty Miner on the board, that's something that Morton's going to want to abuse once we get into Double Elixir. The guards make it seem like Mo is not playing Skeleton King. That would be kind of a surprise if it's ended up being the Skeleton King deck going guards uh, rather than Skarmy. So we'll see if that is, in fact, the case as we go on. And quick shout out to Querdy over in the Twitch chat saying, I love how last year Morton said he was focusing on content and still got four in World Finals. Well, that's that's yeah. Morton for you. And yes, it's going to be the giant skeleton uh, version here as opposed to the uh, what looked like was going to be the Skeleton King variation. I know there's so many skeletons now in the game, you got to be careful when you're saying what it is. Giant skeleton. Right, there's skeleton King. Skeleton Army. <laughs> skeleton in a balloon. Skeleton, skeleton in a barrel. 
<laughs> skeleton in a box. There's so many skeletons here. This is why they pay us the big bucks, man. We, <laughs> we could just do this for hours. <laughs> so far, no skeletons in the closet, though, so that's, uh, that's a good one here. And I do see some people on the YouTube chat going, hey, when does gameplay start? Uh, just so you know, we, uh, we will, we're here to help, help uh, ease the transition from game to game. At, well, I promise you, as soon as games are ready to go, you will always be seeing that gameplay here on screen. So we appreciate you being here and uh, your patience as we make sure each game is ready to rock and the players are ready to give you their best for each and every game. Of course, what you want to see here when you're seeing two of the all-time greats go head-to-head. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the biggest things about the change in format, right? Back in the day, it was pre-submitted decks. You had to get them in the night before. They were the only ones that were available, so you just had to pick which one you wanted when your time came. Now with dual mode and your analysts, there's so much more that goes into that conversation. Uh, the respect needs to be paid to the pros and their analysts to give them that time. And of course, there is still a window of penalty that can be incurred, as you guys may have remembered last year, Mohammed Light, maybe the most expensive three minutes of his life, oh, my costing Lord. him $10,000 by having to get disqualified qualified at the end of a grand finals so just remember guys there is a timer but this is dual mode and just like rich said we're always getting in the game as soon as we can mohammed light in the lead by about 270 hp we'll see if morton can change that narrative here as we are ticking down with only 75 seconds remaining morton doing a good job there with the fire spirit making sure that those bats don't get value guards do get pulled back he was ready for that move but now the pressure coming in pretty heavy here from Mo on the left-hand side, and it's really just to force Moore to defend that left-hand lane. Guards a little bit late for Morton on the right-hand side as we do get a mortar down defensively to respond to the offensive mortar out of Mohamed Light. Fireball does go ahead and take care in conjunction with that mortar of that musketeer. Here we go. Miner into the front. A Ooh. great fire spirit plus log out of Morton. And just like that, 1375 to 1280. Tries to predict the Miner to the back. Does Morton. Here we go. Final 35 seconds. Game number one. Tight as you would expect. Yeah, this is trouble, though. That predicted, trying to predict that Miner made it so that Mighty Miner wasn't in play to play on top of that Giant Skeleton. Musketeer got on top of that first Hunter, and now that Giant Skeleton getting dangerously close to Princess Tower, which means oh an overspend has to come out of the German, and now Mohammed Light taking control of this game. He is fast and furious with his Miners, and no Miner placement is ever a mistake for Mohammed Light. Guards did pick up one great pickup from uh, on that other side. Here we go. Fireball in, plus log, plus minor. Can it do it? No, it will not. GG, well played. Mohamed Light taking a win. Morton put on some great defensive moments, but Mo ended up taking the win here and the advantage in this single elimination round of 16 matchup. I mean, fool me once, fool me twice, right? You saw that great minor fire spirit log that came down from Morton to get rid of the guards, a brilliant connection on Princess Tower, good damage came in, narrowed that gap, but you can't fool Mo twice. Morton getting out that quote unquote predictive mighty minor to get on top of the minor of Mohammed Light, that's what's so brilliant and special about Mo. He goes, what is the best play for my opponent? It would be to catch my miner. So what am I going to do? I'm going to give pressure the opposite lane, then send in my miner, because that is going to completely disrupt my opponent's defensive sequence. Get that mighty miner up high, or get that first hunter down, then some bait units to distract, then the mighty miner, then the second hunter comes down. Morton kind of had that drawn up perfectly to take care of those giant skeleton plus musketeer pushes. What does Mo do? The unpredictable thing. He holds on the miner. He gets more down on the left-hand lane. Then the mighty miner's out of cycle, and it's just brilliance there because Morton played that almost perfectly. It's, it's almost like he played it too perfectly and almost too predictably late game, but man, that, that was so dang close. Yeah, I mean, there were some nice guards pickups. There was one that was perfect to the number three spot, that inside front corner, but there was one that was late to the back, and it was just Morton doing everything he could to keep up. And it's interesting because Morton had the faster cycle here. 3.1 to get say, around. Yeah. Uh, yeah, nine to get around, 3.1 average versus 3.5 average. But it felt like Mo had the faster cycle of the two, even though actually that went towards Morton's direction. 
and Mo's ability to go, all right, defensive mortar, offensive mortar, defensive mortar, offensive, offensive, offensive. He kept getting those offensive mortars down and it made it so that Morton's mortars could only be used yeah. defensively. He could never create the same amount of pressure that Mo was because Mo kind of had him beat in that cycle of in terms of getting that mortar down offensively, which again is surprising because you talk about not only does Morton have the faster cycle, but Morton has the ability to have the three card cycle with that mighty minor in play. So Mohammed Light being able to yeah. recognize that and keep up with that cycle is so incredibly impressive once again from this guy who just understands everything about this game top to bottom, inside and out. And even in that, even with all of that, it still was a very close game one. Yeah, and that's and and that's Morton for you, right? Is uh, we've, we talked about it since 2018. We saw how often he was good at playing out of bad situations, playing out of places where he shouldn't be able to pull off that defense. But the the, the other side of that one is, if you keep playing at the edge, eventually your foot's going to slip off, right? Yep. And that's one of those things where we used to see Morton able to recover from those bad situations a ton in 2018, 2019 into 2020, and where in 2021, 2022, we've seen just a bit less of it. Now, of course. He has split his focus a bit. He's not playing from competitive standpoint the same way he was, as Querdy said in the Twitch chat. He's he's a, a massive content creator, huge yes. on Twitch, two channels now, I think over 200,000 subs in both English and German on YouTube. So a bit of a split focus there and a, a fairly well, uh, a fairly lucrative split focus, if you will. <laughs> um, and so it's one of those questions where it's like, hey, you're not putting the same focus in to being a competitive player as you were at the same time. To be this good still while doing all that is just bananas. And you see the opposite thing out of Mohammed Light, right? Taking his creative side to uh, give, putting it in the backseat to continue with the competitive side because that's where his mindset is at. People love watching Mo stream. People love watching him put videos up on YouTube. If one's up, they immediately get tens of thousands, a hundred thousands of views. It's crazy. But he is taking a backseat, or that's taking a backseat to his competitive focus, which is why we're seeing that difference. And and another thing that I was just thinking of as you know we're hopping into game number two here, Morton on the brink of elimination is. How does it feel when you're playing against Mohammed Light and you make one mistake one minute into the game? It's so much more of a blow to your confidence than playing against anyone else. You're like, oh man, he's already got a 200 damage lead and we're not even in double elixir. I'm, it's done because he's not going to make any mistakes. And that was one of the surprising things that we saw in the uh, golden edition of the Queso Cup, right? We saw Mo misplay a couple buildings in back-to-back -back sets, which he still won. But those were the rare mistakes that you're ever going to get out of Muhammad Light. I just want to say, did, did, does the Mother Witch have no splash damage anymore? I just saw a Mother Witch up against a Tombstone and Skeleton King. There were skeletons everywhere, and not a single piggy got created. That must be the most, like, blind Mother Witch. Get her some glasses or something. I, I don't know if she's nearsighted or farsighted but I cannot believe she didn't convert a single pig in that opening sequence. Yeah, that single target Mother Witch, if she gets just caught on something and distracted with all those swarm units around, it feels like Morton missed a huge opportunity there, but uh, not quite, not quite there. Skeleton King ability popped deep in enemy territory. Electro Spirit does come out to clean up most of that, but Mother Witch put damage on the right-hand side. So just like that, Morton, as we reach the midway point of regulation time, takes the lead 24-38 to 22-82. Separated by just under a couple hundred here. Morton rocking a very interesting version of this deck. With Skeleton King, Mother Witch, and Giant Skeleton. Mohammed Light running something uh, much more firmly in the meta. Yeah, I think this is somewhat similar to a graveyard deck that we saw earlier today. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see if that is in, case, in fact the direction that Morton's going. And you see Mo setting up low with the Tombstone, I think expecting a graveyard push into this right-hand side. And Mo just pouring all of his elixir into this right-hand side, not having to really worry too much about those zappies on the left. This is uh, Electro Spirit will do, and one zappy will connect with that Mother Witch again, struggling to get piggies on the board. Yeah, this has been, she's been well controlled here so far by Mohammed Light, and now opposite lane pressure oh, from the Royal Giant, as this is all committed to the right-hand lane. Could be a decent amount of damage here. The Zappies will mitigate a ton of this, and he might even Tombstone behind one of these Zappies. No, he's not going to waste, waste the Elixir on that one now. 1676 to 1824. And while we saw one in the Queso Cup Golden Edition, no Phantom Giant Skeleton Bomb.
taking that right hand tower yeah. for Mohammed Light this time. And that is a great recognition there by Mo of all the defensive units that were going to come down from Morton. We'll see if Morton can turn this little pile of skeletons, a hog, some zappies, and a mother witch into any offense. And he drops a giant skeleton down opposite lane at the bridge. I don't know if I love that play, but I do understand creating that pressure and then hoping probably to get some piggies out of this. But once again, man, Mohammed Light and his interactions does not allow for those piggies to come down with a perfectly timed Skeleton King. I have never seen someone control a Mother Witch like this. This is, I, I mean, and again, I, I, there are very few people on the planet who have cast more Clash Royale than I have. Uh, and I have never seen someone bamboozle a Mother Witch the way that we've seen Muhammad Light do it. And he's doing such a great job of just going, all right, what's the most dangerous thing that Morton can have? It's that Mother Witch popping skeletons into Hoggies. So he's focused on that. 110%, and like you said, man, one of the more impressive displays we've ever seen of controlling that pesky, pesky Mother Witch. And here we go. Morton on the offensive, though. Muhammad Light in trouble. A lot of trouble here. 729, 669, getting down to around 600 HP, 613 on that right-hand side. Adusa Dot says, Richard Mother Witch had splashed. You realize how OP that would be? Yes, I realized that in retrospect as I was saying it. <laughs> it just it feels like she hits everything when she hits. But um, maybe we're just not all Mohammed Light. So uh, GG well played here to Mo on the control, despite all that at the moment with 30 seconds left. Looks like Morton's in a pretty good spot, although double RG on that left-hand lane. Wow, double RGs to run into double tombstones. RG taken for the first one, or first one taken for the second, and that tombstone evaporated off the map, but only 188 remaining. Poison comes in, and that's going to be it. A graveyard comes down instead. There's the poison. We're going to game number three. This is some of the best Clash Royale. We've seen so much insanely high-level CR this year. I mean, some of the best we've ever watched. Yeah. And we're still, it feels like the gift just keeps on giving. This has already been one of my favorite matches of the year through two. And the, the biggest is that one of these two has to go home in about five minutes. I know. I know. And, and you know, the only people that are happy about that are the other 14, which are actually yeah. now down to seven players that are just waiting to see, all right, one of these guys is going to go home, and that is a huge win for us waiting in this quarterfinals. And obviously, you know, Mo winning or Morton winning doesn't mean that they're just going to make it all the way to the grand finals, but this is definitely the heaviest hitting set of the entire day thus far. Either of these guys could take this whole thing, and Mo Muhammad Light takes game one. Morton doesn't go quietly into the night. Bounces back in game number two. I love the deck variability we're seeing. I love what Morton's had. You know, seeing that Mighty Miner for the first time out, changing it up with that Mortar deck that we've, you know, there's so many different versions of Mortar that are popular, but actually getting the Mighty Miner out didn't work out in game number one, but that wasn't because of the deck choice. It was just because of how well his opponent played. Fast forward to game number two. It looked like it was maybe sewn up a couple times for both of these guys, right? It was like, all right, Morton's definitely in the lead by so much, but then all of a sudden two Royal Giants come down. It looked like Mo was maybe going to overwhelm him, but brilliant defense there from the German to make this a 1-1 set. And now we go into game number three, and this is where your analyst makes his money. Uh, I'm pretty sure yep. it's Jeebus right now who's doing the analysis yep. for Mohammed Light. Don't know who's working with Morton in this competition. I, I, I know that Julesy is primarily retired, and I can't imagine that he would be retired and then be like, yeah, Morton, now I'll, I'll analyze for you against the guy who, uh, who you know, helped me make tons of money last year as we just rampaged through competitive Clash Royale. So I don't know who's working on Morton's side, but they better be sitting there with spreadsheets, with with rope going from from pin to pin, <laughs> with some with some pictures, with uh, sticky notes below to label who's what and where and which suspect we have our eyes on. Uh, they better be in the lab. Yeah, I, be I believe that this is definitely a moment where Morton has struggled in the past. This is the moment where Jebez and Julesy have succeeded in the past, is figuring out this Game 3 matchup. Muhammad Light has so many times, even if it's a 50-50 matchup, uh, for Mo Light, that's already a bad spot for his opponent yeah. to be in because then you're talking about outplaying Mo. But he usually finds himself in a 60-40, 70-30, sometimes even 80-20s in this game number three. And that's really what you're trying to avoid right now if you are Morton. Maybe he's working with Sam. Maybe he's doing it on his own. But trying to game Mohammed Light is so difficult too because he's so good with every deck out there. 
but the best thing to do right now is lean on what's the strongest in the meta and lean on lean on what has already been played and then what is still available and that's why you pay an analyst right they're doing that over the course of that five minute game meanwhile now if morton is by himself he's trying to figure that out in between this last game in this last set yeah we'll see let's see how uh how we get into this one Obviously, uh, this has been the the thing that favors Morton, or favors Mohammed Light over the years between these two. So uh, I'm very curious to see what Morton comes out out with here. The things you don't want to see, you don't want to see wall breakers. Unlikely yep. to see wall breakers at this stage. Drill, uh, man. I mean, I have to go back through the deck choices here so far, but I don't think Drill is the right one. Um, I believe that we do have our predictions back in here and maybe twitch did send us a uh a, a raid from big spin because 51 percent right. to 49 percent in favor of mo was the overall prediction so very very tight between these two from the viewer perspective yeah i'm actually really surprised there but then again you talk about that that whole content creator side of it morton definitely has more followers on Twitch, and I'm sure everyone in his community that he has on following him on Twitter, on his two YouTube channels, they're all here putting in those votes. Then the other side of it is basically everyone else in the world that is probably going, all right, well, on paper, it should be Muhammad Light, but a 51-49 Twitch predict here, and that's why we love to have you guys do that for us. Really, really neck and neck when you talk about these two Titans, heavy hitters, goats of the game, Hall of Famer, first round ballots, whatever you want to call them, they're the best that there is and the best that there probably will be for at least some time, but who's going to be the best of this set that is the question as our players are figuring out their deck choices before we hop into the final game rich who you got well i just got word in twitch chat from jane kushal who's a a, a a pretty active player and viewer in the competitive scene that julesy is working with morton and will be working with morton wow. for this crl so uh that might be the craziest news that i've heard um this uh, A2 Julesy is what I guess uh, Mohammed Light has to be saying at this point, because yeah, that right. might be the, uh, I don't know if you call that a heel turn or a face turn, but either way, it's a turn <laughs> that Julesy is going to be working with Morton uh, for, for deck picking. And we are getting a little bit of a delay here. And, you know, now that I know that Julesy is in the mix, now I understand why there's a bit of a delay, because it's probably Julesy going over 15,000 decks trying to figure out which one he wants to play against the best player on the planet. I, it's, uh, you literally took every sentence out of my mouth there. Yes, that's yeah. why the delay is on Morton's side instead of Moe's. He's working with Julesy, who is known to be taking uh, longer than he always should in terms of picking decks. It's maybe one of his biggest downfalls, a $20,000 mistake or a $10,000 mistake. But when you talk about how far Moe went, it kind of balances out when you look at 2021. But I am shocked, man. Yeah, 8-2. Uh, <laughs> Julesy, what are you doing? You, you, you worked with Moe for so long. You know his play style and his deck choice is better than anyone. But if there's another analyst out there, it's Jebba's that can go toe to toe with Julesy. So we've got the two M's and Mo and Mohammed. We got the two J's and Julesy and Jebba's, <laughs> arguably the four best in the game at their respective jobs. And here we go Morton and Mo, game number and three. Yeah, game number three, and uh, I need to reach out to Julesy again on this one. We are planning to do a video together that's all about how the best and worst ways to pick deck number one in a duels mode match. I just have to find the scheduling time to get Jules and I together for that one. But uh, for those of you interested in getting more involved in the competitive scene, we're going to do a whole breakdown on the mentality behind picking your opening deck in a BO3 duel. So I was going to say, Mohammed Light looking like he's either running Golem or Lava, and he ends up going down with the Lava Night Witch, so it could be Clone. Flying Machine going to come down here as well. So a lot of that, those great aspects to Lava Clone. And if you're Morton, you're going to hope that he has Poison, Zap, Magic Archer, hopefully some of that stuff's in there to help clean up whatever may be coming down this lane. This might be that There's same Minor Arrows deck out of Mo as well, so we'll see. La oh, so I think it's oh, a Lava wow. Minor Barbs. Yeah, um, it's looking more and more like it. What a fascinating choice here. Nato to pull that together. Magic Archer will turn. Skeletons to hold. And that is a really nice bit of defense. That Magic Archer now going on 15 shots, I think. Uh, that's where you get elixir value out of the white-haired bandit. Yeah, I would have loved to see that. That I think that Nato come down a half second later. Would have helped with a little bit of that damage. Um, but still a brilliant, brilliant play there. And then we see Mo what? going lava, barbs. Night Witch Elixir Collector. What on earth? Oh my word. Okay, well, 
Um, you know, you want to talk about creativity. If there's one thing that Jeebus is not lacking here, it's that. Unpredictability yeah. here in game number three. Morton going with a much more meta deck here and going right. What a greatly timed. And the barbs get down to stop it. I was going to say what a beautifully timed Golden Knight, but the barbs do prevent the big time damage. Still lead right now going towards Morton with 45 left in regulation. Yeah, he gets that connection, but you really, really want those swings to come in, man. And Morton really knew that Mort or that uh, Mo was in a tough spot elixir-wise. We see the double arrows come out there from Mohammed Light. So going elixir collector, mirror lava in game three with everything on the line. And this is one of those situations where you're like, well, would he have done this if he still needed a golden ticket? Who knows? But it's definitely fun to watch. Yeah, I mean, is this Mo? Is your YouTube active again? Because this is bananas. Uh, but on the flip side of it, I'm going to put one one key factor here. The the pump mirror combination is certainly strong, but it's the most strong when you have a champion and you can pump champion, force a response, and then mirror the pump. So yeah. you're seeing the, some fancy stuff here, and this is certainly dangerous for Morton, but you're not going to get that same value out of that combination as you would with a champion in the mix. So an overwhelm here at the bridge, but Morton recognizing, I just need to have a tank down up high and I can keep all these units at bay. Now the late NATO comes in, pulls everything back. Ewiz on top. Ewiz plus NATO plus Magic Archer is going to make this another wow. brilliant cleanup by Morton. Mohammed Light in trouble here with 90 seconds remaining. Night Witch high to control. Magic Archer down. And this that's the name of this game is keep Magic Archer on the board. There is nothing yep. that has been more important and the Royal Ghost not going to do that because he's invisible, folks. But that flying machine doesn't cross the bridge because the Ghost goes visible a little bit too early. So Ooh, it will big... know. Nice skeletons. Wow. That's a big push coming in. No elixir for the lava, though. So we see Mohammed Light hold and pump the brakes. Doesn't decide to pump. He just decides to get another set of skeleton dragons in, knowing that drills back around. Triple elixir coming down the lane. How is this going to go? Oh, and you see the hoping to get the connection there out of the Golden Knight. The NATO does not quite pull enough. Second Magic Archer down on defense. Lava Hound in the mix. Golden Knight trying to get some protection in in front of what is going to be a really nasty flying oh. machine. And the e wow. just barely comes down. Morton, we talk about playing out of tight spaces. This is the tightest of spaces. 30 seconds left. Triple Elixir. Best in the world putting the pressure on you. Can you hold? The best set of double arrows I've seen blocked by maybe the best Electro Wizard I've seen in a very, very long time. Morton saves his whole entire set with that Electro Wizard, but now this Overwhelm coming again. The triple elixir is brutal. He does have NATO. Is it going to be enough? 653. Morton needs oh, no. damage. He needs to prevent. Splash on the tower. Arrow, double arrows are available. Will the double arrows get no in? No arrows. Drill no gets arrows. there. No arrows. They did no! not. Oh, my word. By Les and Morton with the BM44 HP takes down Mohammed Light in the first round. That's the match of the month. Oh my word. What a fascinating deck that Mohammed Light brings to game three. Everything on the line. Best of three, single elimination. Double arrows, double pump, double skeleton dragons, doesn't matter. Morton looking into the future, knowing exactly what could end his game, and 44 HP is all he needs to move on to our quarterfinals. Wow, and Mo, Mo put everything he could on that board. You know, if he was able to go arrows mirror, that's GG. Yep. That's well played. Yep. Just wasn't able to do it there at the end. Just un unbelievable. And how many times we've we've cast hundreds of Morton games? How many times have you seen Morton throw a BM out? I yeah, I mean it's 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 just one of those things where I think they both know he got away with one. I know that they're good friends. You gotta give your buddy a little bit of heat with the BM coming out. That goblin sticking his tongue out is exactly probably how Morton felt. He, <laughs> I think he knows that game should have probably been lost. That Those arrows came in literally a millisecond late and that would have been it. Mohammed Light almost doing it in a very fancy, very odd fashion with the pump, the mirror, but wow, what a brilliant, brilliant set. That is one, of the, that is one for the ages. That was incredible.
Yeah, if you're on Twitch and you didn't clip that, how dare you? People on Twitch, clip that one so we can go back and look at it over and over and over again. What a finish out of Morton here in the first round. And we were hyping up that match, and there are times you hype up a match and it ends up being a dud. From game one to game three, from, from the first second to the very last, that match was everything that we had hoped. And that's why I love casting Clash Royale. Oh. Me too, man. You, I mean, even watching that replay again is just absolutely breathtaking. The arrows are in the air. They, they're not like a rocket. They're not like a poison. It's not a four second or eight second. It's like a one second drop. So the fact that the arrows are in the air, but not connecting and that timer ticks down to zero, Morton skates by the skin of his teeth and he eliminates the best in the world. 44 HP and Morton now gonna go from one Egyptian to the other, taking out Mohammed Light. <laughs> and now can Capgun get revenge for his teammate and countryman in the quarterfinal. On beyond that, Rosanova playing up against the Frenchman in Hugo should be a fun matchup there. Hugo has been on the cusp of that breakout next level performance. Viper and Faust the number one player in France, and probably the best player in Germany, not named Morton right now. Two guys who had potential, now can they build on that promise? And then the max, the last match of our quarterfinals, probably the first one in order, not entirely sure what order we'll see these in. Interage after his win over OP Sam, going up against Michifu, playing under, I don't know if that's Michifu's real name is Mario? Not entirely Maybe. sure, but either way, um, Interage with a tough out in front of him as uh, he'll be facing Michi in our quarterfinal. Half of our players have already been eliminated as the other half reset from 16 down to eight, and it'll be eight down to four. We are about to go to our second round of this Snapdragon Pro Series EU MENA in just a minute. We'll be back. The Snapdragon Pro Series is brought to you by Snapdragon Elite Gaming, Monster Energy, and DHL. Look at my shine with the blow. This is my time with it though. This is my time to be way at the top. Me and my guys gon' pay out the block. I don't look like boss. Time's right, and I know this he is walking in the line light. Promise you don't wanna watch like a sci-fi. My guys are high rises, high time. My crown, if you come to my side, I pledge allegiance for lifetime. My squad connected like Wi-Fi. We grind and you see the highlights. This my life. It ain't a game now. Me and you, we ain't the same now. Lions coming out to play now. Opposition yeah. out the way now. Out of the way. You wasn't invited, say you come to play, I dare you to try it, you don't wanna try me, don't step up to my team, yeah, out of the way, yeah, yeah, out of the way, yeah, yeah. Scenario, win, 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 yeah, we on a roll. Yeah, two, four, 
Welcome back to the Snapdragon Pro Series, Europe, Middle East, North Africa, first split championship, open championship, and we had to take a break, catch our breaths there, Andrew, because <laughs> we just saw yet another insane finish from Morton. <sighs> this guy just gives heart attacks left and right. Yeah, I mean, when you're that good going up against someone that good, you you hope it's going to be a set like what we just saw. And, you know, we talk about us having to catch our breaths. Let's also talk to another man who probably has to catch his. Morton, congratulations. You know that we're big time fans. You know that we're always rooting for you. But when you're going up against Muhammad Light, it's always got to be tough. How did you feel having Momo as your first round matchup out of 15 other people? I mean, like I'm feeling like I'm facing every round, like in the last couple of competitions and the last times I lost also at Worlds, <laughs> which kind of hurt. So I kind of wanted to get my revenge on him. And so I was really motivated. Tell me about that that last matchup, because obviously uh, game one and game two were, were both a little bit down the line. You go into game three, you play drill and Mo comes out with lava pump mirror. First of all, was there any chance in the world you expected that? And when you saw the pump, what were you thinking? I mean, like, we expected kind of lava on deck. Um, even Miner was out. We thought, like, okay, Poison and Fireball from my side is out. So we expected some bait, Skelly Ds, or um, Flying Machines. So I kind of thought he could play lava. But we also thought he might play Hawk White or something else, a more Snipe Bait, because, I mean, he had Log and Barbarian Bill out. So we thought maybe I'm going to play Bait. So first I was, like, thinking, okay, we're going for an Earthquake deck. And after seeing the pump, I was like, okay, maybe we should have run an Earthquake deck. Um, but pump was actually a smart decision by him. And after seeing the pump, I was like, okay, that's over. I cannot defend this in double X them, especially because it's a lava on push down. You also had the pump on the map, but I somehow defended that, and yeah, at the end it was a bit close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you've done it to us before. 44 HP, 1 HP. You keep saying we, Morton. You keep saying we. What is this I hear about you working with Julesy? And is that maybe the key to taking down Mo? is taking the analyst that got him so far in 2021? <laughs> 
I mean, to be fair, like we're kind of discussing like a world decks all the time and we went pretty unlucky so far. Like we had a ton of 50-50 decisions. Sometimes he was saying we're going with that um, deck and I was, no, we're going with this deck. And at the end, we were always like wrong and did the wrong decision. But this time we were like thinking, okay, this time we're going for our first choice and just do that. It doesn't matter what happened. And yeah, I also felt like really comfortable today. So I was like, even if I get like a, not the best matchup, I can still win this because I'm still... <laughs> Well, Morton, we, we certainly appreciate taking the time to come talk to us for a minute. We know you have a lot more Clash Royale to play today, yeah. so go ahead, get ready. Uh, good luck. Please stop giving us heart attacks because there's only okay. so many more of these that we can take. Okay, We're getting too Thanks old, man. We're getting too old for you to keep doing this, Morton. Nothing but love for you, man. Good luck on the rest of your day. Good luck against Cap Gun. And I believe we're going to be hopping into that very, very soon here. Yeah, I, uh, I'll get word on what our exact matchup order is here in just a couple of moments. But, man, I mean, it, it, that doesn't matter whether he's on the winning side or losing side of it. Morton matches Thrill. But, again, like, as, as some, there's some of these players, we know a lot of these players pretty well, but some of these players, you know, we spent a couple of years on set with and to know them more personally. And, uh, yeah, the, the way that the, the, some of the stuff we go through, uh, having known these guys and seen matches like that, I mean, man, I'm sweating. I'm, uh, I, I, I was, I had like, I had all the energy, like the, the adrenaline dump after that yeah. one. Uh, man, so much fun. So I believe we're actually going to go into Morton versus Cap Gun. So, uh, ain't no rest for the wicked there for Morton. He takes down Mo 2-1. He comes and he does an interview. I think he put up two YouTube videos, uh, walked his dog, and now here he is going <laughs> in another set against Cap Gun back to back to back. And, you know, this is where you really hope and once again, we try not to be too biased up here in the announcer booth, but you, you really hope that Morton's able to continue to ride that momentum after taking down Mohammed Light because Capgun could be doing a huge favor for everyone else in this tournament by eliminating whoever he goes against, right? It was whether it was Mo or Morton. And if Capgun can make it so that neither of them make it on through to the semifinals, he might even get a paycheck from whoever wins this thing. Yeah, I mean, that's that's certainly, uh, you know, I would be I would be giving Cap Gun some incentive if I'm anyone else at this moment, especially the way that Morton and uh, Julesy put that last one together. Cap Gun, I believe, and someone can correct me in the chat if I'm wrong, is uh, is originally a bridge spam player, and Morton throughout his career has done pretty well against most of the bridge, the people who are bridge spam, uh, who are bridge spam focused in their career. So this is an interesting one, um, of course, also, uh, I bet Capcom might want some revenge for uh, his countrymen. Only two Egyptians who are really known at the top, top tier of Clash Royale. Mohammed Light, of course, being one of them. Capcom, though, has been a, a ladder standout for quite a long time and uh, a part of that very talented uh, Team Egypt from uh, the last World Championships that we had. Let's take a look at some words here from Cap Gun. It's going to be the first time that we're having the pleasure of watching him today as he was able to work through Doom 2-1 to one in our round of 16. Don't pressure yourself and always believe in yourself with confidence in your heart. Uh, wow, okay. He could be a motivational speaker with words like that. You love it. You absolutely love it. But you wonder how confident you can really be when you're going up against Morton Royale, SK Morton, whatever you want to call him. He is so dang good. And I got to admit, Rich, it's it's it almost felt like that moment for Morton was, was had come and gone but the idea that he's now working with an analyst that really is one of the best to do it maybe just maybe this could be his big year which is crazy to say for someone that's already been a WCG champion a CRL Westfall champion and a uh, world finals runner up well you you need some of those balls to bounce the right way right and you know we talk about this one that that set of arrows a half step too late. We'd be seeing yes. the difference too. We'd be talking about how Morton loses close matches if that arrows got there three milliseconds faster than it than they did, right? So you know if we if if we go back to uh, to twenty to twenty nineteen, the, the, the tiniest of differences could have been Morton yes. winning not just against Surgical Goblin but also. That would have been a clean, a clean reverse sweeping King of the Hill, and then most likely storming through that finals for a CRL World Championship 2021, right? So it's as they say, it's better to be lucky and good. So far for Morton, he has been good. A little bit of luck could go a long way for him. I, yeah, I mean, it is so crazy when you think back to being in that Shrine Auditorium in LA, that room exploding, because it was the consensus feeling for everyone there. Whoever won out of the West would win Worlds. It was yeah. going to be SK or it was going to be Team Liquid. 
and one HP has got to be one of those things. I mean, we've talked about it. Everyone in the entire game has talked about it at nauseum. But when you think about how big that moment is, that legacy moment, that buzzer beating shot that came in from Surgical Goblin, it's just insane how it's really truly cemented him as the GOAT of old. Because if Morton wins that and they win World Finals, I think you probably say it's Morton. I think that's not even a conversation. Yeah. I think I think what Surgical did for the beginning of Clash Royale is unrivaled. But if Morton would have won in 2019, we'd be calling him the GOAT. And that would have been a GOAT versus GOAT matchup that we just saw. How things can change with just one HP and now 44 HP here in 22, uh, 2022. So now at least he's widening the gap every year, giving us yeah. a little bit more breathing room I, I guess yeah certainly that was a legacy moment but there that's the difference is that Morton's still in that legacy hunt and uh we'll see if he can get it done here against Capgun Capgun again there there he's a no joke player he's been very very good um but the question is can he bridge that gap into greatness and that's always the hardest thing right there are a lot of players who are very very good but elite is a very rarefied air and you can probably count on maybe two hands you might need a third the players who have truly gone into that elite level once again this is all brought to you by snapdragon this is the snapdragon pro series where winning matters think snapdragon and and once again winning definitely matters today best of three dual mode single elimination half of our players have already been eliminated another half are going to be eliminated at the end of these four sets these four best of threes but now the exciting thing about getting into the quarterfinals is you will not be missing any action right we didn't get to see cap gun doom we didn't get to see legolas and rosen noble we didn't get to see krasilkov and hugo and we did not get to see faust and avado key so now everyone that's through the eight players will be catching every single match for the rest of the day starting right here with cap gun versus morton egypt versus germany again here in the quarterfinals and now i feel like if we were to do a prediction those numbers might be just a bit different than what we saw in the previous one between morton and mo i mean i know we're not doing one but still i i feel like it'd be more like a 70 30 instead of 51 49 uh, it depends on how many Egyptian fans are watching. So uh, who knows? I am seeing in the Twitch chat here, you know, we're talking about these greatest conversations. Um, Logan Brawl saying top five all time for his picks in no order. Mugi, Morton, Sergio Goblin, Igor, and Sergio Ramos. Uh, I'd probably switch Mo in there for Sergio Ramos. I mean, I wouldn't probably, I would definitely switch Mo in there for Sergio, despite his uh, really wonderful win at CCGS. But the rest of that list, right? So let's, let's, let's you and I agree to switch out Mo for Sergio here for a second. I can, no offense, I can agree Sergio with that. Ramos. Um, yeah. Mugi, Morton, Sergio Goblin, Igor, and Mohamed Light. Is that a fair top five all time? Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, because you have to think about moments. You have to think about legacy. Morton, Surgical, and Mo feel like shoe-ins. And then yeah. you talk about Igor's coming out party in 2019. Uh, you've said it before. I, I think it's the best way to put it. No one has had a better debut in Clash Royale. No one's had a better debut at World Finals than Igor. And then the fifth player in uh, Mugi, how do you argue? He, he just yeah. won $200,000. He just was crowned the best player in the world. And uh, everyone that we just mentioned, other than Surgical Goblin, was at World Finals. Igor was there, Morton was there, and Muhammad Light were there, and Mugi came out on top. So when you talk about that, it's really hard not to put him up there. There's other people that are right behind, right? You talk about LucasX Gamers right there. Some people think Samuel Basoto is right there. I don't really disagree with either of those choices. They just need to get that one extra leg up and that can only happen at World Finals because Lucas did do back-to-back -back monthly finals wins, which is incredibly impressive. True. But really, it comes down to where you finish at the end of the season. You know, I, this is a this is a t always a tough conversation you get into how limited is that list. And if there's yeah. one person who I might switch in for Igor, uh, because I think that if you talk about that, right, Mo, Surgical Goblin, Morton, and Moogie, you can't really take any of those guys off that list. Um, yep. And Igor, it depends on how, how much you weight ladder specifically versus weight competitive, right? And those are two, two parallel conversations, but, but not always the exact same conversation. People, for some reason, forget how good Ruben was for, for a, a solid two years, right? Yep. Dominated outside of CRL when he was under 16 came into CRL, nearly carried Queso to the World Championship uh, in 2019, but didn't quite have the pieces there. And then won Worlds in 2020 in dominating yep. fashion where he didn't have a phenomenal team, a, a team that was playing at their best around him. 
I mean, maybe the argument can be made that Ruben isn't the same Ruben in 21 and 22 because he hurt his back carrying Queso to a world championship. So <laughs> I would say that uh, that Ruben is probably someone who deserves to be in that top five all-time conversation. I was like, Ruben hurt his back? Oh my God, I didn't, I didn't know about this. But yeah, I mean, what that was what was so fascinating about that Team Queso season, man, was that there were the old greats that kind of were like, they just fought with heart. Like Benny and Cucci, they would just come out and play in some of these interesting moments that mattered so much. It was like you got everything out of them during their swan song. Almost the same thing with IMJP because, you know, Cucci and Benny basically non existent in the competitive scene. IMJP pretty much in the same boat. Ruben is popping up here and there. He did, you know, try to qualify for this tournament, but I believe he did not make it. So you talk about what they did in 2020 and how they pieced it together. It's kind of a beautiful story of Clash Royale watching Benny and Coochie carry the weight that they needed to in those 2v2s, in those random King of the Hills. I am JP being able to bring it through every now and again when it was really important, and then having the greatness of Ruben at the top of his game. I, I, I definitely agree that it's, it's kind of surprising how little we talk about Ruben now, but that's the way it goes in CRL. Yeah. That's, again, it like, goes back to what you were talking about with Morton, man. That consistency at the highest level is so difficult because it's not just about performing in tournaments. It's about the 10,000 hours you have to put in every single season. Yeah, and, and that's one of those crazy ones where, um, you know, once you, we've seen people win a world championship and then kind of be like, okay, I did it. Now it's time to take the, the, the pedal off the metal. The only person that would really make a counter argument to that on another person who uh, someone, I think Jane made the argument in Twitch should be on that list. And that's Elsiop, who was phenomenal in 2017, then won a world championship in 2018. And then in 2019, uh, I can't remember if it was 2019 or 2020, went on to win the no tilt worlds with China. So that's a guy who continued at a high level for a very, very long time and should definitely be, you know, you're talking about first ballot Hall of Famers. Elsiop's one of those names as well. So here we go, game number one, Cap Gun top of your screen, Morton at the bottom, and Cap Gun issued a warning for taking too long, which honestly, it still shocks me after five years of doing this, and after even acknowledging it at the top of the broadcast, people saying that there's too much talking and to get into game. For, for the next five years, we're gonna be saying the same thing. If Rich and I could control when games started, uh, we would talk a lot less, trust me. We don't like hearing ourselves that much, but here we go, Cap Gun getting some early damage in with that mortar connection. Morton, bottom of your screen, rocking that cannon cart just out of range. Speak for yourself. I mean, I love the sound of my own voice, but uh, <laughs> definitely, definitely we want to get gameplay in here as much as possible. Morton sets up Golem opposite lane, so just eats that mortar, and that's a very aggressive Archer Queen. Golden Knight does get down, and this is going to be a very interesting first game here as now Cap Gun going to probably take that right-hand tower. Morton going to sack and try to stack up behind this eight elixir advantage into the left-hand lane. I honestly, I love what Cap Gun did there. The aggressive Archer Queen baits out something in front of that golem. It ends up being the Golden Knight, which is not at all what Morton wants to spend. Then he recognizes, if I'm going to do anything with this golem push, I have to completely sacrifice my right-hand tower. And so all the correct decisions made on both sides the only problem here is I think Cap Gun is going to really, really struggle in this two tower game. And behind on Elixir as well. So down by about two and a half and in a two tower game. I, I don't know. I mean, Mortar is not going to get much in the way of tower damage. So Mortar now is pretty much purely defensive. Maybe, uh, you know, if he can find a way to, uh, to capitalize on minor bats, which I don't think is going to catch Morton again. Pocket eight, Pocket Queen, maybe? I don't know. And here, color me wrong for a second. Oh, the lightning! The wow. lightning takes out the queen and the mortar. So uh, I was about to say that maybe I got that, that read wrong, but mortar still does not get damage in this crosswise game. 23, 34 to 29.04. Morton happy to just play into the exact same lane as Captain. He's got the spell power. He's got him beat in those terms with that lightning, although poison plus log changes that conversation up a little bit. But any opportunity Morton has to turn these defenses into strong counter pushes, he's going to take. And an aggressive mortar up high. I don't hate it. I don't love it. it, it it's obvious that it's not going to get any connection. And with the cannon cart there, not really going to bait out too much either. And Morton goes. Golem in the pocket. I think Cap Gun's hope there was that he would force the Lightning to get involved early and not be there for the Archer Queen, but Morton with a good job there, good read on the uh, on that cannon cart. This time, no cannon cart, so Mortar will get a connection. 
So here we go. Mortar on the tower there. Surprising that Morton's going to allow that to happen. Gets the Golden Knight to stop that bleeding. Another mortar shot going to come in. 1449 to 2384. And Cap Gun's pressure is making this a brutal, brutal uh, overtime here for Morton. And there you go, Rich. You called it. AQ in the pocket. Nothing there to catch. Barb Barrel plus Baby Dragon just wow. in time. Just able to hold on. But now that, mu that Mega Minion's pretty much, I think that Cap Gun can just ignore it. He takes the Elixir Advantage, cycles a log. He's going to let the towers take care of that Mega Minion and now just continue to set up the pressure in this left-hand lane. I don't really know how Morton creates damage on that right-hand tower. My suspicion here is this is going to be about the Golden Knight more than the Golem, but he's forced to play that Golden Knight into that same lane defensively. Yeah, this is nothing but trouble for Morton right now. Great pressure been keeping up from Cap Gun. We are in Triple Elixir now. There is still the opportunity for Morton to take this, but he's going to have to play really exquisite defense. And I actually really like this cannon cart being set up opposite lane. I actually think this is a good bit of pressure that can maybe turn into something, but Cap Gun going to stay on that gas pedal. Another miner goes in. Oh. Morton misses the NATO, and that is going to do it for game number one. What a beautiful performance there by Cap Gun, recognizing every correct move to make in the precise correct moment. You know, and you you talk about a lot of people who've been saying, we mentioned it earlier in the show, pros talk, or you mentioned it when we were talking to me, but before the show, a lot of pros asking for a uh, mortar health nerf, potentially, and uh, I saw someone in the chat on Twitch just talk about nerf mortar health as well. Um, I know that you would hate that, obviously. Um, I would. <laughs> but uh, we did just see the power of, of mortars. We just saw mortars staying power come into play here in that last match. Yeah, and, and again, like really, really great pressure there from Cap Gun in all the right moments. You know, you think about a two tower game, uh, you think about the ability for Morton to play into the same lane, but the issue was is just that Cap Gun had such great single target DPS, that mortar was such a nuisance, and those miners always flying on the board because Morton really more distracted about the mortars than the Archer Queens. Archer Queen staying on, you get down to a three card cycle, those miners are flying in like crazy. And that was a really, really great game out of Cap Gun. Morton now with his back up against the wall, right? Yeah. You beat Mohammed Light in your first set, that's all well and good, but there's still four more sets you gotta play through if you're including your finals there. So great, great stuff here out of the Egyptian. I'm really curious about what Morton's hand was, starting hand was in this situation when Cap Gun opened with that mortar on the right hand lane and Morton goes ahead and uh, sets up with the golem in the opposite direction, chooses to eat a lot of mortar damage. And then of course that gets taken care of, but then we saw that golden knight having to come out on the left hand side for the AQ and the minor bats play. So, I mean, obviously sacking tower is certainly a part of it, but it felt like Morton didn't ever get quite get the elixir advantage he wanted to push that left-hand lane. And yeah, I mean, maybe he's, maybe the sack tower on the right-hand side was too inexpensive um, for Morton to really get the advantage out of it. Yeah, and you and you look at the cards that Cap Gun has and you think about his cycle at 3.4, whole elixir cheaper and, you know, being able to get around two elixir cheaper than Morton. Um, that was really kind of flexed here. You know, you see right here early opening, a minute 30 in, this is that golem coming down. This is the moment where the bats come in. Morton clearly doesn't have NATO in hand, and if he does have NATO in hand, he goes, if I spend the NATO, I don't have an offense, and I still have taken a lot of damage. This golem is wasted, so it was a lot of tough decision-making for him. And then you talk about being able to change up your offense over and over and over, whether it was just miners on the tower, mortar pressure, miner plus bats, AQ in the pocket, diversify your attack so that your opponent cannot game you, and then turn that this big beatdown deck, a great defense, into an unstoppable counter push. Yeah, and I, you know, looking at this one, it's just, I, I know if we've seen Morton play a little bit more Golem in the last, in 2022 than we have yep. in the past. I've seen a lot of players play more Golem, to be honest. Um, a lot of big players maybe trying to be unpredictable, as you were talking about. Um, but it's, it's just one of those ones where I never love the idea of taking the outplayability out of the hand of a great player. I never love that. I understand the reason why you do it sometimes, but it always feels like you're saying, hey, I know you could outplay this person with a bad matchup. Let's go ahead and take a, a deck that doesn't really have that capability and see what happens. Yeah, and, I, and I'm so glad that you brought it up. We've talked about it for so many years now. Outplayability is a massive factor in deck choice, especially when you're talking about someone like Morton. He, if you watch his streams, you watch his videos, he talks about that as well. He'll take a meta deck sometimes and change one thing, and he goes, for 90% of people that play this game, this change will make this deck worse. 
but for that top 10%, the outplay ability factor is magnified. And that is something that as, as someone that you are, you know, looking at with Morton, maybe he thought, I'm better than Cap Gun. I can beat him. I don't need the outplay ability. Let's go for a good deck that's strong in the meta that doesn't use cards that I want to use in maybe games two and in games three. Little did he know, uh, he's going to run into maybe one of the best current decks in the meta when you talk about the ability with the Miner, with the Archer Queen, and the Mortar. That synergy of just those three cards, you can change out the other five a lot of the time, and it makes it really, really tough to outplay that because someone can out... Like, you talk about outplayability of those two decks, it's definitely in favor of the one that Cap Gun brought to game number one. For sure, and we saw some really solid play there from Cap Gun. Really opportunistic, and again, uh, I, I, I think the, the matchup probably went in Cap Gun's direction, but starting hand is such an interesting, important question when you're talking about any goal, uh, golem matchups in particular. And that's one of those things where we can't see the, what their hand is when they do start the game. You know, we have right. our particular view rather than the hand view. Um, and so you're always wondering, hey, like, what went into that opening choice and how much of that effect and ca how much of that impact cascade along to the remainder of the game? And the only way we can know that is if uh, Cap Gunner Morton fill us in later. Yeah, and, and I also don't really love going for the for the golem kill in, in single elixir, right? You know, we always joke about golem first play behind king tower on ladder. That's a little different, but when you're in competitive, you know, and we kind of just saw it happen, um, there is still that potential to get outplayed. If you do that golem beat down and double elixir and you still have that original tower, then you can use that extra elixir to maybe help defend, right? Then that NATO or baby dragon come out in the opposite lane and you still feel like you can turn that golem push into offense. And so uh, I, I don't know what the more shocking thing was today, uh, the 44 HP game, Rich, or the fact that the YouTube chat apologized. I, I know, I know we oh. should probably stop down. It's, it's unbelievable, but the fact that they actually apologized because yeah we don't control the games they're coming cap gun already got a warning and apparently right now he is getting very close to getting in trouble once again so having to pull yeah. that trigger on his deck is a really big part of dual mode it has been for over a year and competitive now and i don't see it changing anytime soon yeah uh he, you know, we are waiting to see if he does go a little bit too long here that's the the biggest concern is making sure you do get yourself in on time i know that they do have a timer on for Capcom's deck selection right now. So we'll see if he does get in under that wire. That would be a devastating blow to uh, to give up does get in here. The uh, we, we had Mo going with uh, a, a kind of a strange heavy out there deck that Morton said was actually a great pick on his part in game number yeah. three. And then Morton kind of going again, the, the golem here in game number one. Um, I, I, I'm really curious as to see what they have cooked up for game number two now. Obviously, Mortar is out, um, Archer Queen is out, so Lightning less uh, less a love fest. So now you get into that question, right? Do you play something that would, uh, do you play something that does well once Mortar is out? You still have Inferno Tower in there, so do you play something that's kind of a little bit heavier and throw a Lightning in there? The, the mind games here, this is where, again, we talk about analysts making their money, and this is where you and I, even when we ask AC, right? We have AC, we have Eric on the shows here, and we ask them about like, hey, what do you think deck pick wise? And they're like, man, let me think. Well, there's this, 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 and right. this, and this. I'm just glad I'm not in there, is half the time, yeah. their response half the time. And, and again, you talk about that analyst, Morton, having Julesy. Julesy working for the entirety of game number one to figure out what he needs to play in game number two, what's available, how Capgun plays. And we're getting word right now from our producers that Capgun has a minute before the game forfeit. Oh, Looks like he got it in just under the wire and Morton going bait in game number two. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about one of the all-time greatest bait players in the game in Morton. I'm very, very interested. And of course, this being the choice of where he goes in game number two and whether there's a read on that one from Cap Gun, of course, having Bar Barrel and NATO. Lots of options here. Mighty Miner switches lanes. Cannon Cart will prevent too much damage there, but that's still, look how fast that Mighty Miner puts up about 500 damage. Rich, this is the deck I'm pretty sure is the exact deck. Yes, with Skeletons coming in, you're going to see, I believe, Cannon and I believe Rocket as the last two cards. This is the deck I was talking about where Juicy J... What's fascinating about this deck is when that Mighty Miner is on the board, you toss out a barrel, you toss out a spirit, 
a skelly, you place a princess or a log, you got another barrel down. You can get two barrels out in succession so fast it feels like it is a mirror deck that you're playing against, but that's not the case. It's just an insanely fast cycle deck, and this is becoming very popular right now in the current meta. And you saw the King Tower activation there. That's one of the keys for this matchup in Capcom, getting that King Tower activation early, gonna make some of those, if he doesn't have the barb barrel, some of those less uh, less ideal defenses against the goblin barrel. A little bit easier to handle now, although it does still give the advantage Morton up 22.58 to 28.92 as we are 10 seconds away from double elixir. Now this deck also completely flips that conversation that we just had about outplayability. Now obviously the golem going to come down here, so this will be a fascinating play. You know, Morton going to set up a cannon most likely. He will be able to get down to a second cannon if he wants. Instead it's a mortar. Wow, okay. So the change up is right there with the mortar instead of the cannon. I'm ready. I'm ready to see what's going to happen. What a rocket to protect that mighty miner absolutely huge the mortar high and this the kind of deck you want to put in morton's hands that yeah. overall sequence there you saw the pile up you saw how dangerous it looked morton able to survive we're going 27 seconds left in regulation time maintains the lead here does the german and so far this is looking like another really fun performance yeah, and you talk about fun, Morton's gonna have a lot of fun setting up and stacking these princesses on the board. There's no way to get to those princesses other than a dash, a high bar barrel, a NATO into what, or a lightning, which is definitely not what you wanna do. So there you go, three princesses off on, pr three princesses on the board, one gets taken out by the mega minion, and then the lightning takes out the other two. Maybe not the best placement for that third princess by Morton. Yeah, that was the even trade there. That you get the you get the six for six plus the tower damage. So actually positive trade for Cap Gun overall with that lightning as the mortar high gets picked up by that golem on the right hand lane. Pressure coming in. Outside play right here by Morton, 1597, as the Mighty Miner trying to protect the mortar on the right hand side. Yeah, and Morton really going to need to turn up the heat here in terms of those Goblin Barrels coming out because the ability of that Golem to come down and then still have opposite lane pressure for Cap Gun is something that Morton is not going to want to deal with. I mean, again, this deck is all about outplayability. You cannot make interaction mistakes. You cannot make micro mistakes. Here we go. Triple Elixir 10 seconds away. Morton leading 1597 to 2139. Cap Gun has been putting the pressure on but the micro of Morton, the distraction, especially those skeletons and that fire spirit so far playing a huge role. That's another that should be in the range of a lightning if Cap Gun wants to go for it. Two princesses plus that right hand tower, but good pressure from Morton forcing the expenditure on defense rather than on offense. And there you go, there's the lightning value to clear off two princesses and most of a mortar. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little surprised at that mortar placement there. He could have even played it uh, to the right side, I guess. I mean, he was a little, he was put between a bit of a rock and a hard place. He can cycle back to that other mortar, but as you can see, another golem coming down. So barrel comes out, no defense in on that barrel, not going to be enough to get it within rocket range. Another mortar comes down, but a very healthy golem on the board. Morton getting overwhelmed, but is there time? Well, this is the three-card cycle we were talking about beforehand. He can get around to these mortars and logs over and over and over again. My big concern here is that cannon cart on the left-hand side. Baby Dragon in, gonna wanna NATO that back here, I believe, just to make sure, nope, rockets it instead. GG, well played. Morton with a brilliant bit of cycle work here in game number two. I'm so glad we got to see this deck, and I actually love the changeup of the cannon to the mortar. You talk about that mortar health and then the ability to create offensive pressure. That deck is so fun. I guess the only difference is it slows down the cycle by just a bit, but you get that Mighty Miner down, Fire Spirit, Skellies, Log, Princess, or a barrel, change the barrel in there somewhere, you get two barrels out. It's just so fun to play. And you saw how much difficulty Cap Gun was having keeping up with those goblin barrels, right? He needed yeah. to always overspend, make negative trades there. And just because of that, he wasn't able to build those golem pishes that really need to be perfectly orchestrated to win, especially in a matchup like this. You know, it's that Mighty Miner plus Mortar combination where you get that three card cycle, you're able to DPS down the, the Golems, and look at the ratio of Mighty Miners to Golems and of Mortars to Golems, right? Yeah. You, you see yep. all the cycle cards moving around very, very quickly, but really that's the big story defensively is, I mean, those that the Golems just 
getting lost in a neighborhood with no street signs, essentially, with all these mortars <laughs> everywhere, yeah. and then getting DPS down by those mighty miners. The control on Morton's side here was absolutely brilliant, and then the work of the cycle cards to get that extra bit of distraction for the support, that's what won him this game. Very, very nicely played here by Morton to send us to game three. Yeah, I mean, the proof is in the pudding right there. You throw out a barrel, you drop a princess, you fire spirit, you skellies, you throw out another barrel 13 times on those four cards, which is really the name of the game. But then you add in that extra wrinkle of knowing there is a rocket. So I have exp or I have a lot less HP than I might feel like. And then also the mortar, always creating that offensive pressure over and over and over. Just a brilliant play here. I, I Again, I love the swap out mortar for cannon, cannon for mortar. I cannot wait to play this deck because because I'll be honest, I tried the other version because it looked like so much fun when Mo played it. It's really hard. It is a very difficult deck to play because you misplay a princess, you miss a fire spirit or Skelly's kite or stop of a charge or anything like that, and it's game over. Game over indeed. Yeah, we'll look at some of, the, some of the work here done by Morton. This is early game work, or I guess mid game work with the pressure on the right hand side. The NATO early got the King Tower activation. The King Tower activation didn't end up being the biggest factor here though. And we talked about the princess stack. There were a couple lightnings that worked on those princesses. We saw one for princess, princess the tower on the right hand side. You're gonna see that right now. And we saw one for two princesses and the mortar. And now we go into game number three though. And I wanna, I wanna talk about some of these decks that we saw so far as we talk about the game three decks. On the side of Cap Gun, Valk is out, Bats are out, Poison is out, guards are out. Baby wow. Dragon, NATO, Bar Barrel, right? So think about all those that are out. Wow, you got, on the I side. feel like you almost got to play Graveyard against Yeah, that. yep. Yeah, but you saw you saw the path I was leading there for. I couldn't. Yeah. If yep. I if I had put blazing lights down the side of it, you wouldn't have <laughs> you would have been like, yeah, that's where you have to go. And on the side of it, pretty much every single piece for the giant skeleton graveyard combinations, other than the cannon card, depending on how he wants to play this one, um, is right. on the board from Morton's side. So if we don't see a graveyard deck, I I think a skeleton king deck is very very likely here out of Morton's side. Yeah, I mean, if you don't go graveyard because it is so obvious, right? I mean, it feels like, like you said, you were setting up that path. And for me, I could see it a mile away. That's probably yeah. what Capcom is thinking. You could also go to some sort of RG control deck, right? I feel like that's actually a potential to be played right now. It's not quite that strong in the meta. It's really more of like the RG, Fishboy, Hunter, you know, Mother Witch, Zappies combination. But remember, there was a time when there was an RG control deck out there that looked a lot like graveyard, but it was a royal giant instead of the graveyard as your win condition sure. with maybe one card changed in there and that changes how you want to defend right if you're thinking graveyard but they play royal giant it's a very different battle that's happening on two different parts of the board as opposed to being right at the river and right on the back side of your princess tower with all those skellies popping so we'll see if morton goes what could predictably be the best option or if he tries to keep his opponent guessing a little bit maybe he even goes to the skies who knows he does have so much at his disposal yeah, I mean, Fireball is the most likely big spell left for Cap Gun with both Poison and Lightning <coughs> out. Uh, let's go ahead, though, as we continue talk about this conversation, take a look at the bracket uh, and, and kind of see where, our, where we're lying here on this stand. And we'll talk more about those, those in a moment. Morton and Cap Gun, as you can see, one and one at the moment. Winner will move on to face the winner of Rosen Noble versus Hugo. Uh, Viper and Faust coming up later than that. And then Inaraj and Mario, a.k.a. Michifu, in the mix as well. And, of course, you just need to win... After you win this one, it's winning two more, and you win the money. But more importantly, let's not forget, Andrew, that this match is a match to qualify for the Golden Ticket Best Top 8 Finals, which will be in June. So while the money and today's championship is important, this game between Morton and Capgun is the one that decides whether or not you compete for a Golden Ticket in June. Yeah, and really that's what it is at the end of the day for people like Morton, you know, who already have a... He doesn't... I mean... Obviously, everyone wants $9,000. Why wouldn't you? But you know that for so many of these guys, like Hugo, like Morton, like Viper, you know, like Michifu, and even probably Faust. I mean, I'm sure all of them would love the money because they don't have as big of the content creator side. But it's about getting to that top four, which obviously, like you just said, every person that wins their respective sets here will get into that top four to get that golden ticket. You want world finals so that people aren't always, you know, kind of speculating how good you really are. It's no, no, no. They won world finals in 2022. No, no, no. They won in 2021. Whatever it may be, you got to respect that. Here we go. Game number three. Is Cap Gun running something with Fireball? Has Morton decided to try to avoid that? We'll see here in a couple moments. But again, reminder to that this and the next three matches are all matches that push you one step closer 
to that golden ticket competition. I could also see Morton going with Hog EQ. I know it's a deck yeah. that he loves, and, and I know that it's another outplay deck that he loves. I do think the stop and stare makes it feel like it's probably a little heavier, GY, RG, Lava maybe, but that's another deck that I know he's talked about really liking to go to because he feels like the Royal Hogs or the Hog Archer Queen Earthquake combo is still really, really strong and really underplayed now. Looks like it's gonna be RG. Yeah, we'll see. It's going to be from Cap Gun, looking like either Pigs or Graveyard. We'll see which direction he's leaning in this one. And the Electro could Spirit. Be. Interesting, maybe Royal Giant instead. Yeah, I was just going to say, could be RG as well, but he does not have that Lightning. Morton, though, maybe not going to rock that Inferno Tower, so it could be a good pull here by Cap Gun. Arrows in to try to get that Fish Boy off the board and just enough room to pop the ability and keep the Giant Skeleton controlled for a second. Morton just doing everything he can to keep that giant skeleton out of the conversation. It will come across and it's the Inferno Tower yeah. for Morton against this Royal Giant. And Bomber in as well to get the cleanup. And does that, oh, he has to wow. play the guards high. And they just barely save that tower from being victimized by that giant skelly bomb. Really, really nice sequence for Cap Gun. He doesn't get out of it what he really wants, but really close there. You saw Morton having to drop those last second guards, even with the bomber, on top of the Inferno Tower. And this is a really also nice pull by Morton going with that Inferno Tower, knowing that Lightning is out of play. Why not go for the strongest building that is no longer susceptible to the strongest spell against it? And we saw this from Michifu a bit, kind of the uh, aggressive arrows play and just trying to get some extra damage on some of those troops and some tower damage early is Morton. And he's just, this is just straight up, look at the spell cycle he's putting down between those two and it is the EQ out of Cap Gun. And it does take care of that Inferno Tower. Does the RG get a shot? It gets one and then gets turned into a pig. Piggy getting tanked for though by that skeleton which gets pulled across by the first oh. fish boy. Second fish boy comes down and skeleton's gonna populate the board getting very, very little damage for the German. Yeah, that's a that's a tough call there. Guards high to distract this giant skeleton. Going to get the Inferno Tower in low here, and EQ does get on that Inferno Tower, but a lot of sizzle already done on that Royal Giant. Gets one shot, though, so Cap Gun extending his lead as we are in sudden death overtime, 1998 to 2575, making it 2522 is that pick. Capcom is being relentless with these fish boys, and I'm okay with it. I like what he's doing. I feel like he's controlling the board really well, and it's making it really difficult for Morton to place units offensively. It feels like all he's doing in this game is defending at the moment. And you can see right now, once again, Bomber going to get taken off by that giant skeleton. No, Hunter does its job. Hunter going to take out this Mother Witch as well, but Inferno going to be just enough sizzle to take care of the RG. And just not finding a place to, I believe this is Graveyard out of Morton. It feels it be, like it. I can't think of what else this would possibly be. Um, and he just has not found a place to get it involved in the game. He's just trying to find a, play enough defense to turn into something that actually is a counter push with some tankage. But he has to overspend so much every time on these defenses. This might be the one here. Yeah. Though. He's in triple elixir, gets the guards down in front. Skelly King is alive. Mother Witch perfectly healthy. And there we go. Graveyard comes in, Giant Skeleton holds the line high, Arrows do some cleanup, Snowball trying to help make some room, wow. and that's going to be a nice chunk of damage back for Morton. A huge chunk of damage, in fact, 1407 is the number, still down though, 1141 with 35 seconds left. Arrows plus Snowball, great combination to get on top of that Hunter. The Arrows and the Snowball doesn't actually kill the Hunter, but it'll snow it enough for the Skeletons to help out. There you go, Skelly's in behind again on top of the Hunter. There's the Snowball again, and there's the Skelly taking out that Hunter. And if I'm Capgun, that last offense by Morton spelt disaster for me. It was so much damage that came in. You knew he got all the way back around, and also the ability to defend was really, really lacking. Remember, this is our third and final game. Loser goes home, winner gets to battle for a golden ticket. It, and it looks like it's gonna be the German. 597 to 553, and oh Morton does God. it by a hair again. 44. 44, 44 again. It's <laughs> Put up your fours, everybody. 44 again. Oh my word. What are you doing, Morton? We told you to stop. We told you to stop. 44 to close two oh. games in a row. Maybe the most hated number in Egypt right now. 44 
game three, 44 HP, cap gun, game three, Morton skates by again. The skin of his teeth, the last second steal, whatever you want to call it, brilliance in Germany from our SK representative. 88 HP separating him and two different sets. Wow. And he did an interview and he walked his dog. So I don't know, man. I'm blown away. Uh, yeah, put up three YouTube videos in two different languages. Might be also learning Chinese just for the heck of it. On top of all that, Morton getting it done. He will be coming back for the golden ticket portion of this later in the uh, in June. Uh, he has qualified for that top four today to make that eight-person bracket. And still, he could go on today and keep winning more and more money after taking a look at that, uh, hoping for that $9,000 first prize today. Yeah, Rosa Noble and Hugo CR is going to be our next set. So the winner of that one will face off against Morton. And you look right here, eight arrows came down, seven snowballs came down, which is not a lot of damage, but when you get them out 15 times, it sure adds up. And of course, the brilliant combination of the arrows, snowball, plus the graveyard to take out those hunters was really, really great stuff because the hunters felt like they were kind of a little untouchable on the other side of the board, especially when they were played that far back as defense, but the ability to slow it down so that those little Larrys could pile up. Just great stuff there from Morton. And, you know, you talk about a guy that really excels under pressure, and that will always be Morton. Twitch, did you clip that one? 44 HP again? Come on, guys, get in on the action. This is, you know, you were talking, Andrew, about decks um, and about and Morton talking about decks where you change a card where a deck is really good for a great player and that change would be disastrous in the hands of a, a okay or even good player yeah uh, who you know, we've seen this from michifu today and from morton today who would snike cycle snowball and arrows as aggressively as we just saw those two guys you put that deck in most people's hands they are not my dog just walked by and pulled the cord on my headset. How did you get in the room? <laughs> um, most people would not play, would, would not as aggressively play the snowball and arrows the way that we saw out of Michifu and Morton today. And I mean, look, if you're watching right now, you want to play one of those two decks. Apparently, a big part of that is spam the heck out of those two spells because you don't overcommit in single. Yep. You don't go for that big time graveyard of the RG or whatever it is in single elixir. You get damage where you can, and then you turn it up at the end of double as we get into triple. So we just talked about it. Morton is now waiting. He finally gets a break after his first two sets and his 88 remaining HP. Rosen Noble and Hugo CR, the first time we're gonna see both of these guys today. Winner of this set gonna go on and play against Morton. And this is an interesting one. You know, once again, you look at their numbers, pretty close on ladder, pretty close on ladder finishes. Very, very different stories in terms of their run here in the Snapdragon Pro Series. Yeah, I mean, the story of Hugo is one and done. Just go through, win a few of these real, real fast, and then turn back around and jump into the match. Uh, Rosen Noble had to go through and qualify for points. Remember, there were two ways to make your way into this competition. One was to win one of the qualifying tournaments. The other was to gain points through those qualifiers. And so you're seeing the total difference here in what they had to do to get those points. Hugo, just one and done, won a, won a qualifier. Rosen Noble had to grind his way out, much like Morton did uh, to get into this competition. But um, again, they're both here nonetheless, and one of them will move on and have a chance at more money. And of course, come back late June for that golden ticket chance. So let's hear a word from our competitors here. Rosen Noble, I believe, is coming up first, as it is the first time we've seen both of them today. Here we go. I'm really proud that I qualified for this great tournament and now can compete against the best players in our region and, and honestly, the best players in the world here, EU and MENA. I will try my best to become a champion. Congratulations to everyone who made it to the finals and good luck. Have fun. And then I'm not sure if we, I think we do have a word here from Hugo as well, but talking about Hugo's run in his first tournament, went through Kike Star, went through Jonah, went through Perry, and then went through Inaraj, all untouched, only dropped one game. And here's what Hugo has to say, Rich. I hope everyone will play at their best to show that EMEA is still present in the game. Uh, otherwise, I wish them good luck and see you in the arena. So um, that's interesting, interesting, like, hey, I hope you'll do your best, but if not, I'll see you in there and we'll see what happens. <laughs> From a guy who's been, you know, you talk about Hugo, uh, this has really been the this last like year, 18 months or so is when he's really sort of broken into the upper echelon of pro play, um, where we've mm -hmm. seen a couple of big big time performances from him. 
Before that, where Hugo really cut his teeth was in all the international competitions representing France, whether it was in World Royale League, No Tilt League, all those World Cup style competitions. He, as a part of that French team, has had a lot of success, both um, winning and being runner-up in a, a number of those World Cup-style competitions. So Hugo, while this has sort of been the, the coming out party last like 18 months or so for him as a full-on pro, that competitive experience and competitive fire has been there for quite a long time. Yeah, and I'm wondering now if in 2022, that competitive experience of the last 18 months specifically will maybe next level Hugo. He is so good at this game. He's so good at control. He's actually really versatile in his deck choice. But what I have noticed is while you may not see it on his face because he's not an incredibly emotionally res like reactive guy, uh, you might see the hurt when, he, when he's lost sets in big moments as, as you can understand from anyone. Sure. But I have seen him play so much better when there's less pressure. When there's mm. that big time pressure of the finals, the grand finals, the semifinals, it's, it's when Hugo kind of resorts back to playing safe instead of playing smart, right? And that's something that you really, really want to see out of someone this good and at this level is you've got to have that killer instinct in the finals, in the grand finals, and maybe Hugo can do it here at Snapdragon Pro Series. So here we go, your Game Stars Season 1 champion at the top, Hugo, up against Rosen. You'll see him there at the bottom. And Poison Miner Snowball out early. EQ plus Archer Queen. In a lot of places, that would have meant either Royal Hogs or Hog Rider. But as you see, the Electro, I was saying Electro Spirit was enough to say probably Royal Giant, yet in the Giant Skeleton, feels even more like that's going to be the case. Yeah, you know, and then, you know, Hugo looking like he's probably rocking some version of Mortar, honestly. Um, but we'll see. He is a guy that's played a lot of Mortar in the past, so somewhat predictable, but obviously a very different look at Mortar than we've seen before. And, and this does look like it. There we go. And this is the the most common. I mean, you can switch in the Snowball for other small spells. Log's the most popular one. This is that uh, Mortar Miner Giant Skeleton deck I was, I've been talking about that I keep thinking we're going to see. Here it is, the Snowball variation versus the Log variation, kind of depending on what you're going for with those two, whether you're going more defensive or more offensive. Um, between those two deck constructions, Hugo choosing the more offensive version, uh, in my opinion, with the Snowball variation. And when you talk about the success of these guys, Rosa Noble out of Ukraine. He was the ESL Mobile Open winner of Split One in the fall last year. So a little bit familiar with our tournament uh, that, we're, that we're having now it's titled the Snapdragon Pro Series. And if you look back at him in the fall split two, he was in ninth place. So he's a guy that's gotten pretty close before and obviously taking the ESL Mobile Open fall split, getting that first place spot is no small task, but Hugo definitely has the experience um, weighted in his favor. Miner in right behind the Hunter. Nicely placed Miner there to get that Hunter out of the conversation and turn the Giant Skeleton back around. I don't know if that's going to buy enough room for that Musky to survive. She does take the shot, so she will not be as big of a threat, although you'll probably see Rosen spend something here to stop that one from hitting, and he does. So 25-46, that left-hand side had pretty even these two, only about 50 or so HP separating them crosswise as we go to our final 24 seconds. Yeah, and we'll see how Hugo wants to kind of start to mount his offense. It's a nice poison here. I really like that. Maybe he just goes minor to the back, and he just tries to control this for a while, and that's at least what we're seeing at the moment. No, he goes minor to the AQ. Bats high. The Electro Spirit will be right there, and it does take care of those bats as the defense tries to stop and does prevent any significant damage from that Royal Giant on the right-hand side. Here we go. Sudden death overtime, final two minutes, and now starting to make some deep moves in the enemy territory is Hugo. Yeah, it's really fascinating here when you look at how Hugo's playing this. He's definitely playing the control game, but he also doesn't feel like he has that defense completely locked down as we're getting deeper into this faster flowing elixir, but this is exactly what you want to see if you're Hugo is that last minute overspend from Rosen giving you such great poison value. And now that AQ is completely negligible. He does drop the snowball just to be safe, which is probably the best decision, but you can see a lot of control in favor of the Frenchman. Muskie sets up the right hand side, giant uh, skeleton coming in against that skeleton king on the left. And you see the general idea here is charge up that giant, that skeleton king and make him at this point, and that's interesting thing, make him, a, are you using him as a distraction or trying to penetrate? I think too many people are using the skeleton king to hopefully try to get that big offensive play, where what you're seeing here is the power of this deck from a control side, using that Skeleton King defensively 
the key here in this matchup. Ooh, that is not where you want to place that mortar. Fishboy is right there, AQ is right there, Royal Giant gets a couple few shots in along with that Earthquake, and Hugo, who was completely in control, just like you were calling there, just drops a little bit of that control by uh, an ill-placed, ill-timed mortar and a really nice minor catch. And yeah, that, that Hunter just pretty much absorbs the minor. A couple shots do get in though, so 20 at 1294 is that mark, 30 seconds left. Lots of ground to make up here for Rosen, and this is gonna have to be a low mortar. EQ gonna get some value here. Snowball to slow down the Royal Giant. That's not gonna stop the shot though. 210, 1210 now. So just like that, Rosen in the lead, and he does have the EQ plus the log to put pressure on. Skarmy not gonna do much here. I think this is gonna go towards Rosen. Hugo in a whole lot of trouble. Mortar high, not gonna get a shot though. The EQ gonna do its job. Poison tries to get down. Is it gonna do enough? Snowball gets uh. in. No, it will not. Just over 100 HP and Rosen takes game number one off the Frenchman. And that's a painful one to kind of watch unravel for Hugo, right? <clears throat> you look at the way that he was playing and you look at what happened there at the end. I honestly think the difference of that game would have been if on the second to last Royal Giant that came in, if Hugo would have used the ability on his Skeleton King. That's all he needed to do. He needed to use the ability on the Skeleton King. It would have prevented the first shot from that Royal Giant, and it would have made that second aggressive Giant Skeleton drop right at the bridge a little bit less appealing for Rosen because it would have had to deal with all those Skeletons. It wouldn't have actually created the pressure that he wanted. So a missed Skeleton King ability feels like the big decider in that moment, along with that really high mortar that was played into a Fisherman, into a Royal Giant, into an Archer Queen. Yeah, that was uh, that was certainly a rough one. and. Man, you know, you, you look at the, the, the mortar plane, obviously I defer to you on mortar conversations most of the way around, but the, the decisions you have to make about that mortar are so hard because of that earthquake. The earthquake just puts it in yep. such a, a bad spot. And you know, you talk about with hog EQ, where it's really the earthquake is more the damage dealer than the hog a lot of the time. That, that's not the exact same conversation with the Royal Giant variation, but as we saw near the end of the game, once we got down to the final 30 and we were close in Elixir, Sar, I was close in damage, you're not gonna catch up if you're Hugo. Uh, that would have to be a huge collapse on Rosen's part for you to get enough damage to, to win that fight because EQ there, EQ Log's gonna outstrip you in those final moments. And then you look at the ability that Rosen kind of had with the cards at his disposal to control all the swarm, right? The Electro Spirit is great. The Log is great. The Hunter has splash damage. The Giant Skeleton, giant skeleton cleans up everything that's on the board. And then you even have the Earthquake as a panic if you need it in case those skeletons were piling up on your Princess Tower. So you talk about the responses that Rosen had. It made it really, really difficult for Hugo to figure out how to attack. And, you know, this is an interesting moment because <clears throat> this is what I was talking about. If you would have played the giant skeleton ability there, excuse me, the skeleton king giant wouldn't have gotten as many shots. And then that aggressive giant skeleton would have not been dropped to protect because it would have gone into a bunch of skeletons with a unit already on the board for Hugo DPSing it down. So that one miss feels like was Hugo's last saving grace. But I do still feel like that game was kind of falling off the rails for him. Yeah, it certainly does feel that way. And you know, now you gotta talk about how do you how do you regroup here from a game that really felt like you were in control for a long time, and then you played a deck that really played to your advantage. So very curious to see, and right off the gate, it looks like Hugo is going cycle here in game number two. Yeah, and you talk about, you know, the cards that he used in game number one. Not only are they strong in the meta, they're some of his strongest cards, period. When you talk about the mortar, the miner, the poison, and of course the skeleton being king being, you know, unanimously decided as the strongest champion in the game. And it looks like Hugo might be going the a classic variation of Hoggy Q. No yeah. uh yeah, the a the earlier pre champion version. We'll see if that's the case. And Hugo might be making the call here of, hey, I'm great with this deck. I can outplay with this deck. Uh, all I have to do is win with this one, and then that'll be very hard for my opponent to game around the remaining three champions in game number three. I'm really curious to see what this deck is from Rosen, and there we go. It is going to be a Royal Hogs E-Barbs deck with Golden Knight and Skeleton Dragons. So uh, kind of an odd concoction here, but still a lot of uh, opportunity to create dual lane pressure. Yeah, I mean, look, we don't see a ton of e-barbs in competitive but we see some um we haven't seen it as much as of late there have been a couple of moments where it had its had their resurgence but 
when they do pop up, it's rare that you've really prepared for them, that you've made your game plan based around facing them. So while they're not always the most difficult thing to contend with, they can often be uh, a bit of an annoying swerve, to use a word you love. And yeah. you can see right here how Rosen has taken the advantage in game number two. And now it's Hugo once again playing off the back foot. Yeah, those E-barbs are just a nuisance in terms of being able to control the Hog Rider and then create a massive counter push. So that's six Elixir that'll usually turn out to be a somewhat even trade because something else has to be dropped down on the back end to defend them. And of course, stopping those Hog hits. And oh. look at that dash from Rosen also. And honestly, Rich, that could be it. That just could be the whole thing. You never want to be in a two tower game with this Hog EQ deck. And that's exactly where Hugo is way too early on. Yeah, that's just, man, the, the those skeletons. You're up against a, a, a Golden Knight deck. He played skeletons in a way that just, I, I don't understand them. That just was a, yeah. you saw Hugo go, wait, I, you saw Rosen go, wait, you're going to do that? You're going to create a clear path for a, 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 a Golden Knight connection? Sure, just let me press that button. GG, well played. And now there's just no coming back here for you. Yeah, there, there really isn't. And this is a, a great place for Rosen to be in. And then you talk about adding insult to injury. Uh, the Mega Knight comes down as the seventh card played. One more card that makes pushes really difficult because, you know, you saw Hugo go for it. All right, I need to sell out push. Let's go. Valkyrie up front, Hog Rider behind, and, uh, and a uh, Firecracker in tow. But then you get that big MK coming in, um, and that's just really rough. And that's going to be a GG. That's going to be a well played. And that's a big win for Rosen who now kind of steals this one away from Hugo and will be making an appearance in our golden ticket competition in late June. Yeah, you know, and, and you know, we just did the, uh, the Snapdragon NA series, and I believe the entire day we cast two sets that went to game number three. And obviously seeing very, very different stuff here today, we do see a very quick 2-0 there. So when we do check back in with our bracket, we know who Morton's playing. We know what that set's going to be in our semifinals, but we still have a couple more matches to work through here. And I got to admit, I'm pretty surprised at how that set went. It, Hugo just did not have his feet underneath him at all in those two games. Well, you talked about it before the matchup, right? The, it's which Hugo shows up. Is it the one who's confident and ready to go? Or is yeah. it the one who's not playing with that level of confidence and focus? And you know, we saw the we saw the mistakes and saw kind of the, the, the fall apart there in game number one. And that continued on into what was admittedly uh, a, a challenging situation here. You probably didn't plan for E-Barbs. You have some responses to the pigs, but not like you don't have a shutdown response to the pigs with this Inferno Tower as opposed to a bomb tower or even a, uh, you know, as we saw, the building didn't even get involved or a Tesla or anything else that yeah. costs a little bit less and does a little bit more. Um, and, you know, this was a, an interesting and strange pigs variation with the Mega Knight, the E Barbs, the Skelly Dragons. This one was kind of all over the place. And I think that Hugo might have been a bit tilted and then was just caught completely off guard. And then, of course, you had those skeletons. Who boy. Yeah, just a tough matchup. I mean, <clears throat> the ability to get on top of that Firecracker with the poison if you need it, the Bar Barrel being a great response, the MK and the E-Barbs being unstoppable in terms of taking out that Hog Rider. And then the other thing is, if you look at the offense out of Rosen, which was supposed to just be the Royal Hogs, the best response for Hugo in that moment is a Valkyrie plus Fire Spirit, Skellies, or Log, right? That's going to be your best response, but the problem is you need that Valkyrie because it's your only beefy ground unit. And you have E-Barbs, yeah. Mega Knight, and Golden Knight to worry about. There's just no way you're going to win that ground battle. And you saw Rosen Noble just go, all right, cool. I'm going to just take this and run with it because Hugo had to kind of get uh, to steal where the AC loves, try to get cute with his defenses, and that led to the Skeletons, mm. and that led to the Golden Knight getting on tower. That's, I mean, that's a great way to put it in cute with his defenses. And, you know, you talk about that, you know, the, the, the cycle and the, the getting cute with it. You also talk about falling behind early, right? You're, you're, you're playing Hog EQ uh, against a deck that, uh, you're playing classic style Hog EQ with an Inferno Tower on top of all that, against a deck that packs a very powerful punch and has lots of ways to shut down the Hog. So unless that matchup is close going into triple, you're, you're, you're unlikely to get Hog because there's so many responses unless you're like getting great out cycle and single, which he didn't. He fell behind early. And then as you go into the late game, you're, you're like, can I be close enough to play defense and then EQ cycle? And by falling behind so much so early, it put him in a place where he had to make up ground, which is not what you want to be doing in that matchup. 
Yeah, you talk about that Inferno Tower not being played. I mean, the Golden Knight can just come up front and dash and do so much damage to it and probably turn it into a negative trade. So that's going to do it for Hugo today. He's not qualified as the top four, but he can come back in our split two as we keep moving on through the day. Viper and Faust up next. And this is another set between big time heavy hitters. We saw Viper earlier on. We haven't seen Faust yet today, but he made quick work of Vidoki 2 and 0 oh in that opening set. And you know, these are the two guys, Rich, that we picked as kind of our quote unquote underdogs to watch in this tournament. One of them will be going home after this set. And it just makes a lot of sense to see these two matched up here, right? I mean, on one side you have Viper who looked like he was a true championship contender last year, finished up top four, has always been brilliant on ladder, as you mentioned, one of the, probably the best Hog XC, no, the best Hog XC NATO <laughs> player ever. Um, and certainly talented beyond that as a competitive player as well. Um, and then you have Faust, and that's, again, we talked about this conversation earlier on. Faust is a guy who, and I don't know all the backstory. I know, like, I'm, I might have gotten snippets here and there, but Faust is a guy who we kept on getting rumored as, oh, Faust is going to be on this team this year. Faust right. is going to be on this team this year. And he was probably kept it to two or three different teams throughout the CRL team's portion uh, and never made that actually happen. Uh, much of the chagrin of the teams who were trying to recruit him and a lot of the German fans out there. But now we see him here, and he's been on a, on a pretty good clip as of late. Um, if you'd asked me a year ago, do I pick Viper or Faust, the there would have been no question Viper. Today, right. though, I think I give Faust the advantage. I think I do, too. And, you know, when you go through and you look at his player profile, the amount of top finishes he's had on teams or in single performances, he's got a lot in the top 10, and he's got a handful in the top three, and including a top ladder finish. Both these guys have finished first on ladder before. And then you add in that competitive layer to it. It does feel like Faust is going like this, and it feels like Viper is maybe going more like this, right? He's hopefully still on that uptick just a little bit, but Faust is doing it exponentially ever since, what, like you said, maybe a year plus ago. July 2021 is when he got his number one ladder finish most recently. And like when you do that and you stay locked in and you're focused on competitive, it's just uphill from there. And so I'm really, really excited to see Faust. We keep talking about it this year, whether it's on Three Crowns, which we haven't talked about yet today, but you guys can always catch our episodes of Three Crowns twice a month where we're breaking down the competitive scene, our favorite picks, Faust is a guy whose name has come up there a few times, and we've talked a lot about in 2022, this being the year of the changing of the guard. Not in terms yeah. of Mohammed Light not being the best anymore, but more so about if you're picking 10 players that show up in a tournament, these six guys are not there anymore, and they've been there for the last four years. Now it's these next six guys, right? And that's one of the conversations about the Arden Toases of the world, yeah. the Fausts of the world, right? That's it. That's it. I was gonna say you started saying that, and Arden Toas popped into my head immediately, just coming off of his win in the first split for North America. So uh, you know, you talk about Arden Toas, you talk about Faust, um, definitely some of those guys who are uh, who seem like they're on the upswing, as you mentioned. And you know, you talk about um, Viper, both with that first round uh, loss in World Finals last year, and then also keep in mind that the CRL format last year was qualifying was based on ladder. And he, yes. I mean, I think he put up like four or five top 10 finishes on ladder last year. Um, something crazy like that, because that's kind of how he rolls. Um, so you think about like how much he realized he could qualify and um, benefit from his hardcore ladder play. With qualifying this year, moving into the community tournament format and away from that from that ladder format, you got to wonder not only how much of that hurt his chances, but almost also how much of that hurt his morale where last right. year he like felt like his fate was definitely in his hands, whereas this year um, he probably doesn't feel as confident knowing he can't ladder his way into World Finals. Yeah, six top 10 ladder finishes in 2021, including a number one finish in February of last year. So yeah, that, what you're saying, Rich, could not be more true in terms of what Viper was doing. So I like that we're seeing him qualify in different ways now, right? That's very, very important with, you know, the format here, the era of everyone in 2022. It's not ladder. Anyone can join in any open qualifier. You never know what you're going to get. So Viper being here at least pretty early on in the year is a good sign if you're a Viper fan. And an even better sign if you're a Viper fan so is the hurting that he's putting on Koffer Faust here in game number one. He is putting the pedal to the metal right now. And so Faust decides, you know what? I'm not playing that game anymore. Let me go opposite lane. Going to give up two shots to this barb. 280 remaining. So a little bit of earthquake action. 
will take care of business on the right hand side. I believe two of those will take care of it. Um, and now Faust just goes, hey, let's see if I can change the lane. But this is the problem. That giant skeleton, we don't talk about the defensive value of that giant skeleton bomb the same way as we used to. But we did see it in the first push, although that whole push runs right by it this time around. Can it get past GS number two? Uh, that looks dangerous. I'm like speechless at the moment because finally, finally damage comes in. And the ability that Viper has to actually take out air units is almost non-existent. Now, piling it on, missing defense late. Flying Machine on the tower, 898. Flying Machine still on. Aggressive Lava Hound at the bridge. Royal Giant opposite lane. There is a tombstone. Will he get it up high? There's the early EQ on the tombstone. That is a great play by Viper. And oh my wow. goodness. Wow. That was such a crazy battle of haymakers. I, I don't know what the fight what the cycle of Faust was at that moment. I don't know how you I mean how you imagined that a lava hound was gonna get to tower faster than yes. uh, an EQ or a Royal Giant. Uh he you are you're, you're playing minor. You have minor in this deck. I I don't really understand the aggressive lava hound at the bridge there. Um yeah. it's totally possible that, that was it's totally possible that was the right play in that moment based on what he had in his hand. But man, you're spending seven elixir to guarantee that you can't defend um, the Royal Giant to also guarantee that you're not likely to win to lose any foot race that happens. Uh, man, I, this again, one of those ones where I wish I could see into the hand of Faust at that moment. Right, because you look at the cards that he has. I mean, Faust has a minor. He has arrows. He's got the Mega Minion and the Tombstone for defense. So I think in Faust's mind, he just goes, there's no way I can defend that Royal Giant if he plays a late Earthquake, which he did in a high bar barrel, right? If he yeah. goes late Earthquake, high bar barrel with an Electro Spirit right behind, there's pretty much no way to stop that offense. But yeah, man, when it's that close in, in, in damage, do you just go minor plus arrows? And I don't know, I don't know. That's, yeah, a, I mean, that's, that's why Faust probably did what he did. He didn't know either. Yeah, I mean, again, we can't see into his hands, so we can't know what the right call was there. But um, it's it feels like the Lava Hound was guaranteed to not win in that situation. So I don't know if there was a, another option there. Um, but in the end, uh, it is Viper taking game number one. The aggression early pays off, survives what was a very dangerous look later in the game. And that's a, a big part of what makes Clash Royale such a, uh, a heart beater is that back and forth slobber knocker like this one. And that's exactly it, Rich, when you talk about what happened early game, that intense aggression from Viper being able to get that much damage in from those first handful of Royal Giants, or I guess the first two Royal Giants, because that third one is what took the tower and took the game. That means it was only two RGs that came down, I believe, in single Elixir. And if Faust would have just played a little bit tighter defense to start the game, that would have been an easy, easy win. Because, you know, when Faust got to be able to put that big offense together, I was blown away by the fact that Viper was able to defend. He has no big spell. He has no ability to get on top of those units other than a greatly timed Electro Spirit and a very, very high Hunter with arrows thrown in there. So it felt like the overwhelm was inevitable. And that's exactly what Faust was able to do. It's just that he dropped the ball early on. And I'm looking at this uh, this replay here, and you saw the first push in from, from Viper and doubling down, and I guess we won't see the rest of that replay, that's fine. Uh, we saw him doubling down there with the Royal Giant. I, I really would love to go back and get a, get a look at those, that sequence that happened on the left-hand side for Faust, and see if I, if I could get an idea of what he had in his hand there. Maybe, uh, maybe API might even have, I might be able to go in uh, as we get ready for our next game. Uh, go and pull up the match and figure out what exactly uh, was the sequence of cards played there at the end, because that would tell us a lot about the decision-making that Faust was able to make in those last few moments. Right, because the other thing that he could do, I mean, I guess maybe the RG, yeah, exactly. It's like, I wish I could just watch it over and over and over to yeah, analyze right? it. If that RG doesn't come down before the Lava Hound does, if it's Lava Hound first and then the RG comes down as a response, you know, that's the idea that, <clears throat> uh, uh, that Faust is sitting there waiting and holding. You know, maybe you go aggressive flying machine at the bridge just to make sure you bait out a response from your opponent. Then you can send in the minor. Then you can send in the arrows. Who knows? Uh, hopefully we can find out. Or if we can't now, maybe we'll talk to them. But, you know, a, a nail biter, uh, to say the least, in game number one. One in the skies, one on the ground, both oh. playing beat down and just not going to be able to get there in time. What's up? Minor was minor. He had just played minor and minor was at the bottom of the cycle mm. when he played that okay. when he played that lava hound. So, um yeah, the, the 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 cards he had in hand at the time were the Tombstone, the Mega Minion, 
the Lava Hound and I think probably his arrows, it looks like. So he could have played arrows, but there was just simply no way. He might be able to get arrows and then try to like panic, get a flying machine to connect a tower. But yeah, that miner was that miner was buried. So there was no yeah. way to do it. And, and I don't think that that flying machine connects. I think it's really more about yeah. baiting out Elixir, you know? So uh, Viper gonna go back to Hog again. Really, really happy to see that. And um, you know, that's a really strong thing for Viper to do is continue to play these hogs uh, decks that are not hog exinato. And here we go seeing the Mighty Miner plus Drill Wall Breakers. This deck went through maybe about three weeks ago, um, went through uh, a pretty big popularity bump, and we saw it, it rise pretty heavily in the use cases overall. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of it in competitive, but it has been pretty big in Grand Challenges. And here we go. Look, look at this. An Executioner, a Hog, a Valkyrie. Could it be? Are we being blessed? Are we going to see Viper do the Viper thing? And that's, yep, there's the NATO. All right, if you wanted to see Viper be Viper, well, I guess the confidence he gained after winning game number one, sure, let's see it here in game number two. And as I'm taking a look, yeah, you have the cannon for the Hog. Um... But Valk and Exe both for that drill. Man, this is going to be a, an interesting one for Faust to try to play in. For sure. And I, and I feel like Faust being hyper aggressive with, uh, I was just going to say, and I'm, <laughs> thank you, Viper. I feel like Faust being aggressive <laughs> with those uh, fireballs plus drills is just going to open it up for Viper to play those um, rockets. Because if you talk about a guy that knows this deck inside and out, he can defend for very cheap. He's not going to do the same thing over and over. And it's, I don't know, I just love it. You know, for as much as I hate playing against this deck, I love watching Viper play it. And Viper now with the lead, 1892 to 2174. You have to imagine Viper's played this matchup before and was, goes yeah. for the King Tower activation plus the log to clean up. So what an interesting choice he makes there. Mighty Miner plus Wall Breakers try to get behind that. Can the log knock the XE out of the way? No, it cannot. Yeah, I mean, the, you clearly, clearly know this is compelling. How much damage will this this Mighty Miner do? Wow, it's a decent amount. You, you clearly can see that Viper has played this matchup because this is his yeah. deck. This deck is very popular in GCs right now that he's up against. But Faust now has taken the lead just for a moment here. Yeah, if you want to know every single perfect interaction to play in this matchup, uh, Viper is going to show that to you. You see right there the log opposite lane. He doesn't play the Ice Spirit right away, knows his opponent. He respects his opponent. Probably going to pre-log out. Doesn't hit the Ice Spirit. Rocket Cycle already coming in early on to add up the pressure. Now playing the Guards instead of the Valkyrie because of that shield being on there. Then he goes Valkyrie up high. It's just a beautiful understanding of sequence. And then you even saw that Mighty Miner plus Wallbreaker's push. He played one uh, Executioner along with an Ice Spirit. It was absolutely perfect defense. I don't know if he wins this, though. This is a really interesting foot race here at the end. This Goblin doesn't get one more shot. 411 on the left-hand side. Fireball cycle, 204 remaining. Faust needs to get around very, very quickly. Log there. Rocket should there be enough is. to finish. Can't get in <clears throat> in time. And he made it close, but Faust not over able to overcome. Viper playing the deck that made his name in the game. I love it. I absolutely love watching it. I love every second of it. I hate playing against it, and I would never want to play against Viper uh, ever with that deck. You see how comfortably he cycles those rockets at any moment. If there's yes. even a window of opportunity, it's rocket on the tower, and I will make up for it on my defense. You saw the smart late plays. You saw the immediate adjustment. Faust goes drill, fireball, and you saw Viper defend with Valkyrie. That was the only time it was going to happen. Every time after that, it was guards on top. And then, of course, the Valkyrie up high to catch that Mighty Miner. And that was just perfection. Two Executioners came down, did more than its weight uh, in Elixir cost. You know, the first one was kind of a cycle card that went to the right-hand lane very early in the game. The second one was that beautiful cleanup of the Mighty Miner plus the Wall Breaker's push. And that's when a guy plays his comfort deck to perfection. You know, there's so many interesting stats in Clash Royale. Most Grand Challenges won, uh, most cards won, personal, like highest trophy count, all those different things. I, I don't, I'm i sure it's, it's in the data somewhere. I want to know where Viper ranks on most times Rocket played throughout all of your Clash Royale games. 
It yeah. feels like he has to be pretty high on that list, having like leaned on this deck for so long. And, and you know, there's probably a very small number of people um, who would be in the mix for that one. But you know, the, with the, la the the non the never changing up his game on ladder specifically, I, it's very possible that Viper is no is in the top three, if not number one, on that list of most rockets played all time. I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if he just was the number one guy. You yeah. know, you talk about all those top ladder finishes, and now you're seeing it here in competitive. Just beautiful, beautiful stuff. There's the rocket as the little yep. cherry on top. Ex excellent defenses throughout. I actually wonder what that matchup conversation is, and I actually think we can look at it here mm -hmm. um, once it populates. Um, just because I, I wonder, like, is that actually a really, really tough matchup for Viper that he played through? Or is it a matchup that falls in his favor? Um, and I, I just think that with how close that game was, considering that's Viper's comfort deck, it feels like it might have been in favor of his opponent. Yeah, it, it certainly could have been. I mean, you have Valk, which is a great counter to the drill. Xe has a decent um, secondary counter. The log to clean up. We saw some nice plays there um, that Viper put together with the, the NATO and the log to activate and clean up as well. Um, and I don't know. I wonder if that... I wonder, and that's one of those questions, right? If that matchup is a bad matchup for everyone else, but when you play that deck at Viper's level, if he would go, oh, no, no, I win that matchup eight out of ten times, right? It's just a question of who, who, who's actually playing the match. The perfect ones, but, um, you know, that's the match we just saw. We still have one more quarterfinal matchup remaining. The last one to qualify for the golden ticket uh, chance in late June, Inaraj up against the 8-0 to qualify Michifu, a.k.a. Mario. And this is a chance for uh, uh, a little bit of uh, revenge here, maybe, for a chance for um, a Frenchman to actually make his way through and join up with Viper, Michifu, though. Um, even when he makes mistakes, he still looks like he is uh, in a class of his own. Yeah, I mean, 100%. You look at what he did to qualify. He, you know, we talked about it a little bit earlier before. He went through uh, Janosch, Morton, Ascended, and Capgun. He did not drop a game in those four sets, as you can see right there, 8 and 0. Oh. And just because I was able to find it, and just because we were just talking about it, matching six cards or more and seven cards or more in that previous matchup, it's a 33% win chance for Viper. You have the exact matchup that we just saw it's a 28 percent chance for viper to win so we're talking 66 and 72 percent favors going to his opponent in that last matchup which is why i think it was as close as it was and why once again viper is the absolute best with that so that's enough gushing about viper and hog sure. xc nato like you said iteraj mario here we go michifu did work to qualify and he's been sitting back and sitting pretty iteraj on the other side of it had to work a lot harder yeah, I mean, he had to grind his way through getting points, but that is that is why I like that format for uh, for any sort of qualifier. And we've talked about this a bit, whereas last year there were no, it's on, on a macro level, right? There were no golden tickets. You only got points per match, um, per event. This year with these events, for World Finals at least, there's no points that you accumulate, but you do get the golden tickets. The format here for qualifying into the next phase uh, front that we've seen here for these uh, for the Snapdragon Pro Series, where if you win a qualifier, you're guaranteed to qualify for the round of 16. But also over those, uh, I think I think I can't think it was like 16 total qualifiers, or maybe it was like eight, whatever the number was, six total qualifiers. Over those six qualifiers, you can also gain points to make it here. I like that because it rewards both a phenomenal single event performance and it rewards right. consistency. And you're seeing both sides of that here with Mario and Interrush. Yeah, Interaj going right back to how we started our day today, right? It was Interaj and, and OP Sam to start our run today in our first round of 16. He was playing the exact same deck, but very, very different matchup here. You talk about that Firecracker being able to get on top of those minions, the Skeleton plus the Delivery to be able to drop on top of that Sparky. You got the Inferno Tower to stop the Goblin Giant. So I wonder if Michifu just goes, well, you played it really well to start your day, and that was a long time ago. Maybe you think I forgot. I'm going to try to counter you. Yeah, certainly certainly a possibility. And I, the, the interesting thing here, you see this variation on Hog EQ with the delivery in the mix, right? So yep. the Zap makes the, uh, makes the Inferno Tower more concerning. But the ability to drop delivery on the, on the back end of this to try to control that. And there you go. You see it going to get some damage plus take the absor absorption with the shield. That's really important for Michiko. 
And that was even really well played by Inaraj, right? Inaraj was looking for those skeletons, so he uses the dash from the Golden Knight to take out those skellies. But still, then, like you exactly were talking about, Rich, that Royal Delivery can come in. There's no way to stop that Royal Delivery's damage and no way to stop that Royal Delivery from soaking up that Sparky shot. So brilliant stuff so far here from Michifu, although Inaraj still got some good damage on that last hit because of that Golden Knight dash. Yeah, that was very nice, but still not able to get through with the Goblin Giant. Here we go. Hog down. Golden Knight plus Zap is going to stop most of that hog damage, but EQ will get in. No damage from the hog, but the splash extra from yeah. that Firecracker. Oh. 583. Michifu putting on a clinic right now, but can he hold off the always dangerous Goblin Giant Sparky Rage? So far, the answer looks like yes. And that was an incredibly satisfying royal delivery that came down. The spear goblins that came off the giant uh, goblin giant, the minions, and that golden knight. It doesn't feel much better than that for three elixir. And then you see there a brilliantly placed hog to distract the mini P.E.K.K.A. for a second, to distract the sparky for a second. And now it's just a story about that EQ cycle, right? Game over, game set and match. Just needs to get in that log. And there it is. And that was a really nice deck choice by Michi here in game number one. Can't believe that hog actually hit. That was one of those I, ones I where you're like, wait, that's a gr uh, that's a cool little defensive hog to create some separation and slow things down for a second. Wait, it hit the tower? What are you doing? Absolute insanity. Uh, and that was, you know, we talked about it. That was a, a, a brilliant play. You know, you see the zap for the Inferno Tower in that matchup, you go, okay, that Inferno Tower's gonna get reset a lot, but really Michi didn't let that be the story of the match. Instead, it yep. was the, the, the distraction high with the uh, um on those uh, on those sparkies and perfect uh a perfect sort of sequencing of the firecracker and the royal delivery to control and to damage yeah and, and you talk about the inability for Inaraj to get on top of all those units you're talking about, Rich. There's literally no way for him to get on top of Firecrackers. I, I, what is it, two yeah. zaps? That's that's not gonna happen. No. That, that's not gonna do it, right? And then there's no way to get on top of the Firecracker or the Inferno. The Inferno, you've gotta get the zap in, I guess, which is why we saw the Golden Knight taking out the skeleton so that the zap could be used on the Inferno, but then you still have the delivery, you still have the Firecracker, and then the fact that that Valkyrie is kind of the last line of defense that you play after you've distracted the Sparky twice, after you've dropped that Royal Delivery, then you can get the Valkyrie up high so that she has the most HP to turn that into a counter push. I love what we saw here out of Michi, but honestly, I, I think it's because he had a, a really good spot to be in. You know, this is, this is a really tough place. I mean, I guess if you're playing on like mid ladder and stuff, you're probably gonna mess up those interactions. That's not gonna happen here at the highest level. Michifu had that game on lock from opening. No, and you see here the Firecracker just being an absolute menace but on both sides of the board, too. She was able to play deep, and that was the big thing you talked about. He couldn't get to the Firecracker. She was able to be huge on defense and then go do damage on the other side of the board because he couldn't do anything about her. So that was massive. Now, I do want to say, Andrew, the second time we're seeing Inaraj open with, the, with that Goblin Giant Sparky deck, and I'm guaranteed, yep, he's going to go right to it again. I think the Inaraj came in with one dual deck set here. This is going to be yeah. the, the 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 cannon cart graveyard deck that he played. So this is this is actually really nice for um, for uh, for Michifu here because he's he probably I'm expecting he got a pretty good read here and went oh this might be the same deck again. And if somehow Inaraj wins this one, well his deck number three last time was the RG uh, Archer Queen deck that we saw with Lightning. So. Um, seems like some, oh no, never mind, a little bit of change here. Inaraj going, looks like, uh, with Lava as opposed to Graveyard. So, um, it was very similar at first, but a little bit of a change here. Either way, King Tower activation, nice for Michi. Yeah, I mean, that, all that was so it was so greatly called. I mean, the fact that Inaraj swerves at the last second there, it, it was set up for perfection for Michifu because what game did Sam win in that set? He won the matchup that you thought this was going to be with the exact same deck that Michifu is running right now. So Michifu not giving as much credit to his opponent, thinking that maybe he's just going to run back his same dual set like you and I both thought. So lane pressure, he's got things on lock with the E-Wiz, the Magic Archer, and the NATO. I think this is going to be a really, really, uphill battle for Inaraj. Yeah, the flying machine is probably the most annoying part of this one for Michifu, right? He doesn't have any great spell to pick it up. He has to rely on e Wizzes and Magic Archers, whether it's some good geometry or playing them high. If I'm Inaraj, like, I'm... The, all those flying troops in the back, 
the, the, the skelly dragons, the flying machines, especially that flying machine. I'm trying to find ways to abuse those the best I can and force Michifu to overspend. And that's where Michifu is going to probably, now that he has the King Tower activated, he goes, great, I can use my NATO to try to take care of those flying machines. That's probably going to be the best way for him to do it. But we're going to find out right now as this flying machine crosses the bridge. And with the Skeleton King being behind, easy for Michi to just drop down a tank unit on the ground and try to create a good counter push. Lava low, and now we see Drill go opposite side. Skelly drags to work on those. And flying machine in the middle to help in both directions. So it goes to the right, now it goes to the left. And now some pressure on the right-hand lane for Michifu to defend against, and a nasty downhill push on that left-hand lane that continues to stack more and more. Yeah, and you know what? If this ends up being just a really great matchup for Inaraj because of Michi's inability to get on top of that flying machine, I love the deck choice, right? You make your opponent think one thing, and you go the other way, and there's no way to stop this push. Flying machines are there. Iwiz maybe comes down late. No, not there. Flying machine on tower again. And Rich, a beautiful, and I love that I get to say it for real, <laughs> a beautiful swerve by Inaraj by rocking what looked like the same deck. He baits out Michifu into running the exact same matchup that Sam ran and won, and he goes to the skies instead, and we get to go to game three. Yeah, we do. And that's a, you know, I have played against Lava with the deck that Michifu ran there multiple times, and part of you feels like you should be able to control that Lava Hound um, that control those pushes. But again, like you have no answer for the flying machine. It can, yeah. as, when you get late game, it just stacks up behind. They can spend pretty easily to defend and they're just, they'll eat a little bit of damage when you drill, but not a ton of damage. The ghost was the biggest impact Michifu had. The ghost that got let, that, that went um, that went wild on the right hand side did a ton of damage. That was the biggest impact Michi had there. But then on the same side, when you're trying to distract, you saw the ghost come down to try to pick up the flying machine at the end. But the ghost is invisible, so the flying machine ignores that, <laughs> ruins the tower, and that's GG well played. Um, this was like you said, a really brilliant move out of Inaraj to both kind of s to bait the trap and switch it into a very good matchup. So our final game of our quarterfinals about to come your way. We will get our final four that will end up being the four players, or at least half of the eight players that we'll see in the finals of the EU MENA in June, like we've talked about all day long, which they're open. Those qualifiers, you can join up in split number two. We could be talking about you. This is the era of everyone. It's yep. not all sewn up. There's still four more players on top of the four that qualify today. Three of them already have that shot. Viper, Morton, and Rosen Noble have already got their opportunity to battle for that golden ticket. And right now we're trying to figure out, will it be Mario? Will it be Michifu? Will it be Inaraj? Who's it going to be to fill out that four? So uh, we're, we're, we're getting down to the heated stuff here, man. Not only are we getting down to that 25K and the big lion share of it, but we're also going to figure out who we're going to see in those finals. I am trying to get the website to bring up the, the schedule for the EU MENA uh, qualifiers remaining, but it keeps forcing me over to the North American ones. But I, I guarantee you, I, I promise you, there are still some uh, Europe, Middle East, North Africa uh, qualifiers remaining, chances for you to get in on the action. And of course, also in North America, no golden ticket, but a $20,000 event currently um, still has qualifiers for its second split. So go to snapdragonproseries.com and you can find out when you can qualify for those. Here we go. The second round of Open Cups, since you were able to speak, I was able to look. May 20th through June 5th. May 20th through June 5th is when that second split will be open for all you guys in the EU MENA. And that tournament, that grand finals, that final eight that are going to be fat battling for that golden ticket is going to take place on June 18th, same time that we started here today, I believe. So there's some information. But like Rich said, the best way to do it is snapdragonproseries.com. That's what I just did. Yep, so well done. Here we go into game number three. And with a, another good change here, Inaraj not going to RG in game number three, instead going with this uh, with this interesting Ram Rider deck. Ram Rider, Ram Rider and MK too. And MK is certainly after the, the, the nerf, not popular right now, but going MK Ram here in game number three. And I can't imagine that's what Michifu was putting him on. 
Yeah, you know, it's interesting when you talk about that Mega Knight being a card that's just fallen so far out of favor after getting the nerf, and even so much so that at the competitive level, I can honestly think of maybe two games, and I don't even know if those sets were won, but maybe two games in all of the tournaments that we've done so far in 2022 where that Mega Knight has come out on top. It's probably closer to three or four, maybe, but that is an astronomically low number for a card that was so dominant for so long, especially in this iteration that we're seeing right here, the MK Ram Rider deck was just brutal to deal with um, but you can see now with that nerf MK not showing up very much and shout out to Jane Kushal in the Twitch chat who predicted this play from Inaraj he, he said Inaraj will play MK Ram in game three and turns out he was right on the money you look at that matchup for the exact matchup of the last game that we saw 73% favor in Inaraj and that is again just such a credit to what he did in, in that great deck choice. I love it. I absolutely love seeing that out of these younger guys. So here we go into overtime. One game remains. One man will stand. Who's it going to be? And again, Michifu going with sort of the, the the double splash spell. We saw earlier with Snowball Arrows going with Arrows again. Arrows Fireball here for Michifu in this matchup. So variations on this Mortar Miner Skeleton King deck and this one with a bit more firepower for late spell cycle, but not quite as fast all the way around the horn. And that was a really, really pretty defense by Michi. Then he drops this miner right on top of that MK to protect the Skeleton King. I don't actually know if that's the correct move because there's a lot on the board and they're not too separated here in Elixir. But if anyone can defend with less Elixir than you'd think, Michifu's definitely one of those people. And Skeleton King keeps the mortar in the conversation. But the, wow, the it was the Ram Rider taking the Musketeer off the board after that Fireball. So able to clear her off. But as we go into Triple Elixir, it is still the lead for Michifu. So far, defense is holding up. Inaraj not finding a way to break through. And I don't think he'll be able to win a Spell Cycle race, Fireball by itself, against Fireball plus Arrows. Yeah, and you see there Michi doing the smart thing. He's always been a pretty patient and methodical player. He recognized where his cycle was at. His opponent drops an MK behind King Tower. He cycles his own Miner instead of trying to get that Miner chip damage in. I think he's done the same thing that you just talked about, Rich. He's recognized the fact that he's already got a little bit of gap in damage. He's got better spell power, and he's got direct tower damage in the form of that Miner. Here we go. This is really the big push for Inaraj. <laughs> Absolutely shut down by the Skeleton King and Fireball. That's gotta be the swan song here for Inaraj. Mario Michifu now just 17 seconds away from getting a shot at that golden ticket final. And there you go, late, late with that Skarmie comes down. MK does get the leap in. There's nothing there to defend this Ram Rider, but I don't know if there's gonna be enough time. If that Ram Rider connects, Rich, that's gonna do it. 1467, oh! Mario has been My eliminated. Word. Are you kidding me? All you had to do was keep one Ram Rider off the tower, 91 oh. HP. That thing was sewn up. The post dude was on the top. It was in It was in the mailbox. His hand just had to let go, and that package was on its way. Instead, Inaraj spoils the party and forces Michifu to go and try to qualify again for the second split year. Lucky thing you shared those dates, Andrew, because he has to come back and do it all over again. And you can see right there, Interage is like, man, what's going on? This is not going the way that I wanted. How can I break through? And it was that Skarmy played on a leaping Mega Knight, three elixir completely out the window. Then that mortar's just right in the in, in the crosshair, gets taken out by the MK. Ram Rider completely untouched. MK may not do a lot of damage anymore, but he's still got a lot of health. And that Ram Rider, no way to stop it. And that's wow. one of those things where you just go, man, Mitchie, all you had to do was defend for just a little longer, for literally eight more seconds, not able to do it. And a brilliant reverse sweep coming out here from Inaraj with the great mind games from game two, riding him into game three. And here we go, he's in our top four. That's just, that's just nutty. That whole thing is just nutty. <laughs> Sew it up. That was great. Like the, and, and you know, we, we, this is part of the dual mode situation, right? Is that he had to change up how he was planning to build that deck. Normally that deck runs log or snowball. Snowball at least slows down that Ram Rider. Log knocks it back. 
and instead yeah. he was did he didn't have I don't think he had I think he already played log maybe earlier in the turn yeah he played log in game number one so he didn't have log chose to go with this very heavy version this uh fireball and arrows version and had no way to stop that ram rider there at the end couldn't get around to another mortar fast enough so that's gg well played and that's part of the the dual mode challenge you gotta hold that fireball you don't need it anywhere else right if you're gonna play it at the bridge defensively fine that's a good idea but you got to get back around to it you've got to use it for that knockback so there's the first time the fireball comes out brilliant wow. fireball everything piled up skeleton king body blocking the elixir is there but instead a mortar comes down there's just nothing to stop this ram rider no knockback no nothing he ticks to four arrows come down instead because he's not quite there he needs some damage to come in and a great connection for interage last second and i can't imagine how mitchy is feeling right now uh I, I can imagine how Mitchie's feeling right now. <laughs> you know that feeling when you close your car door and right as it starts to slam, right before it's about to close, you realize your keys are inside? That's the feeling. He's he's like, no, no, no. Uh, no. <laughs> I got to I got to call I got to call a guy now to open that door for me. That's really that's terrible. That's the let's, feeling that he just had. Or when you call your teacher mom, right? And you like <laughs> wish you didn't. That's the feeling it's, that he has. It's already right now. out of your mouth, and you've. My, oh no! Or you say yeah. I love you instead of goodbye. They're all rough. Let's take yes. a look here at our <laughs> bracket. We've got our top four. The four that are going to be battling for that golden ticket in June: Morton, Rosenoval, Viper, and Interage. And this is an exact. Uh, display of what we're talking about: changing of the guard. Morton and Viper, no surprise. Interage and Rosenoval, uh, who? What? Here Where? they are. Our top four. <laughs> yeah. How? How many? How many different uh, question words? Are, can we invent new question words to add into this conversation? That was that was uh, a, a great performance by Interage. Uh, I mean, honestly, we talk about that finish in game number one or in game number three, which you know might be more. I don't know if that's more on Michifu than it is on Interaj. Um, I'd be curious to see kind of their evaluation of that one. Um, but honestly, it's game number two is the story of that matchup, right? Yes. Where he he just got. He absolutely got read like a book in game number one, got shut down. Game number two, he said, okay, well, I see that you, uh, you're, you've you read the book. Let me now change some of the words. And with a brilliant deck choice and performance in game number two. And then as we said earlier today, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. And uh, and that one, some angels were smiling on Inaraj to send him through to the next stage. Yeah, talk about taking a mistake and turning it around, getting right in game one. Okay, let me see if I can bait you out in game number two. That's exactly what happens, and we are down to our final four. But who's going to walk away with 9K? We're going to get one step closer right after this. Pro Series is brought to you by Snapdragon Elite Gaming, Monster Energy, and DHL. Time. You hear 
the crowd. We need that rain. Me and my team. Deja vu. This here a dream. We done all seen. A hundred times over back when we was just teens. Now we going dumb. Told them we the one. They would count us out. Now we counting up the funds. Now without a doubt, they be throwing up the ones. Like they was always rapping. Y'all believe them if you want. Now they show love. Came with a dub. It is what it is. It isn't what it was. They all love the hate when it don't work out. Tell you that they always been down when it does. Look. Say, oh. Well, if you were hoping that your Saturday would be filled with some great Clash Royale, guess what? It has been. This has already been completely insane, and it gets better and better. Not only do we have the four players who we know will join our other four for that golden ticket final in the end of June, but we also still have four, a few more matches remaining to decide who gets the biggest piece of that pie, the $9,000 top prize in today's competition. You know, after doing this for half a decade with you, man, I still love the fact that we could get up at, you know, 6 a.m. on a Saturday morning and still be losing our minds yeah. over incredible Clash Royale. It's never going to change. I hope it never does. I love it. Let's look at this next matchup. We've got both of our final matches are kind of the old and the new. The vet versus the rookie, Morton versus Rosen, and both of them had to work really, really hard to get here. Both of them playing almost or over 60 matches to get to where they were and working through a great bracket morton and mo going head to head two to one there morton two one cap gun and then on the other side of it rosen noble hasn't lost yet today he took out legolas and hugo two of the better players out there in the world and two of the better mortar players out there in the world it's all been rosen noble all day though yeah i mean those are no no small feats i mean the, of course the legolas match took place uh, off screen, but Legolas has been one of the top players out of the Ukraine for quite a long time. So that's a, a nice win there for Rosen to be able to move on in this competition. Um, and of course, Hugo, a, a very talented player out of France, and uh, Rosen played well, but also maybe caught him in kind of a, a bad day, maybe. The, the big question for Rosen right now is, um, can you get that same luck here against Morton? It looks like Morton is pretty dialed in. And on top of that, it looks like someone may have blessed Morton with some charm today as uh, he is Mr. 44 in two matches back to back. <laughs> yeah, and then you get 44 wins as well there. So 44 appears to be the number of the day for him. And when you look at Rosen, it's crazy when you look at his player profile, right? He's a guy that at least this profile specifically only started in May of 2020. He doesn't even have a two-year badge. But you look at the top ladder finish being in 62nd. You look at the Grand Challenges one. You look at the 20-win badge that he has. And you look at what he's done today. It's a scary, like, skyrocketing 
of success for someone that has I'd never really even heard of up until recently. And then you figure he's in our top four today in a tournament with Viper, with Faust, with Morton, with Mo. Uh, maybe another name that we get going to be excited to talk about for the next year or two here in Clash Royale. Well, that's one of the important things about events like this one is that anyone, including you watching at home, can participate. And that's the SnapdragonProSeries.com to go and check that out and log in. And of course, this is brought to you by Snapdragon Elite, uh, where gaming matters. So when you think Elite Gaming, let's of course think Snapdragon and make sure you get your chance to get in the mix here, both in the EU or Europe, Middle East, North Africa competition, and of course also that 20,000 North America competition as well. And we maybe we'll see you on here next time around. Yeah, both of those qualifiers for the second split are going to be starting uh, the, the Northern America one already well on its way for its split number two. And as you guys heard us talk about just a little bit ago, the second split going to be starting just uh, right around the corner here for EU MENA. So get in here. It's the era of everyone. Rosen top of your screen. Morton at the bottom. Both of them have been pretty dang good, but Rosen has been untouchable. Yeah, well, we'll see as, uh, how that lasts as Rosen going with uh, what looks like I mean, uh, is this golem? Maybe golem. Is this, yeah, probably golem. Maybe lava. Yeah, the night, it feels which like is it's so got to be one of those now. two. I know. It really is. It really, really is. It felt like for a long time it was only Night Witch with Golem, and then it was Night Witch uh, along with, I think there was like a weird MK deck for a while, but then it was really Night Witch clone, right? It feels like golem or, or clone were really the only two versions or decks you were ever going to see her in. And here we go, Hog does get one shot as Baby Dragon plus Giant Skeleton go opposite direction. Morton going with a uh, pretty popular variation of Hog, most likely Hog EQ in this one with the Hog plus Archer Queen was at one point the, the dominant variant overall. We saw some of the Royal Hogs variation as well. Morton, you know, it used to be that we talked about how Morton was a Royal Hogs guy. Um, he's oh, moved yeah. away from the Piggies and moved away from the Wall Breakers primarily. Yeah, I mean, he's a big time, you know, quick cycle guy. He loves bait. He loves wall breakers. He loves the piggies. But again, you talk about being in the league for so long, being as big of a player as you are, being a massive content creator and a massive streamer. Unfortunately, everyone is watching what you're doing, which means you can't just keep doing the same thing at the highest level. Yeah, this is Graveyard. Right before right before that Skeleton King game down, I was like, oh, this is probably Graveyard, and I'm full of nonsense. And then the skeleton comes down, graveyard right behind it. So, uh, GG well played. I should have read that one earlier. Yeah, I mean, realistically, when we saw the Night Witch come down and we saw the snowball, it should have been a big tell. But hey, EB and AC, that's really more so their jobs, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we can say that for sure, as we see with the hog and the skeletons go to the right-hand side. Big push on the left with the delivery coming in high but getting pretty much evaporated. Will this log stop that? Oh, there you go. The skeleton's Ooh. able to pick up. That cannon cart seemed real dangerous for a moment, but here's the, the thing about the Skeleton King plus Graveyard combination. You are never out of the fire in this matchup. And I was just going to say, Morton is going to have to take a lot of damage on either of these lanes. He ends up taking a good amount of damage on both. The one saving grace for him is he's still ahead, and he has a deck that has EQ and Hog in it, but he is getting overwhelmed, and Rosen recognized that Elixir Differential, and he is trying to punish him for it. Look at what just happened there, though. That oh, cannon man, cart again. was going to uh, that cannon cart was going to take care of the Tesla. The skeleton, king, uh, the giant skeleton, because it's so heavy, turned around, went back to the knight, and pulled the cannon cart, pushed the cannon cart away from the Tesla to let that defense hold on a little bit longer. So while that didn't go wonderfully for Morton, that could have gone worse. And he's having a really t hard time, Morton is, with dealing with those giant skeleton bombs. You've seen that giant skeleton bomb make it so that the, the defense on the cannon cart had to be paid more attention to. Two big hog hits there for Morton. That is big time saving grace for him. But that giant skeleton bomb cleaned up the skellies, cleaned up the knight. You saw that this last time made it really difficult for Morton to figure out where to place the Tesla. So that's been a great job there by Rosen. But allowing those two hog hits in, that could have sealed the deal. As this second hog comes in at the same time as a graveyard. I think this might be the win here for Morton. Snowball oh. comes in. He has to play the EQ defensively. The Hog does not does get the second hit. Wow, the defensive EQ rather than the offensive Earthquake. And Morton able to hold on. And that Hog Rider said, I am not dead. I am not <laughs> dead. I'm going to hit that tower for you. Gets it done. And that was yet another nail biter from a man who might not even have fingernails anymore. 
I just feel like that is the perfect description of how Morton plays Clash Royale there at the end. He does the smartest, safest plays so regularly in those high pressure situations. We've seen it already a couple times today, and that's the exact same thing that we're seeing right here. Because honestly, if Rosen decides to double down on his offense instead of pulling the trigger, excuse me, on the defense, instead of pulling the trigger on that graveyard, I think he would have probably put himself in a better spot. I know the graveyard did need to come in, but he needed to know that the Hog Rider was also gonna come in. It's the best play that there is. Use that Night Witch, use that Snowball, get that high high DPS in, make sure that hog does not connect, and then throw in the graveyard. Unfortunately, he's playing against Morton. Morton knows, all right, if you want to do it that way, I'm going to do it this way. Hog Rider's going to go in, Earthquake on the Princess Tower to take it. No, 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 my friend. I'm going to do the smart, safe thing. I'm going to kill those skellies from the graveyard. And if my Hog Rider takes the tower, fine. If it doesn't, I have that much more damage on you. So really, really great late game um, vision, if you will, by Morton. Yeah, I mean, that's been the story of the day is, is late game vision, a little bit of late game ball bouncing the right way as well. But man, the, you know, it's again, that EQ on defense, I, I you know, the, the old inside the play videos I used to do, the inside the play series where I would do the alternate reality. That's one of those ones where I wish I could go back and recalibrate all of that and see if he had done the thing that almost everyone else would do, which is EQ the tower as opposed to EQ defensively. Would he have still won that or was that EQ necessary? I think so. He would have won it either way, but man, the 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 way he stuck in there and played the defense first, the offense second, just again, that's a veteran. I'm also really curious, and you know, maybe a, a vet can tag us on Twitter and let us know that's very good with Hog and with Graveyard. You know, Graveyard, it felt like should have probably started playing into the same lane as Morton, right? You get that better counter push, you've got a better defense, you can turn that defense into offense. Yeah. I've always heard that you want to play Graveyard same lane and you want to play Hog opposite lane. And literally, that's exactly the opposite of what Rosen did against one of the best in the world. Well, he has another chance right here and goes Lava right into an Inferno Tower. I'm assuming there's some good control here against this Inferno Dragon. The Zap could be dangerous here, though. And that's going to be a nice Inferno Dragon connection, but it does get burnt down or taken off before it does too much damage. Yeah, a bit of a misplay there by Morton. Morton's always a guy that's known as playing a last second defense to make sure he covers all of his bases. Instead, I think he didn't want to leak any elixir or leak any more elixir, and he decides to go bowler right in front of the king tower as opposed to playing it right in front of the princess tower. If he gets it in front of the princess tower, then he doesn't get that connection from the inferno dragon. Yes, the bowler doesn't get a good counter push, but that minor and inferno are much better controlled. Bowler, we have not seen Bowler today, I believe, although, of course, Bowler Loon Freeze and Bowler GY Freeze have become uh, much more popular as of late, especially at uh, in the uh, aftermath of last year's World Finals. And here comes the <laughs> here comes the balloon in for Rosen. Yeah, that was a really annoying couple months where everyone just wanted to play Bowler, NATO, Freeze with Baby Dragon because they were like, well... If Moogie can win World Finals with it, I could probably win this ladder match at 5,400. <laughs> yeah, it's still it's still <laughs> rearing its head pretty much all over the place, but this is an interesting bowler variation. Have to assume Graveyard out of mm -hmm. Morton in this one. Yeah, it definitely feels like it there. You see the arrows, you see the Skeleton King, the Skarmy. Um, really kind of the, the only option, it feels like, for Morton. This is kind of like um, Giant Bowler GY, just with the Skeleton King in favor of the Giant which on the front end costs one less one, one less elixir, one fewer elixir, and on the back end gives you that extra oomph of the ability. So interesting choice here. And Morton just going to freeze defensively on that balloon. I was wondering what he was going to do. I was wondering what he's going to play. He ends up taking one balloon drop and probably not getting as much out of this as he thought he would. And that Inferno Dragon is actually tanking for the Skeleton Dragon, so they get on top of Tower. Inferno's still alive. Lava Hound right there at the bridge, and that was a really, really rough sequence for Morton. He's going to go ahead and put the Skarmy Pressure on the left-hand side. He might freeze again here. Yep, there you go. Freeze does come out one more time. So that's, I mean, look, we've talked about Freeze in the past, and wow, way behind an Elixir right now is Morton Rosen up by almost five Elixir, four and change at the moment. We've talked about how so much of Freeze is knowing when to actually use it, in particular, when a defensive Freeze is actually the best option you have. We've seen it here a couple of times so far. Now gonna distract with Skarmy, we might see a Freeze here again to preserve this from the Inferno Dragon. No, Inferno Dragon goes down. And now a lot of damage from that Skarmy. Graveyard push in left-hand side, plus Skelly King distracted high. This is starting to look like it could turn towards Morton's way. 
Yeah, it really does feel like he's getting ahead of himself. Rosen is maybe not going to have enough defense here. Skeleton King will get on top of tower there. Both towers are going to be just above 1,000 HP and overspend with that fireball. Yeah. And Morton has got to smell the blood in the water. He's got to go heavy on the offensive here. I don't know if it's by setting up a Skeleton King and then going Skarmy aggressive, but he needs to do it, and he needs to do it now. Mm, he played the safe game and put the... Mega Minion on the right-hand side, maybe a little bit late. I think he might have, might have thought that he was going to get something across the bridge a little bit earlier from Rosen as opposed to as late as that Inferno Dragon did come down. He's going to probably eat a lot of this Skeleton Dragon damage on the left-hand side and just go ahead and set up into that lane. There we go. High Inferno Dragon, Skeleton King plus Skarmy on the right-hand side. This bowler's not going to do anything here, and now it's going to be a lot of defense needed for Morton to survive as we go into our final 40 seconds. And there you go, a high freeze and an immediate balloon opposite lane. I love that. Inferno's out of range. Freeze oh, is boy. out of play. Nothing to get on top of that balloon. That was a brilliant play by Rosen, a game-winning play yep. by Rosen, and that was brilliant. That was really, really nice. And you saw the, the low Inferno Tower to the right-hand side. Rosen knew that that was what is, was going to win the game. It was at some point... And then we saw all the, inf like the, the the outside corner Inferno Tower, sort of all the, the all over the place Inferno Tower placement. That was just, let me wait until you do it one time where I know I can sneak a balloon by and every everything's in cycle and I have the elixir for it. And that's what he did. Perfect, perfect execution there by Rosen to take that game from Morton. Yeah, and it was just such great use of the Skeleton Dragons as well. The Inferno Dragon was such a nuisance for Morton. He couldn't get on top of it. It was burning through his bowlers, which is a really, really rough, uh, you know, five elixirs spent when you see that happen over and over. And it's very unlike Morton to kind of figure out what he needs to do defensively and then kind of spend all the tricks that he has without that same offense coming in from his opponent. So what I mean by that is if you get an Inferno Tower down, you get a Freeze in, and you get your arrows in, but there's no balloon that's coming to play yet and you've spent that on the inferno the skellies and the lava hound it's it, it's a great showing of frozen forcing the issue on morton to use all of his defensive responses and leave himself completely empty-handed in the opposite lane it's not often that you see morton with literally no response and that's exactly what we saw the early cycled minion the early cycled inferno the the freeze coming down and literally nothing to stop that balloon yeah, here we go taking a look at the, the replay here. And this is the one of the late balloons that got picked up and pulled back. But I believe we're getting close here to the final sequence. The Skelly Drags go to the left. And these Skeleton Dragons were huge. He chose yeah. to eat this damage as opposed to defend that damage. That Inferno Dragon probably wouldn't have done much on the right-hand side. And here you go. We, we, we kind of skip past the moment where the Inferno, Dragon, the Inferno Tower goes to the right. The balloon just sneaks right on by. It's a clear path made. Um, go ahead. It's, it's almost like there was someone down there with, you know, when an airplane is trying to pull in to taxi at the gate, right? <laughs> One of those was sitting there going this way, fly on. Yep, there you go. Drop the bomb. GG, well played. And now we're going Easy. to a game number three. Yeah, that bowler that you were talking about, man, that bowler that came down uh, on, you know, underneath the skeleton dragons doesn't actually tank for him, but it's really there to stop the ensuing barbarians. Sets up that Inferno Tower to be played up high, at the, or excuse me, Inferno Dragon to be played up high at the river and work towards that left hand lane. So there's that dual lane pressure that you're talking about. Morton recognizes, okay, the, the bigger threat is on the right hand side. I can just keep this Inferno at bay with a Skarmy or what have you, but then a great, great minor plus balloon, an awesome turnaround there by Rosen. Yeah, a great turnaround. And now we go into a game number three and looking at what's been played so far. Morton, game number one, playing Hog EQ Archer Queen. Game number yep. two, playing the um, the Graveyard Skeleton King Freeze deck. And then if we go onto the side of Rosen, game number one was Graveyard Skeleton King with Poison. And you can understand why the Graveyard came out for Morton at that point with Skeleton King and the Poison both out. And then just now that Lava Loon Miner with, uh, with Barbs which uh, kind of a throwback deck here out of Rosen for sure. So now we get into game number three, trying to figure out what the heck do these guys do. Um, and on the side of Rosen, Fireball, Poison both out. So you have Earthquake, you have the uh, Rocket, you have Lightning as the three most likely culprits for him to go with. Uh, I don't really know much about Rosen's deck pool, though. I, I know, I'm in the same boat. I'm sitting here looking at what's available and what's left um, and what's been used, I should say. And Morton definitely, I don't think, should go back to bait. I think that that's something that Interage, or excuse me, Rosen could maybe be looking yeah. for. And he does still have Log available. Morton, you know what? 
maybe he busts out something that he's great with that we're used to seeing him play other than bait. Maybe we see some minor control here. Maybe we see minor wall breakers. Maybe, honestly, we just go minor mortar. Why not? You know, you could just go minor mortar with, you could do the old version. I know you used AQ. I know that you've used, um, skeleton king so you know maybe you decide to use mighty miner instead with mortar or maybe you go golden knight they all pair well with mortar right now and you have poison available i think you probably try to use that also and we do see the miner early on i'm happy to see that from more yeah this will be interesting i was gonna say maybe the wall breakers uh mighty miner deck but we do see the the classic miner if you will coming out this way um i was gonna say i think i, I was gonna expect eq out of rosen seen what would have been played already. You don't want to play Lightning here, really. And uh, he's going to wish he had that Snowball to get the value on those bats as well. Yeah. Here you go. That's going to be Royal Giant EQ. Because, um, look, you're not going to – there's no reason to play Lightning because the Archer Queen is out, or you shouldn't – there's no not as much reason to play Lightning. Archer Queen is out. This is probably RG EQ, and that's going to be a very interesting set of defenses with this Mortar for Morton. Yeah, and look at this deck. You know, no AQ available doesn't decide to go with the Musketeer, which is really the more popular option than the Witch. And literally almost anything is a more popular option than the Witch at this point in the game. Um, and then you see right there, the Golden Knight. And this deck is, is really, uh, it's, it's just like very close to something that's in the meta with a very odd change there from the Witch. You know, it's so close, Andrew, that I think that playing Barley from Brawl Stars is almost as popular a choice in this deck <laughs> as which would be. So, uh, you know, interesting choice here from Morton. But again, that's the Heat Morton and Julesy in the lab trying to find out the best option here in game number three. And this is certainly something that, uh, that we haven't seen before. And predi predictability was one of our concerns about Morton. Who's predicting this? Yeah, totally, man. I think it's a really, really great call by him and Julesy. And also the idea that maybe his opponent, wow, and those bats. Those bats are just oh. wrecking that tower. And the RG is right behind. No damage there for the Royal Ghost. And oh my goodness, that was brutal. And there goes the Royal Ghost is continuing along, forcing the Golden Knight out, lest you, you lose your tower. And now, yeah. just like that, Rosen has the right hand tower of Morton down to 503 and he's got the uh, the German in a really tough spot. I just don't get the, the not playing the Musketeer. I mean, maybe he's expecting Royal Giant, so the Witch becomes a good card because the Skeletons are going to make it impossible for that Fisherman value that you really want. But that's like a lot of things going exactly how you want them to go as opposed to using something that is just, you know, not even arguably just better in terms of and using it, the Musket. And it is the Lightning, so there you go. I got that call call off this time around um interesting choice here to go lightning variation but goes ahead and now in a really great spot is rosen just has to have put together one or two more solid defenses and that right hand tower will be easy pickets that's right just pour everything into this left hand lane i was actually going to say save your log but instead he decides to use it because the overwhelm is coming in morton knows that this game is lost if he does anything other than pressure 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 and uh, right now rosen is just in a really really easy spot he misses the mortar pushback so that rg's on tower guards come in a little bit late so the fish boy gets on top of tower he has to spend the snowball yeah. this is tough but he did keep it off, and that's the big thing, is just don't let that Lightning get its opportunity. But there's going to be a log chance now. Lightning gets in. 99 HP. This is it for Morton. Can he pull this one out? He's put together some magic so far today. Lightning will be enough to finish it. He does yeah. have guards, though. Could he go for a block here? Maybe a bit of a gamesmanship with He's the go ghost on the left-hand he side. Bats. He, he, he just played he his guards, so there you oh, go. Yeah. There you go. GG, well played. Rosen with one for the books, taking a big time win off of one of the greats. That's massive, man. He, he drops his first game of the day, but has yet to drop a set. He's eliminated Morton. He's eliminated Hugo. He's eliminated Krasilkov. And now he is on to our finals. No matter what, he walks away with at least $4,000 today. Could be 9 k And he's already got that ticket to battle for the golden ticket. So does Morton. But Morton not quite getting to the top here in this tournament. And, you know, that's, that's a lot of Morton's history is getting very, very close to the top. Yeah, well, I mean, again, I, I do want to remind everybody that uh, both of these players will be moving on in the golden ticket portion of the event later in June. But in today's competition, Morton takes a seat 
and Rosen now moves on to the finals, which we'll be seeing a little bit. Man, what a what a great performance by, you know, you talk about Morton on one side, Inara, I mean, Rosen on one side, Inaraj on the other. We're seeing yep. these players out of, out of the Europe and Middle East North Africa region who don't typically get a lot of shine having some pretty big moments today. A hundred percent. I mean, beating these guys that they've already ran through is incredibly impressive. You know, Inaraj is now going to have to play up against Viper, but he took out Jonah and he took out Michifu. And that is a really, really tough one-two punch to get through those first two rounds. You know, Jonah was our lowest seeded player, but he still got seeded in. There was a lot of other people that did not that are bigger names than Jonah. And they talk about being able to beat Michi 2-1 in that great kind of mind game that we saw. I'm really excited to see Inaraj in his third set of the day against Viper. Will he just rock it again? Because it seems so insane to run Goblin Giant Sparky three times in a row, especially after you got uh, the big W or the, excuse me, the big L in your second set of the day by kind of getting gamed uh, and predicted? I don't know. Is it is it impossible to predict the three times out after losing it in set number two? Yeah, I mean, I, maybe it's a comfort thing. Maybe he likes that it creates really difficult reads in games two and three. There are good reasons to keep going there. Um, you know, the and also that mind game of, you know, remember we saw Igor in the No Tilt World Championship. Yeah. <laughs> I think yes. it was, I, I, I can't remember who it was. I think it was a South Korean player he played it against where Igor ran the same deck uh, four times in a row in a best of five. Right, so there is something. It didn't pay off for him in that situation, but there's something <laughs> yeah, to that. Say, like yeah. he's not gonna do it again. You're not gonna go for a head kick again, are you? Another head? Throw a jab. Throw something else. So that could be part of the thought process here. But of course, you and I uh, don't know him as well as a player. Uh, but of course, right now, the other part of part of it too is. He might just be feeling good because the big work has been done. He is moving on to the golden ticket phase. If I'm him right now, I'm not at all nervous anymore today. Yeah, why not? You've already gone so much farther than you thought. You're getting to play against greats in the game. Inaraj versus Viper is next. And really, it's, it's all of them. You've already got that ticket to battle and ticket. But now it's about the it's about the prowess. It's about the cat. Ash. Will Inaraj and Rosen be our finals? Will it be almost a no-name finals with some massive names in this competition? And like you talked about, Rich, these tournaments that are giving a little bit more of a spotlight to some players in specific regions that we maybe don't get to pay as much attention to because they're not in that top 16, top 32 conversation of best players in the world. What a great way to start building a legacy for both of these guys. Yeah, I mean, for certain. And, you know, there was, been, there was, there was some pushback when it was announced that some of the CRL Golden Ticket events were going to be regionalized, right? We have one for Europe, Middle East, North Africa right now. Um, I believe there's one in the works for uh, for the Americas. Um, I don't know like exactly how those are all being put together, but there was some pushback for those. But we are seeing that some of the benefit of, of uh, regionalizing some of these tournaments is maybe giving some guys a chance to, to take a shot at a Golden Ticket who wouldn't in a fully, in, a, in an international one. And also not just get that shot, but also get a shot at a time of day where they're not being like, you know, how many times do the the Western players have to play at some brutal hour for an Eastern, because right. um, it's Eastern time and vice versa. Um, the East has probably been punished by it more than the West has in some ways. Um, depends on which event you're talking about. But yeah, this is this is giving some chance to these guys who in a fully global one might not have had a shot at a golden ticket. Well, you look at the numbers that we just saw there. Viper with the first place ladder finish with 8,900 trophies. Inaraj with 181st with 8,000 trophies. Inaraj played like 62 games or whatever. Viper played eight or nine, excuse me. So two very different stories on paper. Nonetheless, they are here in our semifinals. Here we go. Game number one, Viper going with a Drill Wall Breakers variant with the Dark Goblin in the mix. So a lot of baity stuff going on here on the side of Viper, where it's also Wall Breakers, but a little heavier with the Wall Breaker MK deck out of Inarash. Nice little Electro Spirit there. Gets on top of both Wall Breakers. One Wall Breaker goes to the Inferno. The other one goes to the Princess Tower, but that Electro Spirit makes it so that neither connect. Really good stuff there. And Wall Breakers for the first time today, coming out both ways. Why not? Oh. And Prince oh. almost gets down, but the guards do turn that bad boy back around, so no huge connection. And I believe this is our first Prince that we've seen today. And, you know, one thing we're seeing out of Inarash, saw some out of Rosen as well, is we're seeing some kind of uh, some throwback decks, if you mm -hmm. will. Some decks that maybe aren't as popular in the meta, but maybe decks that they have a lot more comfortabil comfortability with 
because of uh, you know, just because they didn't play as much competitive, they've played more ladder, more grand challenges. Yeah, and Interage there trying to kind of min max with his AQ. Uh, takes us so much damage on that right hand side he doesn't have a lot of elixir to show for it or damage to show for it and uh really not the start i bet he was looking for against someone as good as viper and someone like viper who has been playing lights out today let's not forget viper 2-1 schwatzen to start and then he 2 owed faust so a dangerous man right now is viper one wall breaker connection though for Inaraj. so 1964 to 1385 picks up the dark goblin on the right hand side and as the drill goes in, this time to the back, and the wall breakers begin to beeline for the front. Royal Ghost trying to stop them. The, the zap has to come out, and Viper is just spreading Inaraj as thin as humanly possible. And this is uh, a deck that I was going to call out earlier on, most likely only is running Zap at the top of your screen, which obviously it is now with the eighth card being played, and it's Zap. And then you look on the other side of it with Viper, there is so much bait out there in terms of the drill, the guards, the goblin, uh, the dark goblin, and those wall breakers. It makes having your only spell be Zap be pretty brutal in terms of matchup. Eating a second wall breaker over on that left hand side is Viper, and now going to have to respond to this. Archer Queen as well, throws the Wall Breakers down, Prince to pick up against that last drill there, 736 remaining, as again, Wall Breakers trying to sneak on through this time. Dark Goblin doesn't get it done. So wow. Inaraj, a live dog here as we go into Sudden Death Overtime. And I guess the only saving grace out of that entire interaction was the masterful block there on the Dark Goblin with that Valkyrie preventing a lot more damage and being able to turn this into some offense. And now you see not having a Zap available for this Inferno. Inferno Tower getting an insane amount of value. 351 to 1180 and a lot of trouble here for Interaj. Yeah, I mean, we were we look at the same sort of thing. Oh, Wall breakers, oh. one gets in, two gets in. Oh my word, can he hold on? Drill in. Wall breakers opposite direction. Did he overspend? Wow. He did. 106. Viper sneaks on by through game number one. The wall breakers get in. Almost enough to do it, but Viper able to fire on back and take it away. Man, the 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 places. Here's what I'll say about Interaj. He has throughout this day given himself chances to compete. He's given himself yep. chances to take the win. Sometimes it's gone his way, which is why he's here. It didn't go his way that time. But I think that the, the true terminology here, Andrew, is he's a live dog the entire way through these fights. Yes, and, and if you think about the matchup conversation about the game that we just saw, had Inaraj had one better spell or one spirit even to help deal with those wall breakers, I think we'd be seeing a very different tune. He yeah. was creating a, a lot of pressure in the perfect moments in that opposite lane. We kept seeing one wall breaker connect, another wall breaker connect, another wall breaker connect, and all of a sudden two connect late game, and you're going, oh my gosh, there has been a, a really, really big struggle by Viper in defending these wall breakers, even though it felt like he was min-maxing most of the time, but he wasn't creating enough damage out of it. So Inaraj saw that he was able to come back. It was really about that one drill that came in when Inaraj was down at Elixir early on, and the only thing he had to defend it was that late AQ, and he took like almost 2,000 damage. I think it was like 1,400 damage in that moment. If that didn't happen, he'd be the winner of game one. Yeah, I mean, that's... That's Clash Royale for you though, right? And let's take a look at some of the replay here. And this was where he didn't have the Zap to support the MK. This didn't end up being the important lane there for Inaraj though, right? Yeah. He finds himself here about an Elixir ahead, so puts the pressure on with the Royal Ghost. Miner goes into the back, and the Wall Breakers, just look at the path they take to sneak on through. It's kind of shocking, especially with the Electro Spirit in there, they made it through, but then the opposite direction, Viper gets it done. So uh, another crazy photo finish. Uh, another reason why, another example of, I say it all the time, why we love Clash Royale. Yeah. And uh, man, I mean, I don't know who's feeling more stressed from that one. Viper from the, oh my gosh, that almost got away from me, or Inaraj with the back against this wall here in game number two. Well, I think if I'm Viper, I'm feeling that pressure just a little bit more. He's got a game in hand, which is really, really nice for him. But you look at the way that that last sequence came in that you were talking about. Guards and Electro Spirit should have been enough. So Inaraj cycles that Royal Ghost really early on. And then he sends in the Wall Breakers way late because of what you're talking about. As we saw in that replay, Rich, the path that those Wall Breakers took, it was all on the shoulders of that really, really brilliant early send on the Royal Ghost. So had Inaraj figured that or cracked that code, 
road maybe just a little bit earlier on, or maybe if he didn't overspend in that opening minute, he would have been able to take game number one. But if you do that against Viper, he's going to punish you. One game in favor of the Frenchman. The Frenchman one game away from being in our finals. Here we go. So Zappy split. We'll see if this is going to be Royal Giant out of Inarage. That's been the most common result when you have Log and Hunter together also makes that seem very, very likely as Viper has the skeleton, giant skeleton fish boy. So this could be an RGRG fight, and we have Looking not like seen it. a fish battle in quite a while. <laughs> yeah, and honestly, they add to some of the most entertaining moments in Clash Royale history when you think about the fish boy blocks up high or the mechanics of using the fishermen on your side of the board, the king tower activations, what have you. And now with both fishermen out of play, Viper goes, all right, let's send in the RG. Just the, the big question here is does someone make the mistake at some point of cycling fishermen in the back? Right? I, I think that we're, in, that we're at too high a level for that to happen, but we've said that before. We've seen it in CRL and uh, many times where you're going, how the heck do you make that mistake? It's usually when you don't realize giant skeletons in there, but um, the cycle situation could be challenging here. My hope is that no one uh, gets caught by that, by that slip. Yeah, it's going to be all about that ground overwhelm coming out from either of these guys to try to bait out that fisherman early, and it's going to be a really difficult thing to do. And if one of them does make that mistake on the back of making great offensive plays, that could be something that happens. You know, like you said, Rich, I think it's probably pretty tough at this level, especially with this much on the line. But we'll see. That fisherman right there that was played was pretty predictable, but Inaraj probably felt pretty safe considering this big push he had coming in. Here we go, first two minutes away, entering sudden death overtime. So far it is Viper who has the game lead match point for him and has the damage lead. He sets up to the right hand side with the Royal Giant. Zappy's behind, Hunter plus Fishboy. We're gonna stop that damage, but one shot gets in. Second does not get off. Yeah, very, very close there. A nice log by Inaraj to get the Fire Spirit off the board. I don't know if that was intentional or not, but we'll just call it a nice prediction play. Still, Viper, though, ahead by 1,500 damage. And now Inaraj going on the offensive. Fishboy is there, but Giant Skeleton is distracted. Hunter up high. Hunter getting zapped on by those zappies allows that RG to get a shot in. Look at the path that Giant Skeleton just took back away from the tower. Yep. That Giant Skeleton was so deep and then it went back towards the hunter and then back towards the opposing giant skeleton. So that's some of the uh, the craziest vision I think we've seen out of that troop. And man, it kind of harkens me back a little bit to some of the crazy stuff we saw with giant skeletons in 2v2. When players oh, start yeah. figuring out how to work those weird uh, pushes back and forth with GS versus GS. And there you go, Viper goes up high to predict the Fisherman. A great play there by Inaraj, dropping it much lower. Only problem with that is that when it's that low, the RG is gonna get a shot. So you see, RG shot does come in. Two giant skeletons on the board on the right-hand side, but that's the healthier of the two lanes. And yeah, exactly, one giant skeleton here can come out from Viper. But will there be enough here defensively? That is the question. Hunter down, Royal Giant deep in enemy territory. Log to clear, Fish Boy trying to pull the Giant Skeletons back. Royal Giant gets one more shot, can I get a third in? And it does, and that might be four shots, five shots in, and just like that, with 80 seconds left, Inaraj roars back into contention. A brilliant offensive sequence orchestrated perfectly. Two giant skeletons. What's the best thing you could do to that is throw in a royal giant behind. Luckily for Viper, that second giant skeleton was not tanking for the RG, but another shot comes in, and now the lead in favor of Inaraj by 87 HP. And now Viper feeling the heat starts the EQ cycle. Or excuse me, Inaraj feeling the heat starts the EQ cycle. And then it does Viper. Zappy's up high. Do they stop this hot, this RG shot? Ooh. They do. That's absolutely massive. 541 to 364. And that low, low hunter not going to do the job. Royal Giant Ooh. can't get the shot off. Can't get the shot nice. off. And it does. Inaraj comes from behind and sends us to game number three. What an incredible, incredible show of perseverance there, never giving up. Didn't even know if he was ever going to find a moment. I didn't know if he was ever going to find a moment, but all of a sudden, two giant skeletons, pretty healthy on the board, and an RG behind, plus all these other units to follow in. A brilliant, brilliant offensive send there by Inaraj, and Viper just got completely overwhelmed, at maybe getting lulled a little bit too much into comfortability there late game. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a hard call. You know, you have to go back and 
uh, micro-analyze each and every interaction. He was ahead by quite a bit and then kept on playing the pressure game. And it, you understand why, because if he, there's no way to stop Royal Giants from doing damage. So you have to do create, yet you do have to create pressure. But in the end, uh, I'm trying to, you know, the, I'm seeing maybe a little bit behind here trying to catch up with the second giant skeleton. You know, it was, it was one push where a giant skeleton was played very deep by Iniraj on defense, way in his own territory. And, you know, you talk about the, how do you, in this type of matchup, start stacking? Well, that was that big moment where he got the two scout giant skeletons and the royal giant down. And that was just a huge, huge swing in his direction. It just becomes so difficult to know how to defend that push, right? Because you think about that first giant skeleton dying, you can't play the hunter up high, you can't play the zappies anywhere near it, you don't want the fish boy to get you know, pull in the giant skeleton and then die or pull in the RG. It just was so, so difficult. And right there, you're kind of seeing the end of that. Uh, I guess that's actually the next push that came in because he did get one shot there. And then here from Viper, I get what he's going for. It feels like maybe he overspent just a bit offensively right there. I, I don't know though if it would have mattered. Um, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Maybe he could have actually gotten the Fishboy pull off this time around, but I guess that's neither here nor there. Interage takes game number two. You know, if that Royal Giant had hit on that top right hand tower, that's game over. He EQs him out, right? Yep. So it's just one of those things where by a hair, by a split second, it was Interage was able to, to DPS that down, get the Royal Giant off before that shot comes in. And that's just one of those ones where, you know, we've talked about it with uh, with the the arrows not quite hitting Morton's Tower earlier in that 44H in one of our 44 HP games, right? <laughs> so same thing here. That's a split second difference. And you know, arguably, uh, or if that one hits, we're probably, oh, cool. Viper's into the finals. Let's move on. And that's exactly what Viper's hoping we say at the end of this could be five minute game, the final game of our semifinals. Before we get to our grand finals, Viper and Interage, one of them will move on to play Rosa Noble in our finals for a $13,000 set. One gets nine, one gets four. Who's it gonna be? And the King ability pops on behalf of Viper here in this bridge fight. He should come out on top and are we going to see back-to-back -back mirror matches out of these two? That I would think be so, man. I don't know if we've I don't know if we've ever seen that. It, it's looking like GY on both sides. Although now we see that it's going to be the Night Witch instead of this more traditional look that Viper is playing. And honestly, man, that's a really, really rough way to start any graveyard mirror matchup by being down half your tower in HP and not ahead in Elixir. All right, here we go. First minute, 15 away, set 1578, remaining on Inaraj's left-hand tower. And yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, again, the Night Witch into Graveyard, the Night Witch into Lava Hound, Night Witch trying to find new places to live now. Uh, and, you know, this it's so interesting that this, this combination, Andrew, how long have you and I been casting where, you know, you take out that Skeleton King and throw something else in there? Um, I think maybe Mega Minion is what you throw in there. This Ice Wiz, Tombstone, NATO, Baby Dragon, Graveyard. I mean, this has been a thing for five years now. Yeah, 100%. That Splash Yard variant, whatever it is, whether it's Bowler, whether it's Valk, whether it's Knight, whatever. Now Skeleton King, it's still so strong. It's always going to be incredibly strong defensively for a long time. We saw the Goblin Cage or the Bomb Tower come in, but with the buff of Tombstone and the way that it, it works in synchronicity with that Skeleton King, it feels like a no-brainer. However, Inaraj not running Graveyard. He is running Golem. But look at the work that Tombstone puts oh. in. And even though he doesn't activate King, he does prevent that death damage so not all bad here for viper but in some good skeleton damage on the left hand side nato pulls it all together baby dragon not getting splashed though the inaraj may have wanted so while he has jumped he still is behind that's a to deal with a pretty big counter push in the opposite way and that's a really nice NATO. All that gonna pile up. I think he's getting the splash damage yep, from the baby yep. dragon. Yes, he is. That's GG. That's well played. All he needs to do is poison out here, and Inaraj will be eliminated. We still have a vet. We still have a rookie here in our finals. Rosen and Viper battling it out for 9K. I mean, a, gr a great run for Inaraj all the way. Nothing to be ashamed of. Um, totally should be proud of his performance here. Put up some big ones. Uh, in the end here, Viper just played like the veteran he is and, and took care of business uh, in, in the very final moments. Man, uh, congratulations, Interaj. We, of course, will see you in June. 
for the golden ticket portion of this competition. But right now, it's Viper looking to take home nine Gs against Rosen. That's right. A really, really great run by both of those guys that were just eliminated. Morton and Interaj. We'll see them in June, like Rich just said. Great run to both those guys. Congratulations on walking away with a couple K. I think it's like 2000 a piece. But now it's that $13,000 set as we look at these last little bit of numbers here from Interaj and Viper. It felt like it could be an odd mirror matchup. And then it looked like it was like, all right, maybe not mirror matchup. It's just going to be GYGY. GY. And then it ended up being Golem against GY. And that early hit from Viper made it basically basically an insurmountable comeback, especially once it was Golem instead of Graveyard. There's no way to come back from that. Yeah, that was that was definitely a brutal one. And, you know, it's always one of those questions of why are you choosing Golem here? Golem hasn't been super strong in a long time. There are certainly reasons. There's matchup purposes for it. Um, also, comfort comfortability is a, a factor, but it is always one of those ones where when you Golem's one of those decks where when you find yourself in a bad spot, unless the other player makes a mistake, you're probably in trouble. So maybe we're going to take a look here at our bracket. And once it gets updated, we are to our finals. It is going to be Rosen and Viper, a veteran of the game, a standout in 2021 in CRL, and a guy that just fell a little bit flat at Worlds, or probably in his opinion, fell very flat at Worlds. And then a guy that we haven't heard a whole lot about, but has done a whole lot of work here. We've got one more break coming your way, uh, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to our finals in just a moment. Uh, Rich, how are you feeling about this last matchup? This is this is going to be fascinating, right? I mean, uh, Rosen's a name that, you know, we haven't seen lots of competitions, but you, know, you see the lists of who's doing well in some of the smaller stuff, and his name's been on there for a long time. This is my first time seeing him play with the big boys. First time seeing him mix it up in, in serious competition, and seeing that here, it's a whole lot of fun. The, the the game against the match against Morton really really great to watch uh, and and love to see what he can bring here against Viper who is playing like his name right he's taking those moments and just stinging you just biting you at the right time uh, I, my 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 pick here is gonna be Viper for those finals but it's really exciting to see someone like Rosen get into the mix here against a long-standing veteran that's right can he play the upset upset or will the veteran move on and get that nine thousand dollars we'll find out as soon as we come back our grand finals here coming your way Pro Series is brought to you by Snapdragon Elite Gaming, Monster Energy, and DHL. I gotta get a dime on the miss a snap any minute casually when it stop tripping on me, stop dissing on me. I got a dream, can't take it from me. My fire's burning, now I'm always learning. Tell me where to go, man. I'm on a journey. I can't explain it. I get excited, keep a 300 King Leonidas. Strap in, cause it's gonna be a long ride. Working on me every single day and night. There comes a time when your worlds will collide. If it's holding you back, push it right to the side. Ain't got no time for no fear. I work too hard to get here. Ain't got no time for no fear. I work too hard to get here. I don't got the time, put me 
and coach, I've been going hard. Time to let it show. Everything raw. Give it to me now. Let me have a spot, man. It's going down. Gotta get it here. I don't wanna wait. Take what I want. Then I go train. Gotta get a win. I won't lose the game. This is my year. I ain't gonna break. Strap in, cause it's gonna be a long ride. Working on me every single day and night. There comes a time when your worlds will collide. If it's holding you back, push it right to the side. On another level, I will never settle. Mind over metal, get the gold medal. On another level, I will never settle. Mind over matter, get the gold medal. Ain't got no time for no fear. I work too hard to get me up. Ain't got no time for no fear. I work too hard to get me Welcome to the place where dreams come true, where everything you want can be yours, if and only if you're willing to work for them, you're willing to hurt for them, but most of all, you're willing to be first for them, ha, look, I'm going straight to the top, I don't know how I would stop, like it or not. I got some goals that I'm hitting, you hear what I'm spitting, it's hot, look what I got, whole lot of passion and pain, the road to success is insane, stay out my lane, cause I'm on a mission, I'm getting what stands in my way, yeah I'm a beast, I wouldn't play with me baby, the way that I'm... And welcome back to the finals here on our top 16 for the Europe, Middle East, North Africa portion of the Snap Dragon Pro Series, I'm Rich Slayton. That's Andrew Guy. It has been a wild day of Clash Royale, Andrew. We're at the finals, though, so you know what that means. That's right. A $13,000 set coming your way, and the shade's coming out here Let's go. for my man, Rich Slayton. Got to be on brand here for the big-time matchup, especially with all the things that we've seen today. There's been breathtaking finishes. There's been rookies taking out vets. The best player in the world was eliminated in round number one, and now we've got a $13,000 best of three coming your way. So will the veteran Viper be able to hold on, calm those nerves, and get a big-time first-place finish? Finish here in the Snapdragon Pro Series, or will it be the rookie, Rosen Noble, coming out surprising everyone, playing through 65 qualifying games just to get here. Meanwhile, Viper played his nine, and he's been sleeping for weeks. Who's it going to be on top? It's going to be a huge question to answer. And you know what? A thing I will say that I bet a lot of these players are lamenting, but maybe not Rosen, is it's single elimination today because you had you mentioned Mo going out in the first round, Morton going out a couple uh, last round. You know, both those guys in double elimination would have still been complete dangers to fire all the way back and be here in the finals one more time. Instead, uh, you know, one and done, they're out. And now Rosen just has to win two games of Clash Royale to win $9,000. And that's the thing. It's only two games. It's only 10 minutes maximum of this game that I know and I love. But then you talk about that money, Rich. You said it's almost 10 grand. That's a massive difference. 4,000 is great. 9,000 is even better. Oh, doubling yeah. it up. And that's also, uh, it's not life-changing money, but it's definitely enough money to let everyone in your life know, 
I'm doing the right thing. I know you think this is just a game that I'm playing. No, 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 no. This is one of the biggest esports there is in mobile. This is some of the biggest prize money you're gonna see. Every single year in the Clash Royale scene, there's millions of dollars given away and it's all with tournaments like this and CRL. So how do you climb that mountain? The same way that Muhammad Light did it, the same way that Morton did it. You gotta work, work, work 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 and of course keep an eye out for all the events just like this what this one of course you can follow clash royale esports royale en on twitter so you can find out about all the different types of ways you can compete in clash royale and you can follow along right here go to snapdragonproseries.com to figure out how to compete in future clash royale events in the regions they are offered both for golden ticket stuff like for europe middle east north africa and in north america right now for twenty thousand dollars and for other games beyond clash royale as well this is the era of everyone and there are so many chances in cr and beyond for you to play for glory and for money so in case you made the mistake of just joining us for our finals, let's take a look at some of these highlights that we saw throughout the day to get Rosen and Viper to where we are right now. This is where things kind of started out for Viper. Now, he did obviously have to play against Schwatzen in his first set of the day, but it was really once we got into those quarterfinals, we were watching every single matchup out there, and Viper and Faust seemed like it would be a really great back and forth, but it was Viper who 2 owed Faust. And then on the other side of it, you look here, Rosen and Mortenrich. This is a set that we really thought was going to probably go in the favor of the German. Sure, we all, I think most people who are betting probably would have, but in the end, it was some opportune play by Rosen, able to sneak some of these by, and you saw just sometimes the ball bounces the wrong way for you, and then in the end, you go to the other side of it, right, where you have Inaraj, who was one of the two Cinderella stories of the day, falling to Viper, and we could have had a who's this instead of who's who for our final, but instead Viper able to hang on and get a shot at being our first champion here at Snapdragon Pro Series. It's very clear that Viper doesn't get the shakes when he's playing on ladder, right? You look at all the incredible finishes mm. that he's had, but it's really about that competitive scene, Rich. And can he use moments like this? The Snapdragon Pro Series, it's not that golden ticket moment yet. It's not that $200,000 moment yet at World Finals, which who knows if it's gonna be twice that or more than that this year. We're gonna all have to wait and see, but it's about Viper learning to be Viper that we know in the highest pressure situations. And unfortunately for him, ladder isn't that. And unfortunately for him, it hasn't translated perfectly from ladder to competitive. He's got the edge in ladder with his one trick deck. He needs to figure out how to put it together in these best of three moments, especially when it's single elimination. And I have to admit, I love the deck choices we've seen out of both these guys all day. It's just a little bit more impressive when you talk about Vipers just because we've seen so much more game tape. Here we go, game number one, Viper. This isn't ladder. There's not just press the play button. Up until the last five minutes, essentially, you can play as many games as you want to go ahead and climb that thing. Here, it's just, we have three games. You gotta win two of them. Can he do it, or will Rosen, the young Ukrainian, go ahead and take a big one for himself and his family and his country? So here we go, guards and AQ out, so probably Minor Mortar as well. We'll find out as these pieces fall into place. And then Rosen on the other side of it going Skeleton King, Royal Giant. And this is a very, very strong deck right now. You get that Skeleton King up high in front of the RG to tank for it. RG gets shots in, you pop that ability. All of a sudden the RG is taken for the Skellies or the Skellies are still taken for the RG. It's a really, really great synergy. Yeah, that fisherman's gonna be interesting though with this uh, with this Valkyrie, right? We just saw that you you're like, hey, the Valkyrie in front of the skeleton king, cool. But then the fisherman pulls it in and just goes ahead and gets in between two troops, and that's the big thing with Valkyrie, right? The more troops you put next to it, as long as she's alive, she is wreaking havoc. Yeah, and then you know you think about how are you gonna prevent that fish boy getting pulled uh, or pulling on that Valkyrie, and then you think about those high DPS guards that'll be played up top. That's probably gonna be the best way for him to go, so these Valkyries can be just a little bit lower. So first minute and a half plus change away, and pretty even right now. Rosen at twenty six seventy five, bottom right hand side at twenty six forty two, on Viper's top right hand tower. So far, the right-hand lane has been the primary focus of this fight. I would just love to see maybe a little more aggression out of Viper here in single, but maybe that was orchestrated well by Rosen by keeping up just enough pressure without overextending, without actually getting that Royal Ghost in, because he knows that he's better in double and in triple. 
Although, Viper is a master of cycling, and that's something that will be a little bit tough for Rosen to keep up with. Poison there on the Mother Witch, plus on the Royal Giant. RG will get nothing and not get through at all. No Mother Witches turning, uh, turning things into pigs, so good. Oh, there we go. Finally, one does go down. Good exchange overall for Viper, controlling very well, and now the Valk plus guards getting really aggressive Ooh. up high here against this Royal Giant. Yeah, and the guards actually not getting pulled, and the Valkyrie getting pulled is actually a really good thing for Viper there because all that DPS coming in from those guards made that RG not able to accomplish what it wanted. But again, I do feel like Viper is going to have trouble here in double and deeper into triple. He's got to figure out a way to create just a little bit more. And here we go, a nice Mother Witch behind Skelly, Skelly King ability. And she just turns one pig around and it will not do any damage. Archer Queen to the left-hand side will create some pressure that Rosen has to contend with. The Heist Army to distract does its work on both sides. As we go into sudden death overtime, Rosen does have the lead on Viper, but it is a thin one. Yeah, a thin one indeed as a Royal Giant comes down right on top of this mortar. That's good for Viper. It's a plus two trade for him. It's in the opposite lane. It's away from the Skeleton King, and now he has that Mother Witch there that can take care of this RG and clean up those Zappies and create a nice counter push. So a good job here by Viper by splitting things up. That's really what he needs to do. And the Fisherman not really able to get involved in the conversation the way that Rosen would like. He saw that mortar played high and then the Archer Queen there. Well, Fishboy was not in cycle for Rosen to create separation and give the Royal Giant time to break on through. Now we go into sudden death overtime and Rosen has to figure out some quick math on how the heck do I solve this riddle and actually break through for real damage. And Viper doing the correct thing, creating a lot of pressure. Now Fishboy's gonna be in front of that Royal Giant, so it's gonna go towards that mortar, but get taken out by, I was gonna say the AQ, but instead the log comes down instead. Second RG comes in, second mortar is available. Let's see how Viper wants to defend this, and there it is. Yeah, he plays it high, RG to the opposite lane here. I, I understand the thought process, but I don't think that was the call. And right now it just feels like Rosen in a tough spot. Don't see any true way out of this for this one. Viper sets up the early mortar on defense, and this should just be textbook gameplay from the Frenchman. Exactly. I mean, that's just really the best way to put it, Rich. This is absolutely textbook minor poison control with a mortar in the in the deck, right? This was not about that mortar creating any offense. It was all about the mortar creating pressure to bait things out or to play defense on top of that royal giant. And then just great minor poison work all throughout double and triple elixir. No way for Rosen to create any sort of offense. And I have to tell you, man, that has got to be a very demoralizing way to lose game number one. There's nothing more frustrating than a miner doing all the damage that you need and then having to continually overspend on mortars and fire spirits. Both of those can be really frustrating. So Viper doing a great job on the board and a great job in, uh, in terms of the mind games. Yeah, no, that was, that was brilliant work for him. And Viper certainly looks comfortable at the moment. Now has match point, one win away from $9,000 and being our first open champion here in the Europe, Middle East, North Africa region. Rosen now has to go back to the drawing board. Royal Giant did not get it done for him. So, you know, when you're trying to think about from the analysis standpoint, take a look at this. Poison out on Viper's side, Valk out on Viper's side. Graveyard has been the direction to go, but there are still plenty of graveyard counters available for Viper. Yeah, we have seen Rosen go to Graveyard a handful of times. We obviously saw him running that Goblin Giant Sparky deck. Um, and you wonder if that's going to be the right thing to do here. Uh, I, I really don't know. And then on the other side of it with Viper, you know, maybe he just busts out his control. Maybe he just busts out his favorite deck just because he can. He's got a game to give. So why not play something that you know you've matched up against before in terms of his Hog XE NATO deck and literally every deck that's ever been in the meta because that's all he plays. Yeah, and that's, and that's one of the hard things if you're Rosen. Like, do you game plan for Hog XE NATO? And even if you do, can you get an 80-20 matchup and still get bodied because you're up against a guy who has played every bad matchup dozens upon...
case that happens, you do not want to have that rocket in play to take care of that Sparky or those big pushes coming across the bridge. Uh, I, I really don't know what to expect here from either of them in this game, and that's a good thing because they've yeah. been doing a great job of varying things up all throughout the day. Um, Rosen here in a very tough spot. This is where the pedal meets the metal, man. This is where the rubber hits the road. This is where you really decide if you're going to be that 1% or if you're just going to be another great player in Clash Royale. Yeah. How you play through this best of three. Yeah, that's that's the, the big question. Now, look, the reality is that both of these guys, and Rosen in particular, because Viper's already put his name on the map in the past, both these guys have a bigger opportunity for that for in our in our late June golden ticket final. This is one of those ones though where I think goes a lot of way, long way for confidence, for bragging rights, and of course turning four into nine thousand dollars doesn't hurt much when you're trying to figure out how you pay your bills this month. And you know, you know how quick this uh, this community is. You know, we, you and I were just talking about Arden Toas a little bit ago, someone whose name we'd heard for the very first time in the fall of 2021. At least that was the first time I really started paying attention to Arden. I think we'd seen his name pop up before, but it wasn't like he needed to pay any sort of close attention. After two months of great tournaments with the uh, Queso Cup Golden Edition and of course the Snapdragon Pro Series NA, all of a sudden it's like, well, Arden looks like a top 10 player here in 2022. What a great way for Rosen to do the exact same thing thing and it's something that you could do just in a couple months right that's what Arden did maybe Rosen can do it here and having someone like Viper to play against is a great great person to start building that legacy well it becomes the question right of like how much does a single success or does you know one tournament success how much does that galvanize you right some people see that and that motivates them and they're able to find that next gear and turn it into next level success some people that's that's it's just the the moment they had that was their moment in the sun and then it, it flashes and then it goes away so you know you find out a lot about the kind of the the the, the ceiling of a player and the the mentality and heart of a player when you see what they do after their best performance Yes, yes, 100%. And the ones that can stay with it. You think about all the names that we've yelled for years that we're no longer talking about. You know, the Razzers, the Coltons, the, the Javi Catorces, the Canarios, yeah. Surgical, Igor, all these guys. I mean, I guess Igor's kind of there. Lapicati. There's so many players that have been so excellent and have been so the talk of the town for so long, but they fall out of favor, right? They, they stop competing, they stop winning. And that's, again, you talk about this Clash Royale audience. We love winners. We really do. And when you yeah, play against true. the best in the world and you beat them, that's a great way for you to get a ton of followers on Twitter, a ton of clout in the space, and a lot of respect in the Clash Royale scene. And we are about to get into game number two of our finals, $9,000 to the winner. If it is Viper, if it's not Viper, we go to game number three, $4,000 to the person that loses this best of three. And right now they are making the most important decision on their eight cards as we are waiting. League Ops is pressing them, but you know, this is a very serious moment. Yeah, we are getting, getting word that they are trying to, to sort that out. And sometimes there's a push and pull of a player going, hey, I need just another minute, I need another minute. And the League Ops going, hey, come on, you've had, you've had plenty of time make the call and let's get moving. So as soon as we have the, the game plan, we'll get it up for you. Uh, you know, you talked about some of the big names who've had big time moments and then, you know, ridden off into the sunset after winning big money, going and becoming content creators, whatever it might be. And here we go into gameplay. But you think about a lot of the, a lot of the one hit wonders, if you will, P players who've come out and had a flash, looked really good for a second, and then it hasn't quite turned into the highest level success. And some of the players who had that breakout moment and then went on and, and did a whole lot more. And you're really the one who decides which one of those you end up being in the long run. So here we go. Rosen now bottom of your screen, Viper at the top. And a Night Witch again here today with the Tombstone and Baby Dragon. And Baby Dragon from Rosen working at the bridge here in support of that Golden Knight. And Wow, Golem's up as the Barb Barrel comes in. I think he did the math here and said, hey, Baby Dragon will go down and not support. So now this is a big Golem up by about three Elixir is Rosen based on what's on the board right now. And with that cannon cart behind, this might be a quick turn or quick, oh, never mind, Lightning comes in, but still quick gone for the Skeleton King. Will this continue to turn into more Elixir advantage for Rosen as we get deeper into time? 
Yeah, I mean, that was a really, really smart play by Viper. I hate that NATO, though. No. Oh, man. You talk about someone who's one of the best NATO players in the game. That is a massive, massive mistake. After showcasing such great patience on that last push, not using the Skeleton King ability, thinking that those Skeletons could pile up and get damaged on that Golem. Instead, he takes the brunt of it from that Cannon Cart, uses the Tombstone to its utmost, and then just two big interaction mistakes there out of Viper. One is the miss NATO. The second one is allowing that Golden Knight to get a dash on tower and a big time swing yeah this is this is interesting and now golem the opposite direction from viper and we'll see if he can turn this into something and when's the last time we saw a golem versus golem is this 2018 yeah i mean it's definitely been a very very long time and when you look at what's on the board for both of them it's going to be a really interesting conversation so far we're seeing the spell power in favor of viper he's also got the more popular of the two champions but on the side of it with Rosen, he's got that Golden Knight to connect. And that's one of the big things, right, is the Golden Knight can, if you can't really break through with Golems, which you will see both guys break through a couple of times, that NATO-Golden Knight combination is often the one that gets it done for these Golem decks in late game. Yeah, and you saw right there, uh, Rosen went for it once again, but Viper was able to get that bar barrel down in time, protect that Night Witch, and make sure that there was no connection once again. I like this NATO this time around. Great job getting that cannon cart out of play instantly. Baby Dragon on the right-hand side. So with that, Viper does hold on to the lead, although he will, uh, I mean, Rosen held on to the Elixir lead, but nicely played by, Vi by Rosen to not let that Elixir lead flip, and now he takes that and sets up a golem low on the outside. I actually love that placement from the baby dragon there by Viper, almost looking into the future for a building or anything played in the center. Goblin Cage does get played, so a NATO has to come in by Rosen to make sure that baby dragon doesn't get too, too much value. And here we go, golem into golem, lightning out both directions. That lightning got a ton of value. Yeah, you, you can't play that cannon cart in a spot where it's not gonna pull golem. If you're gonna be playing that cannon cart, if lightning's in cycle, you gotta play it uh, probably more to the inside. And a little bit, and a little bit higher, or even to the outside. But you got to play a little bit higher so that it gets in the, in the mix of pulling golems away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's because you have to expect the lightning's going to come in, like you said, Rich. So there's no way you can give that much value and not get anything out of it. You cannot give away that much damage, that much tower damage. Oh, oh man! And that was a much better NATO. That's going to do it, man. That's wow. going to do it right there. Wow. Viper. He misses a NATO early on. He has a great couple NATOs late game, and Rosen knows, look, man, it was just fun to go to battle with you, but that's a quick two up and two down for our grand finals. The Frenchman comes out on top here in his first big competition of 2022. Congratulations, Viper. It's always fun to watch you win, man, and, and definitely doing it with Hog a little bit, NATO a little bit, and of course, Hog XC NATO, why not? Yeah, and the fact that he recovered from the, the misplayed NATO on the Golem, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised by it. Very, very well played overall. Again, I mean, like, Golem versus Golem, my brain's kind of broken right now right. For, the, for the moment, but, uh, you know, the meta, the, you know, th history repeats itself. Let's put it that way. And now we're back into a situation where that's the case. Rosen, overall, a great performance. Uh, overall, getting this far, really, really nice, but in the end, um, Viper, even with the misplay, able to stay focused and get the job done. Okay, and you know, you think about what happened there with the idea of just always going in at the correct times with Viper, giving that lightning value, and you see Rosen only able to get one lightning out, Viper getting three out. You called it perfectly, man. If you're gonna play a cannon cart next to a building, next to a princess tower, or next to another unit, you need to make sure that cannon cart is gonna pull in that golem. You gotta give credit to your opponent. And I really do think, after watching Rosen all day long, this was exactly that moment that we talked about, of the veteran being more comfortable in these high pressure situations, Rosen feeling the heat of the grand finals feeling the heat of a $14,000 yeah. set or yeah $13,000 set and then also you know the heat of playing against someone as good as Viper those little mental mistakes will go a very long way against someone like that yeah it's it, it's a it's a tough one overall um, he also had to spend more on his buildings in general right he had to spend four yeah. versus the three for the tombstone versus the the, the, the goblin cage and he never really had it sequenced at the time that he wanted it I don't think so uh, a, a tough a tough out there the lightning being kind of devastating against the uh, the cannon cart play. Very nicely played for Viper. And now Viper's going to be uh, in a pretty good spot, not just with the money, but also the confidence going into our top eight for the golden ticket in June.
Yeah, let's look at the story of Viper today from 16 down to one. Yes, four will make it on through and you can see the four right there, Morton, Rosen, Viper and Interage, but Viper having a great run today all day long. And, and you look at who he had to play, Schwarzen and Faust to get through. That's actually a really, really tough one-two punch. And then you see he's able to stay alive here in the finals after taking down Inaraj, who was very excellent all day long. So a really, really great run by Viper, a very earned first place here for our French champion. And of course, like we just said, there's a top four that will be coming back in June. Yeah, a, a top four, and that's gonna be Viper, Rosen, Inaraj and Morton, all of them competing for a golden ticket and a direct trip to CRL World Finals later this year. And of course, you'll be able to compete with them in that, uh, or at least have a chance to do so as we get into some uh, more call up, some more possible qualifiers for you later. But right now, uh, Rosen and Inaraj got to feel pretty good with uh, not just taking them some good money, but now they've proven that they can win some big games against big name players. And that last that last tournament, that last little eight person tournament for a golden ticket, that's a very short event. You don't have to win that yeah. many, many matches to go ahead and get a chance to world final. So that's right there within grasp for those two players. Yeah, golden ticket and a lot more money on the line. A big shout out to our sponsors. This is the Snapdragon Pro Series for a reason. When winning matters, you gotta think Snapdragon, and I'm sure that Viper will be thinking a lot about and thanking Snapdragon quite a bit as he has walked away with $9,000 yep. today in that first place spot. And of course, those qualifiers for Split 2, they're open. You can join. This is the era of everyone. You want Rich and I to cast your next split finals? Happy to do it. You want us to cast you in those final finals with the final eight battling for the golden ticket and the big, pri big prize purse? We'll do it. It's the era of everyone. And you just saw two, I don't want to say nobodies, because they are definitely somebody after today working their way all the way to that final four. Let's call them two new buddies. How about that? There it is. There you go. That's <laughs> that's a that's a terrible way to say that, but you get the idea. Guys, this has been so much fun. Thanks for taking time out of your Saturday to join us. We hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. Don't forget to like and subscribe or follow wherever you're watching this right now. Visit SnapdragonProSeries.com for how you can sign up and get in the action on the future. For everyone here, for the entire production squad at ESL, for my buddy Andrew Guy, I'm Rich Slayton. We'll see you back here next time for more Clash Royale.
up, that's y'all's team, cause we really lose no more. All about eating up, leaving that cold. You can see me up, killing that show. I ain't about giving that, giving up, no. Uh. Now you alone. 